Hello and welcome to Election Night, your voice, your vote 2022 with Local 5 Politics. It's another hugely important election cycle in the country and right here in Iowa. Voters will decide the next governor along with a U.S. senator and all four U.S. House members. There are also state house races, the Iowa Attorney General, Secretary of State and Auditor. Nationally, the balance of power in both the U.S. House and Senate are up in the air with big battleground Senate races in states like Ohio, Georgia, and Pennsylvania. There are several ways you can watch our coverage throughout the night. WeAreIowa.com, the We Are Iowa app, the We Are Iowa YouTube channel, and you can stream We Are Iowa on Roku or Fire TV. Polls in Iowa close at 8 p.m. You can find live election results right here on this stream or just text the word results to 515-457-1026. You can also text your election questions to that number. Stick with us all night for results, analysis, and what's next in state and national politics. On election night, your voice, your vote, 2022. You're watching Local 5 News. A look at this. It is a gorgeous night with wonderful weather. Very quiet out there. We will check in with Local 5 Chief Meteorologist in just a bit. But first, let's dive right into elections. It is Your Voice, Your Vote 2022. Thank you so much for joining us. And tonight we're covering midterm elections and making sure you stay up to date. Local 5 has you covered. We are all over the metro, ready to bring you all the election latest updates throughout the night. Now, we are just hours away from polls closing, and as much as we might want to know who won all the tight races as soon as possible, it takes time to get everything done smoothly. Local 5's Nora J.S. Reichart tells us what's being done to keep the counts accurate. While it may be election day in Iowa, early voting has already been open for several weeks, and according to Iowa Secretary of State Paul Pate, there's been plenty of Iowans taking advantage of the opportunity to skip the lines. We saw over almost 14,000 folks come out on Saturday to vote. We've got uh, well over 340,000 folks who voted absentee. So I think people are excited, and I expect a strong turnout. All those votes mixing in with the hundreds of thousands that will be cast on November 8th. Secretary Payton announced that in an effort to make sure all those votes are counted accurately, all 99 of Iowa's counties will be required to perform a hand count of an additional race. So there will be two audits total, when previously there was only one. We will identify that precinct uh, the day after the election, and I will name what the second race is, and they'll be doing those hand counts as well. And then after those hand counts are done, the races will be certified by the County Board of Supervisors before heading to Pate's office for final review and certification. But the big question for many voters, with all of that security in place, when will we actually know the election results? Pate says that they're expecting some close races this year, but you shouldn't have to wait too long past Election Day for any nail biters. Usually within two weeks of an election, all the counties are done and they've had their canvases and you pretty well know what's going on. If there's an unusual situation where the courts get involved, patience is again part of what we ask and we'll let the process work its way out. If your ballot is challenged for any reason, you can still cast a provisional ballot. That will be counted after a person submits some additional paperwork to precinct election officials or the county auditor's office by Monday, November 14th. And Nora is at a polling location now ready to talk to us about the man who wants to keep his job as Secretary of State, and that is Paul Case. Yes, yeah, Steph, here at Roosevelt High, energy is pretty high. Election workers and poll workers have been celebrating all the first-time voters they've seen coming through, clapping and applauding for them after they do it. They told me that it turned out pretty in line with what they've seen from previous elections. About 700 voters of about 1,650 eligible in the precinct have come through, which they tell me is about in line with what they expected. But that doesn't include early or absentee voting. So let's, let's talk about the man who's running to keep his job as Iowa's election watchdog, Paul Pate. He was first elected as Secretary of State in 1994. After leaving the position in 2001, he eventually became Secretary of State again in 2015. He's focused his campaign on efforts to require voter IDs in Iowa, allow for online voter registration, and expanded overseas voting for military service members. We'll tell you how the polls are looking for him and for all the other candidates going through races tonight. Back to you. Stephanie. Let's talk about Nora. All right. Thank you so much. I'm joined by Republican consultant Craig Robinson and Democratic consultant 
Robert Ross Smith. We have been unpacking a lot of issues tonight. Thank you again for both being here. Let's get to the big divisive question. What does the Second Amendment question on the ballot mean for the state? So if it passes, does that mean an abortion amendment to the state constitution would be easier? Uh, what Can you talk about that? Well, I think it's a good test. Uh, I think what we're going to see is how campaigns can effectively raise awareness of ballot initiatives. And so I think this is going to be a great test as to what's next, and we'll see. Yeah. But it takes you a little bit on your ballot to get there. Yeah. <laughs> it's on the back. It's after the judges. It's the very last thing uh, that, that people will vote on. I think the important thing for, for people to realize is this, this doesn't really change any existing laws or anything. It just codifies Second Amendment rights into our state constitution. Um, so I don't think there's any major changes that people are going to experience if this passes. Okay. And as it reflects to abortion, um, that's a whole other issue that would have to go through the long process to get an amendment on the ballot. And, and when it comes to this very polarizing topic, do you see any surprises? Do you think people know the process? Do you think there's misinformation or misunderstanding out there? I think that, um, I think what I would worry about is, will people get to that point of the ballot and fill it off? Out. Because I think there's a lot of people that fill out the front side of the ballot mm -hmm. and don't even go to the back. So it's going to be interesting to see. And then, you know, wow. you, yeah, so yeah. you've got to get there first yeah. and, and then you'll see. But this is an issue that a lot of Iowans are passionate about. Mm -hmm. So I would expect it. And there's been polling that shows that it, it probably will pass tonight. All right. We're going to have more analysis coming up. Stephanie? Samantha, thank you. Rita Garcia joining us now. Just a little bit ago, we talked about Iowa Secretary of State Paul Pay. You're covering his challenger, Jill Miller. Yeah, Joel Mueller is the uh, Democratic kid for Secretary of State. He's been the Lynn County Auditor since 2007. And he previously served as the mayor of Robbins as well as uh, being a city council member as well. So he's no stranger to politics. But uh, the platform that he's running on is making voting easy. Uh, that includes giving Iowans more time to vote, allocating drop boxes based on population, and increasing voter registration and participation. Now, some of his ideas on how to do that include printing absentee ballot request forms in newspapers across the state and directing county auditors to extend their office hours during the 20 days of early voting. And when it comes to assuring Iowans that elections are secure and fair, he points to responding to open records requests in a timely manner and assigning people to evaluate county elections offices and uh, their processes to make sure everything is secure and up to par. Now, he's been pretty cr critical of his opponent, Paul Pate, um, saying that he didn't do enough to disavow all of the misinformation and conspiracy theories surrounding the 2020 election because he says it's really impacted how Iowa view elections and has caused them to lose some trust in that. Reporting live from West Des Moines, we'll send it back to you guys in the studio. Great, thank you. After tight races like six vote win by Miller Makes in 2020, we asked campaigns if they're prepping for something similar happening this midterm election. Local 5's Lourdes Leone joins us with more on what happens if any of these races end up in court, which does happen from time to time. That's exactly right, Samantha. Anything is possible on election night. That's exactly why we spoke to politicians as well as parties and a political analyst to kind of see what they do legally to prepare for tonight's election. I'm sure that each side has teams of attorneys that are ready should there be any issues on election day or post election issues in terms of counts. Grant Woodard is a political attorney and he says it's standard practice for campaigns to be legally prepared for all outcomes on election night. But he says overall the state has a good history of honest elections. Last cycle there was a one notable recount that did occur in a congressional race. Um, where the uh, victor ended up being decided by six votes out of tens and tens and tens of thousands of votes cast. In Iowa, a lot of the decisions and uh, methods are left up to the local county auditors, which have a very good reputation. Woodard says a few law changes that renew this election cycle are putting past disputes at bay. It used to be that your uh, absentee ballot needed to be postmarked by a certain date and still be counted. Now it has to physically be in the election office on election day. Um, that should settle a lot of past disputes, but we'll see. Jeff Kaufman, chairman of the GOP, says the Republican Party isn't doing anything different than normal to prep legally. Well, we've always had uh, a program where we have Republican uh, attorneys that can be dispatched. Uh, they were actually dispatched during the during the Miller Meeks 
uh, recount. So we are always prepared for that, no matter no matter what the polls indicate. We reached out to the Democratic Party on how they are prepping for recounts in tighter races, and they denied comment. As for if the Republican chairman is worried about tighter races, he says he's confident with Republicans up and down the ticket. We're going to operate as if we're 20 points behind, but in reality, we're feeling we're feeling cautiously optimistic right now. What are the midterms? Midterm elections take place halfway through a president's four-year term. The election is considered a referendum on how Americans are feeling about the first half of a president's term and a chance for the minority party to flip the balance of power in Washington. While voters aren't electing a new president, there are federal, state, and local seats contested. All 435 House seats are up for election as representatives serve two-year terms. Senators, on the other hand, serve six-year terms and their election years are staggered. So approximately one third of the Senate is up for election every two years. This year, 35 of the 100 seats in the Senate will be elected. 36 states will elect a governor this year. So what's at stake? Even though President Joe Biden isn't on the ballot, the midterm elections will play a big role in what the president can accomplish in the final two years of his current term. One of the biggest questions is whether Democrats will hold their narrow majority in Congress. Analysts predict Republicans have a chance to take back both the House and Senate. Historically, the party in power tends to lose seats during midterm elections. Since 1934, the president's party has lost an average of 28 House seats and four Senate seats during the midterm elections. This year, Republicans only need to pick up one seat in the Senate to take back the majority. All right, we're back with more breakdown of what to expect tonight. Republican consultant Craig Robinson with us and Democratic consultant Roz Smith. So let's get to a security question top of mind. This is the first general election since the January 6th insurrections. Are you seeing conspiracy theories spread? Well, I think there's always uh, been conspiracy theories out sure. there. Um, are they are they magnified a little bit mm -hmm. with social media and that these days? Maybe, um, but I, I don't think that um, the January 6th stuff is really driving much uh, on the polls tonight. Mm -hmm. I think that people understand that that's that's a separate incident, sure. um, and and I think there's other big drivers. Uh, that are motivating people to go to the polls. And what's your take? Yeah, I, I would agree with portions of that. I think that we have seen an uptick, though, in conspiracy theories uh, on social media, things like Twitter, when we have these uh, equations and mechanisms that kind of drive that to the populace. But I would agree that January 6th, I don't think is top of mind. But I okay. think that it does impact our reactions and how we feel about our democracy. I think we need confidence in our elections. And so anytime an election doesn't go our way, we can't have an insurrection. And I think that's what most folks are concerned about. And so it's about the confidence after the election, not so much of what drives them to the polls. Good points, all valid points. We're going to have more analysis on everything and working through the elections tonight. We will be right back. Stay with us. With the entire House and a third of the Senate up for election, you might think the federal government runs the process at the ballot box. I'm going to cast your ballot. But is that how things really work? Let's verify. Our sources are the U.S. Constitution, the National Constitution Center, the National Conference of State Legislatures, the Secretary of States in California, Ohio, and Texas, and Cynthia Paz, the San Diego County, California Registrar of Voters. To get the answer, we've met with Paz to walk through how her office counts ballots. 
we run the envelopes, the return envelopes, through this high-speed sorter. At this point, it's capturing the image of the back of the envelope, which includes the voter's signature. From there, automated and manual checks confirm that the voter's signature matches the one on record. If it does, the ballot is opened and counted. The voting system is not connected to the internet or any other system in any way. Why is that? It's closed connections. That's for security. Where do you get these standards established for this policy? So the California Secretary of State does uh, create regulations based on California state law, based on elections code. This is similar nationwide because of the elections clause of the constitution, which ensures states have the right to run their own elections. In 38 states, voting is overseen by a secretary of state, someone who is either elected or appointed to run elections. 10 states have a board or elections commission, and in Alaska and Utah, the lieutenant governor serves as chief election officer. Whoever is in charge sets minimum requirements for security, voter access, and other election policies for their state, and then local registrars, like PAS, can choose to go beyond this. In 2002, Congress created the Election Assistance Commission, which sets minimum security standards as well as additional voluntary guidelines. So, no, the federal government does not run elections. Our sources say the lack of federal oversight actually makes our elections more secure because there's no single way to manipulate votes. The vote is complete. With your Verify, I'm Brandon Lewis. I'm Stephen Olamacher, and I'm the election decision editor for the Associated Press based in Washington, D.C. I oversee about 60 analysts on election night, and we declare the winners in about 7,000 races across the U.S. Elections are complex across the United States. While there are federal laws and the Constitution that guide much of them, elections are run by states, and state laws uh, dictate a lot of the processes. So different states have different rules for the hours of voting, for how they're tabulated, how the results are released. It is really a, a broad mix of different types of elections in different states. We don't know what's gonna happen on election night, but we are preparing for the possibility that in many states, we might not be able to call all the winners on election night because it's going to take days to count all of the votes. And if you think about it, it's the states where they have competitive races. It's states like Pennsylvania, it's a state like Arizona, it could be a state like Colorado as well. In Pennsylvania, under state law, they cannot open mail ballots until the morning of election day. And it takes a long time to process those ballots and count them. So they very well might not be able to count all of their ballots on election day. It could take days. And since we do expect there to be close races there for both Senate and governor, it could take a while before we know who wins. Across the country, this is not new. In many years, it takes a long time in various states to find out who won different elections. In the pandemic, it did get uh, more pronounced. And that's because of the increase in mail ballots. It also be it became more pronounced in more states. At the AP, we follow the numbers. We call races without fear or favor. If the numbers say that a candidate has won, and we can verify that the, the vote count is accurate, we declare a winner. Candidates concede, candidates declare victory. The information is noteworthy. We report that in our stories on the wire, but it doesn't really affect our race calls and when we declare a winner. We follow the process. You know, we will have 4,000 people spread out across the country at counties and townships talking directly to election officials, getting results, and they will call those results in to vote entry operators. We have about 800 of them entering votes into our system. We have a large quality control team that will be checking for errors and checking across platforms to make sure that the votes align so that we can present the most accurate, fastest vote totals to, to the country and to the world. Right, Brad, thank you. Well, back to the election. Let's take a look at the governor's race now. Local 5's Khalil Maycock has a closer look at Governor Kim Reynolds running for her second full term. 
Yes, Stephanie, we are here at the Hilton at that GOP watch party, and more people are in here than the last half hour. They are eating and they are mingling, and they are here to see if later tonight Governor Kim Reynolds will retain that spot as Iowa's first female governor. Now, she became the governor back in 2017, and before that, she was lieutenant governor, and before that, she worked as a state senator. Now, she is campaigning on conservative family values, cutting taxes, raising employment, and making sure parents decide their kids' education. On the education front, during the last legislative session, she proposed a bill that would give families the option to get taxpayer-funded scholarships to go to private schools. That bill failed, but Governor Reynolds has said if she does get reelected, that is something she will push. So if she does get reelected, we do expect to hear about that again. Now, we will be here at this watch party for the rest of the night to bring you those updates. Stephanie. All right, Khalil, thank you very much. And the race to be Iowa's top lawyer is heating up as a longtime incumbent faces a fierce reelection competition. Local 5's Nora J.S. Reichart has the latest on Tom Miller's campaign. Yeah, Samantha, Tom Miller is the longest serving attorney general in the entire country, Democrat or Republican. He was first elected all the way back in 1978, and he is now seeking his 11th term in office. He is trying to focus his campaign on efforts to increase consumer protection and sue opioid manufacturers, pitching the attorney general's office as a way to help support everyday Iowans. As a Democratic attorney general working under a Republican governor, Miller has stressed his desire to keep the job independent of political desires. One prominent example of that from recently, Miller drew criticism earlier this year for refusing to defend House File 594 in a lawsuit, a bill that would have involved a 24-hour waiting period for abortions. Miller defended his decision by saying that he believed the law would have a detrimental impact on women's reproductive rights, health care, and society at large, and that is why he refused to defend it. We'll tell you how his race is shaping up later throughout the day. Back to you in studio. Samantha, Thank Steph. you so much, Nora. And coming up, we're going to check back in with Khalil for a look at Iowa's longest serving U.S. Senator Chuck Grassley looking to make it an eighth term. In some ways, churches have one of the best deals on federal taxes. They neither have to pay them nor file annual paperwork. But a tweet with 10,000 likes claims they can lose their tax exempt status by backing a political candidate. So let's verify. Can the IRS revoke the tax-exempt status of churches that endorse candidates? Our sources are the IRS, the Johnson Amendment of 1954, Clergy Financial Resources, the United Church of Christ, the California Catholic Conference, and Grace Communion International. In 1954, Congress passed the Johnson Amendment, which prohibits churches, charities, and most other tax-exempt organizations from endorsing candidates. If they do, then they risk losing their tax-exempt status. The IRS says generally these organizations can't show preference for a candidate, but a leader can if it's clear they're speaking as an individual. This means they can't use official titles or church resources like the pulpit, newsletter, or website to make their endorsement. Our sources note politicians can speak to congregants, but all candidates must be given the same opportunity. So. Yes, the IRS can revoke the tax-exempt status of churches that endorse candidates, although it's a lengthy process, and the only time the IRS successfully revoked a church's tax-exempt status was in 1992, when Branch Ministries sponsored newspaper ads urging Christians not to vote for Bill Clinton. The United Church of Christ and the IRS note under the rules, churches are allowed to take positions on public policy issues such as abortion or immigration, without endorsing specific candidates. With your Verify, I'm Brandon Lewis. Well, we are in the last stretch of voting. Polls close at 8 o'clock. And one of the races we will be closely watching is Iowa's U.S. Senate race. Local 5's Khalil Maycock has a look at Iowa's longest-serving U.S. Senator, Chuck Grassley, who is hoping tonight it will make it to term 8. 
Yes, Stephanie, people are here at this GOP watch party hoping that they do see that uh, Senator Grassley keep his reign as Iowa's longest serving U.S. Senator. Now, 89-year-old Chuck Grassley has been a U.S. Senator since the 1980s. Before that, previously serving in the Iowa House for 16 years and the U.S. House for three terms. Grassley champions family farms, rural life, and he stands on fighting inflation, reducing the national debt, and stopping illegal immigration. This summer, to hold true to his values, he introduced a bill called Keep Our Communities Safe Act. It aims to stop immigration authorities from releasing illegal immigrants back into the U.S. if they have not been accepted for deportation to other countries after being detained for six months. Now, we will continue to be out here at this GOP watch party for the rest of the night, just once again to make sure that we bring you the latest. Back to you, Stephanie. All right, Local 5's Jake Brand is live at the Mid-American Recplex. Jake, what is a race we should keep our eyes on? Yeah, Samantha, in District 17 for the representative in the State House, there's no Republican running, but there's still competition to see who's going to represent the Beaverdale neighborhood of Des Moines between Isaiah Knox, Toya S. Johnson, and Alejandro Marguiao Ortiz. Knox is the Democrat running. He won the primary at 67% and is the executive director of the Urban Dreams platform and is running to lower the cost of child care, create more affordable housing, and increase funding for public schools. Toya S. Johnson is a part of the Libertarian Party and is a Des Moines native, graduating from Roosevelt in 1993. Johnson has advocated for the removal of income tax, the legalization of marijuana, and wants to work to improve civil rights. Alejandro Marguillo Ortiz is not affiliated with the party. He's the son of two immigrant meatpacking workers and has spent the last two years advocating for immigrant and worker rights. His platform is to abolish ICE, defund the police, and decriminalize substances. There's been a steady line in and out of the door here at the RecPlex for the better part of two hours. It's been really, really good turnout for the 2022 midterms. Back to you, Samantha. Jake, thank you so much for that report. And now back to the race for Attorney General Reina Garcia is here now with a little more background on the woman looking to unseat Tom Miller, and that is Brenna Bird. <laughs> Yes, yeah, Steph, uh, Brenna Bird is very familiar with her opponent. Uh, they actually ran against each other back in 2010 for the same position uh, in which she lost by 11 percentage points. But the Guthrie County attorney uh, has really focused on backing law enforcement, fighting federal overreach and doing more to help get justice for victims of crimes during her campaign. She says uh, putting in a special victims unit, auditing victim services and also creating a cold case unit to work along law enforcement will help put victims and their families first as they pursue justice. Now, when it comes to fighting federal oversight, uh, Byrd has been pretty outspoken on taking President Biden to court if necessary. So a lot has changed uh, since uh, she and Tom Miller have ran against each other. So we'll see if over a decade later, the results will be different this time. Reporting live from West Des Moines, I'll send it back to you guys in the studio. All right, Raina, thank you so much. And with that, we're going to take a break. We'll be Gas prices are continuing to drop from their record highs earlier this year. But this Facebook comment suggests the reason for that drop is political manipulation designed to give the party in power a boost ahead of the midterms. Other posts on social media have echoed that sentiment, suggesting gas prices go down before elections and then rise again after. So is there any validity to those claims? Do gas prices always go down before elections? To verify, we looked at historical data from the U.S. Energy Information Administration and Bureau of Labor Statistics and spoke with Ed Hers, an energy economics fellow at the University of Houston. The EIA has weekly data on gas prices going back to 1993. We isolated the periods before midterm and presidential elections, focusing on data from September through the first week of November. In eight of the 14 years, gas prices declined. But in the other six years, prices rose. The BLS has monthly data going back to 1976, and though it's not as precise, it can still give us a broad look at trends. Of the 23 election cycles in that span, Gas prices decreased in 15 and increased in 8. Energy economist Ed Hers says gas prices can sometimes dip in the fall as refiners move away from the more expensive formulations that are used in the summer. But it has little to do with politics. We go to a less expensive formulation for winter gasoline. Second, uh, there's less demand in the winter time. You know, give or take driving to school, you're not driving to vacation. Uh, and so 
for a couple of reasons, you might see some sort of dip in the in the winter time. And most elections, of course, occur in November. He says other big factors lowering prices right now include below normal demand from China due to COVID restrictions and Russia's ability to export more of its oil than expected, despite sanctions increasing supply. The president also has the ability to increase supply somewhat by releasing oil from the strategic reserve. Biden has done that, but gas prices are affected by so many other factors that that doesn't guarantee lower prices, let alone a drop timed for election day. The president is at the mercy of the market. So we can verify, no, gas prices do not always go down before elections. And if they do, it's the result of a wide variety of market factors. With your Verify, I'm Casey Decker. It's election season, which means most of the ads you see right now during commercial breaks are probably for political candidates. One of our viewers in Texas noticed she was seeing a lot more ads for Republican Governor Greg Abbott than his Democratic challenger Beto O'Rourke. This raises a question a lot of people have during election season. Aren't candidates guaranteed equal amounts of ad time? Let's verify. Our sources are the FCC, the Communications Act of 1934, and David Schultz, a law professor at the University of Minnesota. The idea of equal time for candidates on TV comes from the Communications Act, which is enforced by the FCC. It says that if a candidate appears for more than four seconds on a TV station's air, that station, quote, shall afford equal opportunities to all other such candidates for that office. But there are some big exceptions, notably news coverage or interviews don't count. What does count is entertainment content. For example, during President Ronald Reagan's campaign, some stations stopped airing old movies he starred in. And this year, when Mehmet Oz started his Senate campaign, he stopped making his TV show Dr. Oz, in part because any station that aired it would have had to offer equal free airtime to his opponent, John Fetterman. But there's another key limitation of this law. Notice it says equal opportunities, not actually equal time. So if a candidate buys an ad for $1,000 in prime time, the station has to give their opponent the option to purchase an ad for the same price at the same time. But if the opponent can't afford it or just doesn't want to buy that ad space, the station doesn't have to do anything else. They've given them equal opportunity. It doesn't mean that it has to give, at the end of the day, the same amount of real time if some candidates have more money and can actually purchase more time. All it says is we've got to provide the same opportunity. And yet another limitation, this law only applies to broadcast TV and radio. So cable and the internet aren't affected by any of this. That means we can verify, no, political candidates are not guaranteed equal amounts of ad time. They are only guaranteed the opportunity to get the same amount of time as their opponents for the same price. With your Verify, I'm Casey Decker. in the east and we are tracking several key senate races in the country obviously georgia closed a half an hour ago the senate race there senator Raphael warnock uh, facing a challenge from herschel walker we continue to get numbers in he's using about 12 percent of the vote in and Raphael warnock uh, with a sizable lead but again a, a huge part of the rural areas of georgia uh, still yet to be counted uh, two more states now have closed north carolina the senate race there a bit of a sleeper race not getting a lot of attention sherry beasley up against the congressman ted bud bud supported by former president trump uh, he was polling well with a slight lead over Sherry Beasley, but she uh, was a very strong candidate. We'll wait for numbers in that race as well. Ohio, uh, the polls have now closed. Congressman Tim Ryan, the Democrat in this race, uh, up against Republican J.D. Vance. J.D. Vance holding a polling lead of about a couple of points, though that's still very close for Ohio, since we know where Ohio has gone for the Republicans the last couple of cycles. Uh, Tim Ryan hoping, though, to trade Congress for the Senate. There is one race we can project at this hour, and it's also from Ohio, the race for governor, the very popular uh, Republican governor there, Mike DeWine, uh, will serve a second term in Ohio. Not entirely a surprise there. And from Governor DeWine, I want to bring it over to Governor Chris Christie, former governor of New Jersey. Uh, Chris, how are you feeling about tonight? Governor DeWine, not a surprise there. He he took some heat during COVID, but then regained in popularity almost uh, soon thereafter. Yeah, I mean, he took very little heat during COVID, David. He, uh, I think most people across the state found his response to be to be reasonable. Um, and, and they like Mike DeWine. Um, and that's really what it comes down to. They like him. Uh, and then when you look at Georgia, one of the things that we didn't talk about before is Georgia in the election integrity law changed the way they count also. So they've been counting mail-in votes and early votes 
from the time they've come in. So a lot of what you'll see here in the beginning is uh, is those results, is mail-in and early vote. The interesting part of that is, um, you know, if you look at it, uh, Warnock, you would expect to be doing as well as he's doing right now in that early mail. And when we get to start counting Election Day votes, uh, you're going to see a much different result. Chris, let me ask you about Governor DeWine and whether or not you think uh, his popularity in that state is going to help bring J.D. Vance across the finish line. No question. Look, um, there's a statistic I used to use when I was chairman of the Republican Governors Association when talking to donors. In, in, in states where the Senate race and the governor's race is both on the ticket, when the governor wins, the Senate candidate of the same party wins 85% of the time. Wow. And so it is very powerful to have a popular governor at the top of the ticket for the Senate race. And, and that, I will tell you, is the biggest hope for Herschel Walker in Georgia. Brian Kemp's going to win that race. I think he's going to win it by a fairly substantial margin, given that he won by a point over Stacey Abrams four years ago. We're probably looking more at five or six points. And that it could be. Brian Kemp could be the first person in American history to drag Herschel Walker over the goal line. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's true. Maybe he'll get the high spin at the end of the night. Let's bring it back over to Rick Klein at the big board because you were comparing how Raphael Warnock is performing uh, up against Stacey Abrams in that governor's race. Yeah, this is fascinating because we're seeing it play out in real time right now. Raphael Warnock is up about 22 points over Herschel Walker. That's not going to last. As we talked about, this is mostly the early vote. You can see him hitting the benchmarks that he needs to hit in Fulton County where most of the vote is. So keep in mind, 22 points, 112,000 votes that he's up right now. Let's compare that to what's going on in the governor's race at the same time in the night. Look at that. Stacey Abrams is only at 56-43. So instead of 22 points, you're talking about 13 points. So that's, that's 40,000, 50,000 votes that are either skipped on the Senate line or, or just going for one versus the other. So Governor Kemp is getting a lot of people voting for him that are probably then going and voting for Raphael Warnock or just skipping the Senate race or maybe going to the third party candidate. These are the same voters, right? These are the same votes that are being cast and being counted. And right now we're seeing that Stacey Abrams is significantly behind where, uh, where Raphael Warnock is. And conversely, Brian Kemp significantly ahead of where Herschel Walker is. I want to take that point over to Donna Brazil because it was just two years ago. What's changed for Stacey Abrams? Has she lost a little bit of the magic or are the times different? Is this a different moment in the country? Well, as you well know, all political wins are turbulent. And for Stacey Abrams, 2022 is a turbulent year. 2018, she's running as a challenger. Uh, it was an open seat. So she put in place what we saw in 2020 that gave Democrats an opportunity to turn that state blue. And so while she might be falling behind in the early vote, is it Stacey Abrams' operation, her playbook that has even gotten Georgia on the minds of Democrats? Uh, Chris and I were talking about the last time I went down to Georgia other than to watch the Saints beat, you know, the Falcons. <laughs> and it's when Bill Clinton was there in 92. Joe Biden. So George is now in play for the rest of our lifetime because of Stacey Abrams. So if Raphael Warnock wins tonight, he wins in part because of the machine that she helped set up. Well, I would hope he would congratulate her and would help pull her over, like you said. Hopefully he's the quarterback on this one. And one other thing, David, to, to look at Kemp. Now, the Kemp difference here is that I think the best thing that happened to Brian Kemp, besides his performance as governor, was he was opposed by Donald Trump. And I think what you're going to see as we get into the suburbs outside Atlanta, four years ago, Brian Kemp didn't do great in those suburbs. I predict to you tonight he's going to do very, very well in those suburbs because those suburban women who do not like Donald Trump have now sided with Brian Kemp because he fought Trump and won in the primary. And so they've now become allies of Kemp where four years ago they were not. Well, we know all eyes on Georgia, the last presidential race, and, and Governor Christie brings up a great point, John. You and I have actually talked about this off camera. If Kemp wins tonight, this would signal that you can stand up to Trump, you can stand up for you know a carefully counted election and stand by the results and still win. I mean, uh, Brian Kemp refused to do what Donald Trump wanted, which was to uh, reconvene a special session of the legislature to overturn the election results in 2020. He said no. Uh, Trump went after him, went after him hard, recruited David Perdue to run against him in the Republican primary. Kemp crushed him. Purdue got like 20 some points. Uh, absolutely crushed him. So this shows that you can be a you can be a Republican, a conservative Republican, defy Donald Donald Trump, have Donald Trump come after you, come after you hard, and still survive. And we're going to track the Secretary of State's race in Georgia as well. Brad tonight. Raffensperger. I mean, another one. I mean, you know, Donald Trump recruited a Republican member of the House, Jody Heiss, to leave his seat in the House to run for Secretary of State in Georgia against Brad Raffensperger, and Brad Raffensperger. 
won that Republican primary, and he's very much the front runner to win to win the general election tonight. Nightline anchor Byron Pitts. I know it's early, but what do you make of these numbers for Brian Kemp tonight? Well, David, I love sports analogies. So picking up on them, to this point, Kemp has given Herschel Walker the Heisman. He's kept his distance. In fact, a couple of days ago, they had an event where Walker, every Republican attended except for Herschel Walker. That's one thing. The other thing I want to mention about something unusual, I think, about Georgia that works to the advantage, I think, to Warnock to some degree about the ground game. He's pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church. In black America, that is the big house. That reaches all across the state of Georgia. Also, Georgia has the third largest number of HBCUs in the country. One of them is in Savannah, where, uh, where a Warnock is from. And I think that will impact the race as well. Kemp, as I mentioned, is very popular. David, well, finally, I want to give you one number, 39.1. That's how much unemployment has dropped in Georgia in the past seven years. So the economy is important there. But relative to many parts of the country, folk are feeling pretty good about the economy. So I think some of the other issues will, will matter there greatly. I want to hit on something you said there, though, because if you watch their campaign rallies or their campaign events, I should call them, where you know where I'm going with right. this, even in just the last two to three days before Election Day, Raphael Warnock was in a church setting right. or a local community center setting. You had Herschel Walker at the football game. It speaks volumes about the difference that they're, that they're trying to show uh, in these final days. Oh, yeah. I call it the church ladies versus the tailgaters, right? You go, to a Hirsch, you go to a Warnock event, it's about 30 people, mostly black, mostly women. You go to a Herschel Walker event, it's hundreds of people, mostly white, mostly women. At a Warnock event, he talks about policy, he talks about character, he talks about credentials. At a Walker event, they talk about when he beat Tennessee when he was a running back. Uh, people there line up to, to get his autograph. And something that you never see in politics, Herschel Walker will wait to take a picture with every single person there. It goes on for hours. And so it speaks to the different dynamics that go on in Georgia in this race. All right, I want to bring Heidi Heitkamp, former senator of North Dakota. Hey, Heidi. One thing that isn't getting talked about here is how Warnock became a United States senator. When he came in, he used the machine that Johnny Isaacson, whose uh, seat he took, he actually hired their people to do the kind of constituent services. He has been myopically focused on Georgia. And when you think about Stacey, and I love her to death, but she became the face of the Democratic Party. Party. So she was much more aligned with traditional progressive democratic ideals where Warnock put his head down, did his work, brought in Johnny's folks to help do constituent services. And I think you see this in the numbers. You also see Stacey Abrams, you see a lot of celebrities coming into Georgia. You don't see that in Raphael Warnock's church settings. Well, on purpose. And Warnock wanted that image that I am here doing the work for the people of Georgia. I am not a celebrity. I am your United States senator. And I'm not saying that was Stacey your image, but I think that after her, you know, remarkable uh, organizational skills and what she was able to do in Georgia, she became the face of progressive African American women and women. And I think there's some resistance to that celebrity um, in Georgia, where Warnock just did what he needed to do to um, yeah, make those connections with the people. I, I would be remiss, since you mentioned progressive black women, I would be remiss if I didn't say if progressive black women did not go to church and listen to the sermons and the games and watch them, the Democratic Party would not be in the yeah, White House I, today. I agree so with black you. women have done our I, job. I, I, I'm not saying that despairingly, but I'm saying that that's what you see, I think, in these differences. The I, Democratic brand in states like ours are really, really you difficult. You have a popular overcome. Republican governor. You got to give him some dabs for that, too. Yeah, I think he's getting credit at least so far tonight, then well ahead of Stacey Abrams. Mary Bruce, you were on the ground in Georgia uh, when we were covering all of these allegations. And it was interesting what Lindsey Davis pointed out here at the desk moments ago that people made up their mind weeks ago, uh, you took note of the reaction from people when another set of allegations is being reported. It didn't sit well with a lot of folks in Georgia. I was there actually the day after the second woman came forward and, and revealed that, 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 according to her, that Herschel Walker pressured her to have an abortion, paid for an abortion. On the ground at his rally, there were more people there than folks on the ground said they had ever seen at his rallies. To them on the ground, didn't matter. And it was really surprising. And to Lindsay's point about going through some of the data already, the, the loyalty to party ahead of the candidate was really on display when I was there. I was amazed. A lot of uh, his supporters who I talked to said, look, that he is someone uh, who deserves grace, who deserves forgiveness. I'll never forget a woman I spoke to named Kathy who had, uh, was a diehard Herschel Walker supporter. And she said, look, that was his sinning phase. Even 
if the allegations were true over and over again. Herschel Walker supporters who I talked to said it simply doesn't matter. It's about the man he is today. And to Byron's point, the rallies were huge. He was energizing the crowd. They were drawn to that star power and what he was promising, even if it wasn't a lot of details, they liked the overall message and they were going to stick with him. Yeah, you had to wonder. And I know that the women who did come forward said they were apolitical. This is not why. It was because of his anti-abortion rights stance. But you did wonder at the time, would this, would this backfire in any way and help rally the cause behind Herschel Walker, those who supported him already? Lindsay, you were digging into the numbers. You found something even more here. You know, what's so interesting here, one in three voters in Georgia are black, right? And so when we're talking about the black vote here in particular, 89% going overwhelmingly for Rachel Warnock. But he is underperforming 4% less of the black vote than where he was during the special election uh, last year in 2021. And in particular, he's underperforming with black men by 6%. So those voters are actually going to Herschel Walker, only 3% less uh, with black women. And again, as Donna Brazil has pointed out, black women have time and time again been called the backbone of the Democratic Party. And we're seeing this bear out that black women are still more likely to go for Raphael Warnock. And again, these are the exit polls, what they're saying coming out. But Rick, what do you have by way of numbers? 29% uh, of the vote now in in Georgia. What are you seeing? Yeah, we're seeing the, as the vote flows in, we're actually getting the first in-person vote in at least a couple of places. Right now, we're seeing Raphael Warnock continue to hit the numbers he needs to do, particularly in Fulton County, as we discussed. It's a huge one. Uh, we heard Governor Christie talking a little bit before about the Georgia suburbs. Gwinnett County, a great example of that. And when we look at the benchmark numbers, Raphael Warnock ahead of where he needs to be to run an even race. He feels good about this. Again, though, most of the vote we have so far is early vote or early in person. We're still seeing a lot of split ticket voters. I just checked the numbers a, a, a moment ago and, and we're seeing again Raphael Warnock with a much larger lead uh, than, than, uh, than, than his ticket mate does has at the moment. We're going to see this shrink as the night goes on. There's no question in my mind with only less than about a third of the expected vote in. This is not the kind of margin we're going to see, but so far at least Raphael Warnock is hitting the kind of numbers he needs to. John? There's an important caveat to that, an important caveat, and that is, first of all, Fulton County is counting much faster than the rest of the state. So, you know, 63% of the vote is in Fulton County. That is a Democratic county. 63% uh, of the vote in compared to just 29% statewide. And the other thing is, of that vote, it's almost entirely early vote that has been counted so far in Fulton County. That is going to be the Democratic votes in the Democratic county. That's why you're still seeing on our board a big lead uh, for, for Warnock over, over Walker, that, that lead is going to shrink considerably, may or may not disappear. I mean, we'll see. All right. But right now, you're looking at heavily Democratic votes being counted so far. And it's very important to point out. I see first numbers coming in from North Carolina. Rachel, will come to you right after the break. It's now 15 minutes before 8 o'clock. We know at the top of the hour, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, Florida, all closing, all key states. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with our live coverage right here at ABC News, the midterms 2022.
News live coverage of the midterm election night here in America, a crucial night ahead, as you don't need me to tell you now. 48 minutes past 7 o'clock, a couple of key states have closed. We can uh, project in Kentucky in the Senate race there. I mentioned it some time ago. We can now say that Senator Rand Paul will serve a third term in the United States Senate. We're also tracking North Carolina at this hour, not projecting anything there. The numbers are still very early, 36 percent of the vote in. And you can see the Democrat there, Sherry Beasley, with a sizable lead. But again, it's very early. A lot of the rural areas in North Carolina still have to uh, be tabulated. Ted Budd, of course, the Republican member of Congress, uh, backed by Donald Trump in that race. I want to bring it right over to Rachel Scott at the big board because you've looked at some of these uh, metropolitan areas and Sherry Beasley is performing quite well. She is. We're really paying attention to what we're calling sort of the research triangle here, a bunch of college and universities around this area near Raleigh. So let's look at Wake County right now. With 54% of the vote expected in, Sherry Beasley is outperforming where President Biden did in this county two years ago. But again, Dave, you said it is very early here. No in-person uh, election day vote in just yet. This is early by mail, early in-person vote. So we will see these numbers start to shift. Curious, does the benchmark tool work on that one as well? It sure does, David. So let's take a look. 62% would be the benchmark, overperforming there at 68%. All right, at least for now. Let's get to Stephanie Ramos. She's live in North Carolina for us, part of our election night team. And Stephanie, uh, this race has been a little under the radar. And I know uh, Democrats uh, will be asking if she comes very close but doesn't pull this out, should they have spent more time on Sherry Beasley? Exactly, David. And they just cranked up the music here. Uh, everyone here has a little extra pep in their step with those early votes, early numbers coming in. But as you said, this Senate race really hasn't gotten that much attention, not much national attention, but it does have the possibility to make history tonight. If Beasley wins tonight and is elected to the Senate, she would be the third black woman elected to the Senate following Kamala Harris and Carol Mosley Braun. It is going to be tough. President Biden's approval rating here is very low, and Trump looms large over the Republican opponent in this race, Representative Ted Budd, a three-term congressman. So it is going to be tricky, uh, but what we heard last night at Beasley's campaign rally, the last ditch effort to get voters out there to vote for her, is that in order to win this, she needs a significant amount of votes in cities where a majority are black voters. Cities like Charlotte and Raleigh, where we are tonight, David. All right, Stephanie Ramos there in North Carolina. We'll come back to you often, Stephanie, and uh, give us a shout if you learn anything more from the campaign. Donna Brazil, uh, you know, North Carolina has broken the hearts of Democrats so many times before. Well, you know, I'm a Southerner. It has broken a lot of hearts. But here's one thing. Sherry Beasley knows politics. She's a former Supreme Court justice. They call her Justice Beasley. Um, she lost her last statewide race by 400 votes. This is an uphill climb because, you know, when, you, when your party is not invested in presidential years and you come in midterm years, you have to do a lot of groundwork. She's gotten a lot of support from Chuck Schumer, the traditional Democratic allies. Could she have used a little bit more money? Yes. But you know what? She is running a fabulous campaign. And she was very careful on that debate stage to distance herself between President Biden and what she would like to do if she makes it to Congress to the Senate. She actually said neither party is doing it right right now. That's which correct. Which has been an answer we've heard over and over again this campaign cycle. Bring it over to Governor Christie because you're hearing from folks on the ground in Georgia. In Georgia on real votes. So both mail-in vote and early vote. One of the early trends is that Walker is consistently trailing Kemp in that early vote by three and a three and a half percent. So what we talked about before, how well does Kemp do? What's his margin? If Walker's going three to three and a half percent lower consistently in the early vote, what's that tell you about whether Walker will have enough to get over the goal line or not? Kemp is going to need to get in 54, 55 percent of the vote if Walker consistently is three, three and a half points behind Warnock for Warnock to be able, or, or uh, for uh, Walker to be able to win. So you're seeing a choice, even amongst the Republicans, where Walker is not doing as well as Kemp's doing across the, and that's the entire state. They're saying that's consistent in every county they've looked at so far. We're going to be asking this question about other states too. Ohio Governor DeWine, extremely uh, popular there. We've already projected he wins because that was an easy one. The question is, does he help J.D. Vance uh, finish as well? And is it enough? I mean, even when they win, do they win by enough to be able to make up the drag 
with what Mitch McConnell called um, some, you know, some less than great candidates. I want to bring a House district into this conversation, Rachel Scott. You're, you're looking at Virginia, and you and I on World News have been talking the last couple of nights about what to watch early on election night for people who are watching us at home, and we're grateful for everybody who's watching. We're going to be here for hours tonight. Uh, this is a bellwether race in Virginia. It sure is, David, and I really have my eye on two different districts here, starting in Virginia's second district. This is Elaine Loria's district. She's a member of the January 6th Select Committee here. She's running in a very tough race against uh, Jen Kiggins in here. 27% of the vote expected in. We are seeing that Kiggins is doing pretty well here, but this is all election day vote. This is a district where President Biden won by just 3% of the vote. Republican Governor Glenn Youngkin won here by 10 percent of the vote. So this is a Democrat that is facing a lot of headwinds. She flipped this seat in 2018. She knows that her role on the January 6th committee may have turned some conservative voters off in this area. But, David, she says regardless of the results tonight, it is worth it. Rachel Scott over at the board. She's tracking the House races. And Elaine Luria, who had that high-profile role on the January 6th Select Committee in Washington, she famously said, Rachel, that if I lose this race because of my role on the January 6th Committee, it still will have been worth it. Rachel, we'll come back to that race often as soon as you have more. Our live coverage here in New York City of Election Night 2022 continues in a moment. The whole team is here. 8 o'clock is a key hour. Several key Senate races. We're tracking the first results expected to come in. We'll see you John Fetterman thinks the minimum wage is his weekly allowance from his parents. Brian Kemp has no solution for you. I was for Brian Kemp before it was cool. Joe Biden and Raphael Warnock has hurt Georgia families. Not only is he not ready for the job, he's not fit. I absolutely never called for defunding ICE. The Fraternal Order of Police has endorsed me. Carrie Lake is not qualified to hold this position. We cannot put a coward in the governor's office right now. We have way too much. A great deal is riding on these midterm elections and even greater uncertainty. Thanks for joining us in our In the News Now election special. I'm Madison Carter. Control of the U.S. Congress is up for grabs. If Republicans flip even one Democrat-held seat, they will gain the power to stop President Joe Biden's agenda. Here's Legally Speaking's Stephanie Haney for a closer look at some key battleground states. Midterm elections get that name because they're considered to sort of check in on how the president is doing in the middle of a four year term. And there is a lot at stake right now for Democrats since they control the presidency, the House of Representatives and the Senate. Although you wouldn't know it by the amount of legislation they've been able to pass. That's because control in the Senate is so narrow. It's actually split 50 50 and the Democrats only have control by virtue of Vice President Kamala Harris's tie breaking vote. And that is not enough of a margin to overcome the filibuster rule, which requires 60 votes to end debate before legislation can move to a final vote. That's the issue Democrats have been dealing with for two years. But now there are 35 seats up for election in the Senate and all 435 are on the ballot in the House. And depending on how these elections go, the parties in power could change. There are really six major elections to watch in the Senate that it could impact who holds power for the rest of President Joe Biden's term. Those races are in Georgia between Raphael Warnock and Herschel Walker, Pennsylvania between John Fetterman and Dr. Mehmet Oz, Nevada between Catherine Cortez Masto and Adam Laxalt, Arizona between Mark Kelly and Blake Masters, Ohio between Tim Ryan and J.D. Vance, and Wisconsin between Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes and Ron Johnson. There'll be hard fought battles between the candidates you hear and potentially making for a long election night for each of their campaigns. 
In the House, where the margin is larger for Democrats, it's actually more likely power flips to Republicans. Going into this election, Democrats hold 220 seats and Republicans hold 212, with three vacancies where one person passed away and two people have resigned. So the Democrats have the majority by eight seats. Now, it's sort of a general rule that whichever party doesn't hold the presidency will pick up seats in the House in the midterm elections, and it's usually a lot, like 26 seats a lot. That's been the average gain since the end of World War II. So that's why right now political polling site Project 538 predicts Republicans have a four in five chance, or an 80% shot, of taking control of the House. The Cook Political Report rates 33 seats as toss-ups that could go either way. The districts you see listed right here. 23 of those are currently held by Democrats and 10 are held by Republicans. And those will most likely be the ones that decide how power shifts in the House. This is Stephanie Haney, Legally Speaking. All right, now that we know what's up for grabs, let's dig a little deeper. Stephanie mentioned Georgia. One of the Senate races sure to come down to the wire is the race between Democratic incumbent Raphael Warnock and Republican challenger Herschel Walker for Senate. Warnock won the seat during a runoff election in January, and he continues to push the message that Walker is not fit to serve in this role. I think the people of Georgia are fired up, and they can see the differences between me and my opponent. I can tell you there's no comparison at all. Character matters. And uh, this is somebody who has demonstrated that not only is he not ready for the job, he's not fit. And when Senator Warnock took office, he said he was going to keep us safe. And instead, he let crime criminals out of jail. And he kept the border wide open. And when he took office, he said he was going to keep American family first. And instead, he put Joe Biden first. And I'm running to put Georgia first. Now, the race is neck and neck, which came as a surprise to many. But analysts break down how in a purple state like Georgia, it makes a lot of sense. Adrian Jones is a political science professor at Morehouse College. I think that that's a tight race. Um, and, you know, I, I know a lot of people think it shouldn't be. But the fact of the matter is it's not always about, you know, who's arguably the most qualified sometimes when the stakes are high as they are now, yeah. it's about who can get out the vote and maintain the balance of power um, both here in Georgia and then of course we're talking about in Washington DC. In races like this, experts say the definition of qualified continues to shift. I know that people are concerned about Herschel Walker's qualifications, um, but I think you need to think about what Herschel Walker is supposed to be qualified to do. Right. And again, let me repeat that at the end of the last um, 2020 election, right, the GOP lost a lot of vote share because the former president scared people and a lot of them stayed home. Herschel Walker is a Georgia sweetheart, right? He's charismatic in his way. Um, he is in, you know, beloved by Georgians and he is a standard bearer right now for the possibility of winning the Senate. Another critical race is in the Senate seat in Pennsylvania. Democratic candidate John Fetterman and Republican Mehmet Oz squared off in their one and only debate. The highly anticipated face-off gave voters a chance to see firsthand how Fetterman's health is suffering after a stroke in May and how political newcomer and TV personality Dr. Oz would fare in a debate. WNEP's Scott Schaefer takes a closer look at this closely watched race. The long-awaited face-to-face -face debate between Dr. Oz and Lieutenant Governor Fetterman finally happened at a TV station in Harrisburg, and Fetterman immediately addressed the topic at hand. I had a stroke. He's never let me forget that. And I might miss some words during this debate, mush two words together, but it knocked me down, but I'm going to keep coming back up. Fetterman had closed captioning to help him process the questions he often answered haltingly. Oz ignored his opponent's health during the hour-long debate, but attacked him for so-called radical positions on things like crime, immigration, and raising the minimum wage. John Fetterman thinks the minimum wage is his weekly allowance from his parents. He's not really cognizant of the real challenges of business owners who've got to balance that with employees. Two issues that provoked testy exchanges were energy and abortion. On energy, 
energy. John Fetterman has gone after the energy industry, called it a stain on Pennsylvania, and argued we have to ban fracking. He has never met an air, uh, uh, an oil company that he doesn't swipe right about. You know, he has never been able to stand up for working families all across Pennsylvania. On abortion, Oz stated his position that individual states should be able to determine their own laws and criticized Fetterman for what he believes is a misrepresentation. After the debate, Oz received a slight bump in polls. For some, the debate did not provide much clarity. I wish I could make a choice right now. I wish I could lean one way or the other and say so. I can't. I can't. I'm torn. And it's primarily on the abortion issue. Some people see this as a fitness issue. I don't because I think he's still cogent and smart and capable. But some people, because of the speech issue and the hearing issue, have some concerns. Experts say this race represents the best chance for Democrats to flip a Republican-held Senate seat this year. The Nevada state race may actually determine who controls the Senate. Stop me if you heard that one before. The race between incumbent Catherine Cortez Mosto and Republican Adam Laxalt is in a dead heat. Cortez Mosto is a former Nevada attorney general and became the first Latina elected to Congress in 2016. Laxalt is also a former Nevada attorney general. Abortion and the economy have remained top issues in that tight race. In Ohio, the candidates vying to fill the open U.S. Senate seat faced off twice in a debate. There were some heated and pointed moments between Republican J.D. Vance and Democrat Tim Ryan. Liana Lai shows us the highlights of that debate. It was not a debate. Rather, each candidate took to the stage to answer questions from voters. But right from the start, Democratic candidate Congressman Tim Ryan was on defense. And you called for defunding ICE. Why? Oh, I absolutely never called for defunding ICE. Not However, it became quite noticeable on the GOP-friendly network that the questions for Republican nominee J.D. Vance were not very challenging. Do you believe in the integrity of Ohio's elections? What are you going to do in the United States Senate to make sure that teachers are helped out? Tell me about the most challenging manual labor job you ever held. Vance, who previously struggled with explaining his stance on abortion exceptions, fully embraced a national 15-week abortion Ban. Simply, it provides reasonable exceptions, but it also sets a minimum national standard, and I think that that's a good idea. Ryan, for his part, defended his vote on the Inflation Reduction Act, crediting the legislation for economic wins for Ohio. Because once we passed that, we saw huge investments into the solar industry. Honda's putting a $4 billion battery plant there. We have a battery plant up in Youngstown. Both candidates condemned the attack on the husband of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Paul Pelosi was attacked by a person who's an illegal alien. That we have not independently verified, but calling David DePap an illegal alien needs more context. Media outlets from the New York Post to the Washington Post report that DePap entered the U.S. legally from Canada in 2000, but that his visa expired. You have said in the past that you would be for eliminating cash bail. Well, what I'm talking about here is marijuana crimes. I think we need to legalize marijuana. But this is what he told the ACLU back in 2019. Um, and we're seeing states end cash bail state by state. Would you support that yeah. nationally? Yeah, I think the bail system is... Senator Marco Rubio and his challenger, Democratic Representative Val Demings, are in the final stretch of their Senate race. The two faced each other in one debate and each won on the attack. I sponsored a bipartisan red flag law styled after Florida, not the crazy one they just passed, a real red flag law that would allow the police department to go before a judge and remove your guns if they can prove that you are a danger. This is about taking dangerous guns out of the hands of dangerous people. And the overwhelming majority of people in our nation want us to do just that. How long will you watch people being gunned down in first grade, fourth grade, high school, college, church, synagogue, a grocery store, a movie theater, a mall, and a nightclub Congresswoman. and do nothing? Rubio is seeking his third term, Demings as a three-term congresswoman and a former police chief. In Wisconsin, Republican Senator Ron Johnson and Democrat Mandela Barnes issued their closing arguments. Johnson, the Republican incumbent, and Barnes, the current lieutenant governor, are locked into a tight race for Senate. Kara's Danny Spiewak takes us to the final push for votes. Who's that guy? During stops in River Falls and Hudson on Wednesday, 
he won't be honest. Republican nice. Senator Ron Johnson focused on his opponent. Mandela Barnes contempt and disdain for America, for law enforcement. The lieutenant governor has gone on the attack too. A person that for 12 long years has turned his back on every single person in this room, every single person in this state. The GOP needs to flip just one seat to take the U.S. Senate. So Wisconsin has emerged as a battleground. Last weekend, former President Obama stumped for Barnes, criticizing Johnson's plan to have Congress review Social Security spending each year. Bad long hours and sore backs and bad knees to get that Social Security. And if Ron Johnson does not understand that. You've been accused of wanting to gut Social Security. Would you support cuts to Social Security if you're reelected? Well, first of all, that's a total lie. I've never said that. I want to save Social Security. I've just been pointing out the greatest threat to any government program is the massive out of control deficit spending. But Johnson says Congress should be able to decide annual spending on things like Social Security, which is currently a mandatory program. Uh, we need to look at the entire budget and start prioritizing spending, but the top of the priority list is obviously Social Security, Medicare, and Defense. Barnes, meanwhile, supports higher taxes on the wealthy to fund Social Security. Unlike Johnson, he has also made abortion rights an issue. Any politician that wants to take away a woman's right to choose, who wants to put our Social Security and Medicare on the chopping block or send our Wisconsin jobs out of state or overseas does not deserve our consideration. If elected, Barnes would be Wisconsin's first black U.S. Senator. Another incumbent is trying to hang on to his seat in the Senate. Which is, I've been strong on border security and I've stood up to Democrats when they're wrong on this issue. I suspect President Trump would be in the White House today if big tech and big media and the FBI didn't work together to put the thumb on the scale to get Joe Biden in there. In Arizona, Democratic incumbent Mark Kelly faces a really tough reelection fight that comes from Blake Masters, a Republican who pundits say is more in the mold of the former President Donald Trump. The fundamental dynamic in this race is, is really you've got a popular Democrat um, against a uh, Republican who's wounded coming out of the primary and, and trying to reinvent himself. And the polls consistently show, you know, a small but but distinct lead for for Kelly. Blake Masters uh, ran to the right. He's got a um, persona who's sort of uh, provocative. He likes to say controversial things. Uh, I think that endeared him to a lot of Republican primary voters. But it uh, also, you know, gave the Democrats a lot of fodder. Across the nation, political scientists like Adrian Jones at Morehouse College are watching this race and several others that may serve as a referendum on the former president's influence. In Arizona, for example, um, I think that the Trump indicia carries quite a lot, um, especially where, you know, now he's back on the campaign trail. There's a possibility that he might run in 2024. Staying in Arizona, a huge Trump supporter is Republican challenger Carrie Lake. She is running against Democrat Katie Hobbs in one of the most watched gubernatorial races of this election cycle. Hobbs has been criticized for refusing to debate Lake. Hobbs says Lake would only turn a debate into a spectacle. I'm not avoiding any issues. There's not a single issue that I'm avoiding. I am willing to have tough conversations with, with, with voters, with reporters, um, and this is a narrative that they're uh, using to distract from the fact that Carrie Lake is not qualified to hold this position. She has no plans. She's only offering empty rhetoric and extreme positions. If we don't get it right right now, if we allow someone like a Katie Hobbs to get into the governor's office, we will turn into California. Those policies that are destroying that state will come over here. We'll have a wide open border. The cartels will remain in control and we will lose this precious state that we love so much. Arizona, a historically Republican state, has moved toward the Democrats in recent elections. Another hot gubernatorial race is in Georgia. It has garnered national interest. Republican incumbent Governor Brian Kemp up against Democratic candidate Stacey Abrams. Doug Richards caught up with the two in Atlanta. If you are south of I-20 or south of the Nat line, Brian Kemp has no solution for you. Democrat Stacey Abrams' appearance at the now closed Wellstar Atlanta Medical Center coincided with workers behind her taking down the signage that marked the landmark hospital. The Atlanta Medical Center, previously Georgia Baptist, survived 120 years, but it could not survive four years of Brian Kemp. 
Abrams faults Governor Brian Kemp for preventing Georgia from expanding Medicaid with federal money that she says would have delivered health insurance to tens of thousands of Georgians and kept the hospital open. Kemp hotly disputes that Medicaid expansion would have saved the Atlanta Medical Center. Y'all give him a big Georgia welcome. Kemp was with former Vice President Mike Pence, two Republicans estranged from their one-time benefactor, former President Donald Trump after they both declined to help Trump overturn the 2020 election results. I can honestly say I was for Brian Kemp before it was cool. What do you think about Mike Pence? I think he's a wonderful guy, and I'm so proud of what he did on January 6th. Pence and Kemp did not mention health care, but did talk up fighting crime and inflation. And Kemp attributes his lead in the polls over Abrams to work his campaign has done flipping traditional Democrats. Going in, you know, to the African-American vote and saying, who, who kept your business open? Who was fighting for you? Who was fighting to get your kids back in the classroom? Who's fighting to keep your neighborhood safe? While the players are the same as the last election cycle, the stakes are much different this time around. I think Stacey Abrams definitely has a chance, but I think it's a hard road. This is a different race than the one in 2018, right? She's also a Black woman running for governor in the state of Georgia, where, you know, a state that has long resisted Black statewide leadership. Last time they were both needing to establish their bona fides, whereas now, uh, you know, Abrams is needing to explain to people what she's going to do, whereas Kemp actually has a record. Um, so I think it's a little harder. Political scientist Dr. Adrian Jones says incumbent Brian Kemp has used his last four years in office wisely. Kemp and Raffensperger, the secretary of state here, they come off looking like they have bells on, right? They resisted the former president's ask for 11,780 votes. Um, so they look as if, you know, they didn't commit treason. <laughs> and so, you know, suddenly, not only has Kemp been the governor now for four years and you know, has quite a bit of support as a result, has brought economic programs to the state. Um, he does have a, a a friendly state legislature that is also dominated by the GOP. Um, and so Stacey is alone this time in not having been the governor before. Jones feels the media coverage of this race is gonna play a big role at the polls. I have found that a lot of the coverage focuses quite a bit on what might go wrong with her race um, as compared to the Kemp coverage, which, you know, conveys that he's had a successful first term. Many experts say don't be surprised if it takes days or weeks before we know who won in some of these highly competitive races. That's going to do it for now. Thanks for watching our In the News Now election special. I'm Madison Carter. For more stories in the news, go to our video on demand. Click on news at the top of your screen. There you'll find everything from politics to investigations to feel good stories. Don't let anybody tell you your vote doesn't count. We don't know which way the midterm election is going to go. We hope to make this the most transparent election ever. This is really manipulation and misinformation online. Right now, democracy itself is on the ballot as well. The president is not on the ballot, but in a way, everything he's done to this point is. Thanks for watching our In the News Now election special. I'm Madison Carter. November 8th is not just another day on the calendar. It's the day voters will head to the polls to decide the future of this country. It's the day voters will determine what Congress will look like for the rest of President Joe Biden's term. It's the day voters will decide who leads their cities, towns, and states. So here's a simple guide to explain why the midterm 2022 elections are so critical. The congressional midterm elections are set for November 8th. Those are elections held two years after the presidential election. Control of the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives will be on the line. Historically, midterms favor the party that doesn't control the White House. All 435 seats in the House will be up for grabs, as they are every two years. This will also be the first election since congressional districts were redrawn following the 2020 census. Democrats have a roughly 10-seat House majority. 
Vacancies or special elections to fill vacancies can frequently change that number, but not by much. Since 1934, the party of the president has gained seats in the House just three times in the midterm elections. The president's party on average loses 27.6 House seats. The 100-seat Senate is split 50-50. Two of those are independents who typically vote with Democrats. 34 of the 100 Senate seats are up for election this year. Since 1934, the president's party loses an average of 3.6 Senate seats in the midterms. Six times, the president's party gained seats, and in one midterm, there was no change. How will this election affect my wallet is top of mind for voters. Democratic and Republican candidates have their playbook of topics. One hot button issue that's definitely in play for voters is abortion rights. The recent Dobbs decision allowing some states to roll back abortion provisions is a huge motivator for many on the left to turn out and vote. It's something that probably will not dictate all of the midterm elections. Instead, we have some true dollars and cents issues on the ground. So inflation, the economy, how people are feeling when they fill up their gas tank, that is a true big impact that things will probably overshadow the Dobbs decision. Historically, midterm elections generally have low voter turnout, but many states have already reported record setting early voting numbers. There is evidence to suggest the Dobbs decision is increasing voter registration spikes and it's increasing this more among women. We saw this in the Kansas election recently. We might not see it in every state that's holding an election, but there are more women who are turning out to register, which is a good indication that they'll turn out to vote come November. We don't know which way the midterm election is going to go. The elections are November 8th. It may be decided on that night. It may take a while for the uh, final ballots to be counted, but what what we do know is that there's a very high likelihood that Congress will again be very split, either very narrowly held by one party or split between one party and the other party. And all of that uncertainty is going to provide a lot of challenges for meeting the needs of the country and for delivering on whatever is uh, top of mind for Joe Biden in the White House. Top of mind for many Hispanic voters, inflation, school safety, health care and abortion. San Diego's Steve Price talked with two leaders who are making sure Hispanics have a louder voice in their communities. You talk to almost any politician, you would think that immigration is the only issue that we care about. Gary Acosta says in reality, immigration isn't even a top five concern for Latino voters right now. And a recent poll from Unidos US and Mi Familia Vota supports that. Inflation certainly is number one. Healthcare is among those and gun violence. Clarissa Martinez from Unidos US says for the first time ever, abortion is a top concern with three quarters of those surveyed saying regardless of their personal beliefs, they think it's wrong to make abortion illegal. Because this is a community that believes very strongly in family, faith and country, the assumption has been that Latinos uh, are against abortion or are divided. Well, that hasn't been true before the, the Supreme Court decision, nor is it true now. The school shooting in Uvalde is also mobilizing the Latino voting base, which lists gun violence as their number two concern after inflation. They want school safety and mental health programs, but too many politicians are going in an entirely different direction. We have seen some politicians trying to make headlines by taking an approach of putting a gun in every hand, basically. Uh, Hispanics don't agree with that approach. Clarissa also says while immigration is not a top issue right now for Latinos, politicians creating a toxic immigration environment is always a concern. When there's this toxic rhetoric demonizing Latino immigrants, somebody who looks at you from across the street doesn't know if you're undocumented or a citizen or not, and those stereotypes and that antagonism tends to play out in any case. But Latino leaders know that things won't change if their community doesn't vote. UCLA's Latino Policy and Politics Institute says in the 2020 election, turnout of registered voters in San Diego was 81.2 percent. But for Latinos, that number dropped to just 71.7 percent. By comparison, white voter turnout was 85.7 percent. Thank you so much for being here this morning. It's a real honor. Gary talked about that very issue with former President Barack Obama at the Latitude Convention in San Diego last month. Obama's response? If you're a community that doesn't vote 
at the same numbers as other segments of the segments of the population, your issues are not going to rise to the top. They're not going to get done. That was his point. And that leads to this concern. There is not a lot of excitement over November's election, so leaders fear Latino turnout will be low. But they say, in reality, this election is extremely important. State and local elected leaders sometimes have a bigger impact on our daily lives than somebody at the presidential level. The bottom line, Latino voters can make a big difference in elections, but they have to go to the polls in higher percentages. And those voters tend to be socially liberal, but fiscally conservative, making them open to both major parties and to candidates who are truly listening to their concerns. We want both parties to work to earn our vote. Um, and I think they can. Um, and if they focus on the things that Latinos really care about, they're gonna find a very attentive audience. I tell you your vote doesn't count. The Black Voters Matter bus tour is traveling across the country to mobilize black voters and engage with policymakers, faith-based leaders, black influencers, and HBCU students. The bus made a stop in Jacksonville, Florida last month for a rally. WKYC's Carmen Blackwell picks up the story from the Cleveland stop. And when people don't exercise the right to vote, then democracy is in peril. Black Voters Matter, a mobilized bus tour group, are traveling across the Midwest and stopping in 24 major cities ahead of midterm elections on November 8th. The group is a partnership of several local organizations, including the Freedom Block, Toledo Chapter of the Lynx, National Congress of Black Women, and a number of local churches and more. Their mission? Focusing on campaigning for black rights by encouraging black people to exercise their right to vote. Black people had better get out and vote. Yes, and we do. If, if they don't know the importance, I don't know how to explain it, but because of voting, we are. The We Won't Black Down Fall Bus Tour will make stops across Ohio, and the first stop included East Cleveland. When people don't know what the issues are, they don't know the history, how hard the struggle to just get the right to vote actually was, then they don't realize how important this election is. The group's mission is focused on meeting with minority communities like East Cleveland, where voting has historically not been a priority. Somewhere of upwards of 50 percent of black communities have no idea there's an election being held for the midterms. That's horrifying. So we're out here pushing the word out that there is a midterm election, that you need to vote. Don't let anybody suppress your vote. We're in Ohio. Other stops for the bus tour will continue in Northeast Ohio over the next couple of days, in Akron, then Columbus. Engaging voters is the name of the game for political candidates. Georgia's Muslim community in particular is pushing for more attention in this election. Karis Belger in Atlanta has more. For Shafina Kabani and her team of staff and volunteers, the last few weeks have been busy. Our community members are really excited um, to be engaged. Between registering voters and hosting events, like Saturday's candidate forum, Kabani and her staff are trying to make sure Georgia's Muslim community is ready for the upcoming midterm. It's a really important platform for us to provide to our community members. Kabani is the executive director of the Georgia Muslim Voter Project, which started in 2015 as a way to fill the gap in political engagement. Kabani says that work is more important than ever heading into the November 8th general election. We actually have a list of approximately 70 to 80,000 likely registered Muslim voters in the state of Georgia. So whereas at one time in 2015 where we were maybe reaching out and calling 800 to 1,000 Muslim voters. Since its founding, the GAMVP has been focused on registering as many of these voters as possible and making sure they know about their local electoral process. Aside from Metro Atlanta, GAMVP has hosted events in places like Athens, Savannah, and Columbia. Kabani says the outreach is vital in touching on key issues for the Muslim community. Civil rights, immigration, the economy. A lot of Muslim Americans are small business owners, so the economy is really important to them. Kabani says language access is sometimes a concern, as are the recent changes to Georgia's voter laws. 
More and more people, she says, are coming to her and her staff with questions. I'm not sure how to fill out my absentee ballot or how, how do you vote by absentee or what are the early voting dates. And they're eager to answer because it means more engagement from Georgia's Muslim community. And come November, she wants to see them at the polls. In Cobb County, Karis Belger, 11 Alive News. In San Antonio, a group advocating for change within the Asian American Pacific Islander community did their part to get voters out to the polls. Ken's reporter Holly Stouffer explains. It's hard not to smile when you're making a difference. These people belong to a group called Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders for Justice in San Antonio. A rise in anti-Asian American crimes during the pandemic spurred their movement. We still sometimes feel some of the hate that is still out there. They speak um, up against racism. Because the U.S. is our home. Lead community organizer Myra Dumapias says on National Voter Registration Day, they raise the volume of the voices in their community. The look on people's faces when they saw the posters in their own language, when shoppers at Alibaba saw the posters and stickers of National Voter Registration Day in Arabic. Um, among the Filipino restaurants, they saw the material in Tagalog. Over the weekend, they'll be at Noodle Tree, the ramen restaurant that was vandalized in March. I still remember how the community came together. They erased the hateful messages spray painted on windows and outdoor tables. Us being at Noodle Tree is symbolic. You know, we're still here. Based on estimates from Asian and Pacific Islander American Vote, more than 14,000 Asian Americans in Bear County aren't registered to vote. Being able to vote will allow us a chance to remain uh, conscious of our own identity, our own history, and our capacity to have a voice and impact in our own country. Dumapias hopes their persistence pays off. Holly Stouffer, Ken's 5 Eyewitness News. The 2022 midterms will bring about some changes at the polls. Since 2021, lawmakers in 21 states have passed some kind of election law. One of those states is Texas. William Joy from Dallas explains. For most voters, they're really not going to see too many differences. But since the 2020 election, Texas has passed major voting changes that supporters say add integrity and critics claim create suppression. Election integrity is of paramount importance. In Houston this weekend, Governor Greg Abbott touted the new election law that Democrat lawmakers fled the state to try to block. We knew they were going to come back. When they came back, we passed an even tougher election integrity bill. One of the biggest changes is allowing partisan poll watchers to move freely at locations and see and hear activity. Texas Democrats worried it could lead to intimidation. I think that when SB1 was initially passed that there were a lot of concerns. What we found in the last several elections is that the poll watchers are just there to do their jobs. The law also bans 24-hour voting and drive-through voting that was set up in Harris County during the pandemic to help working class voters and requires counties to add live cameras of their county. People are are suspicious of the of the of the process and so what we've done is to try to be as transparent as possible. Texas has more candidates who support the false claim that Donald Trump won the 2020 election than any other state according to reporting from 538. The new laws will be tested by increased tension and increased voters. If issues happen, we will react accordingly. In Dallas, I'm William Joy. There is concern over how some candidates will handle election outcomes. A Duke University political science professor says the 2020 presidential election may have set a new precedence in how candidates handle defeat in the midterms. She says candidates this time around may delay their concessions and protest election results. First, what you're seeing is an unprecedented number of candidates who are repeating this factually incorrect claim that the 2020 presidential election was fraudulent. Um, according to some counts, this is well over 350 candidates. As primary candidates tend to be more extreme, we might expect this kind of refusal to accept defeat. The 2020 presidential election was also mirrored by distrust about the voting process and misinformation leading up to election day. The FBI warns election interference will come from influencing voters and not so much people hacking equipment. Charlotte's Vanessa Rufus explains. 
with those elections heating up, so are the attempts to shake voter confidence in the voting process. So the FBI is warning about that tonight, saying foreign actors are actively working on this right now, and they're not doing it it by widespread hacking of infrastructure of voting machines and such. But this is really manipulation and misinformation online. The FBI says that this can take the form of spoof, spoofed websites, fake online personas, dark web channels, and their goal really is to spread and amplify false claims of a compromised voting process and undermine voter confidence in our democracy. So today I spoke with Phil Napoli, a Duke professor of public policy and also director of the DeWitt Wallace Center for Media and Democracy about this movement we're seeing online. 2020 put the blood in the water that people here are very vulnerable to the assertion of um, election fraud. The absence of evidence and proof over the past year and a half uh, has, has has not done much uh, to affect the beliefs of, of a certain proportion of, of our electorate. Uh, and so that creates huge incentive for foreign actors to really continue to lean on that weak leg of the table, so to speak. So now who's doing this? Well, Napoli says most recently we are seeing China, which he says was previously focusing its efforts elsewhere in the world, but is now turning its attention to U.S. users in recent months. He also points to Russia and Iran. Now, you might be wondering, how do you protect yourself? Well, of course, you got to be skeptical out there. Inflammatory content you're seeing on social media. Think about this. Who is posting that information online? Does it come from a legitimate source? And then kind of consider some basic web you know, tactics, if you will, caps, typos. These are red flags that you want to look at. Is the poster barraging social media with the same links over and over? We actually are going to revisit here this example we talked about earlier this week where bot accounts descended on Facebook posts about the Raleigh shooting with these fake links saying, hey, we've got the surveillance video. This tactic actually has a name. The FBI calls this astroturfing. A bunch of fake accounts share the same message or links in droves. This is an effort to create the false impression of widespread grassroots support. Tech companies say they are doing everything they can to address misinformation on their sites. That'll do it for now. Thanks for watching the In the News Now election special. I am Madison Carter. For more stories in the news, go to our video on demand. Click on news at the top of your screen. There you'll find everything from politics to investigations to feel good stories. As candidates make their final push before the midterm elections, you may start seeing more of them touting endorsements from celebrities or notable organizations. That led Verify viewer Jack to wonder whether politicians might simply be paying those folks to endorse them. So let's verify. Is it legal for political candidates to pay for endorsements? Our sources are the Federal Election Commission and the Federal Election Campaign Act. According to the FEC, there is no law banning candidates from paying for endorsements. A spokesperson told Verify, quote, no provisions in the FEC rules specifically address paid endorsements of federal candidates. But candidates are legally required to disclose such payments. The Federal Election Campaign Act requires campaigns for federal office to file regular reports on where their money comes from and where it goes. That report has to include the name and address of any person to whom an expenditure in excess of $200 is made, together with the date, amount, and purpose of such expenditure. So paying for an endorsement isn't illegal, but trying to hide that payment could get you in trouble. A notable example, a former Iowa state senator named Kent Sorensen. According to court records in 2012, he took money in exchange for endorsements for Republican candidates for president. He was charged with willfully causing false expenditure reports and obstruction of justice. He pleaded guilty and received a 15-month prison sentence. But it was for the cover-up, not the payments themselves. So we can verify, yes, it is legal for federal candidates to pay for endorsements but they are legally required to disclose those payments. With your Verify, I'm Casey Decker. There's lots of misinformation about elections and how the ballot counting process works. So to help understand it, we went to Cynthia Paz, the San Diego County, California Registrar of Voters to understand how her team keeps the election secure. 
So as ballots are coming back, California law allows us to start processing immediately. Mm -hmm. So we run the envelopes, the return envelopes, through this high-speed sorter. At this point, it's capturing the image of the back of the envelope, which includes the voter's signature. Then those are trade up in trays of 100 to 200 envelopes, depending on the size of the election. And we place them on the back wall and we can walk around and see that. Well, let me ask you before then, why is it important that you get that image of the voter's signature before this process is taken? Well, or once it's, it comes through, this machine is actually capturing that image. But why is that image important? The image then goes to our comparison software. So we have um, approximately 30 employees trained to do signature verification. Mm -hmm. So once they run through, we've had 240,000 uh, voted ballots returned already. As of today, we tray them up and we put them on the wall back here. And they sit there while it's going through signature verification. So with signature verification, we're comparing the signature on the envelope against the signature for that voter in their voter registration file. That side-by-side -side comparison is done. If it clears, then it moves on. These trays are then run through the ballot sorting machine, well, the mail sorting machine. And at that point is when it's sliced open and then it's ready to go to next door to extraction. So the signatures are approved first and then you open the ballot? <clears throat> yes. So they'll sit there until the signatures are cleared. Then we could go back out here. So once the signatures are verified and cleared, then they come to our extraction room. Here we have manual extraction as well as that more automated extractors in the back. Usually we keep up within the 24 hour period. So mm -hmm. uh, we received about 15,000 mail ballots in the mail today. Those will be ready for, for opening tomorrow. They'll go through signature verification. So we're always keeping up within a 24 hour period to move them on to tabulation. At this point, they extract the ballot from the envelope. The envelope is always voter information down. That voter information is always secret. The ballot is secret. You separate the ballot from the envelope and there's no tying it back to the envelope it came from. They do a quick quality check just to make sure there's no obvious damage, tears, anything that would keep the ballot from properly running through the scanning equipment. If there's no damage, that gets box, boxed up and moved on to tabulation. If there is damage, it will go to the remake okay. teams next door. So in here, um, a small percentage of ballots that are returned could be damaged. Um, also, voters may mark their ballot in unique ways where they may use a glitter marker and we can't run glitter through our scanners. So the ballot will need to be remade. This is a fully transparent process. We have observers typically that are here observing the process. It's a team of two employees and they have the original voter ballot and then the other, as one is calling the contest, the other is marking the screen. Hmm. Once they remake the ballot, then they switch places and compare the work, make sure nothing was missed. Then they print the ballot from the ballot marking device. They both sign both ballots and then they add a, a numerical code. So the ballot and the original ballot could be tied together at any point. If there's um, a challenge, a recount after we certify the election, then we could pull out all of those original marked ballots and compare it to the remade ballot. Okay. So that's the remake process. If there's no damage to the ballot, then the box moves on to tabulation. So this process so, is all happening behind the wall here, yes. essentially. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the tabulation room. This is the tabulation room. Um, this is where the voting system resides. So this is a secure room. It's an air gap system. 
the voting system is not connected to the internet or any other system in any way. Why is that? It's closed connections. That's for security. So it's, it's the simple security of the voting system. And it's California state law. So our voting system went through very rigorous uh, testing requirements through the California Secretary of State. Once the voting system is approved, then counties in California can purchase them. So this is where the voting system resides. There's not a lot of activity right now. It's okay. But so as they get scanned into the system, then they're boxed up. And then of course, those results become, a, become counted shortly after 8 p.m. election night. So on November 8th, shortly after 8, when we have the initial unofficial election night results, that will include all of these mail ballots that have already been received mm -hmm. prior to election day. We've received them, we've been able to process them, and they're in the count. It will also include the early voting days from all the vote centers. So between, they open tomorrow, so between October 29th through November 7th, all those early voting uh, ballots will be in mm -hmm. that initial count. On election night, throughout the night, there will be periodic updates as vote centers close up and return. So once we complete the day, those updates throughout the night will only include ballots cast at vote centers on election day will not include any mail ballots yet mm -hmm. until the following days. So we'll end up with our final unofficial election night count once all the vote centers report. And then we usually will provide an, um, an estimated number of what we think is outstanding, mm -hmm. what we think may still be coming in the mail that needs to be processed, um, an estimate of how many provisionals might still be outstanding. And those, we will enter into the count over the following days and weeks following election day. So who comes up with this procedure? Um, and obviously you get a lot of say into how it's done here in San Diego, but where do you get these standards established for this policy? So the California Secretary of State does uh, create regulations based on California state law, based on elections code. So everything we do is outlined in elections code. Um, the Secretary of State will often provide more guidance, um, like with our mail ballot, our official ballot drop box program. They'll provide guidance on um, the frequency of picking them up, how these boxes should be designed, with um, particular security features. Mm. So they do provide those regulations and we do, as counties, we do follow those. And can you do even more if you wanted to? Absolutely. Maybe pick them up more often because you've got a lot more people and what customizations have you done? Right, so the law requires that we have one vote center for every 10,000 registered voters. So that we would be right around 192 vote centers. Here in San Diego, we have 218 vote centers. So we provide more. We wanna have more opportunities and options for our voters. Mm -hmm. uh, our ballot drop boxes, we provide more than the minimum there as well. So this election is the first time we're using the standalone permanent official drop boxes. Mm -hmm. Um, we had started this as a voluntary program in 2014, where we coordinated with local libraries, some other community um, organizations, and we would have two staff out there with an official uh, mail ballot drop box. They would collect um, ballots throughout the month. Well, it was one week leading up until election day. Um, but they would collect ballots. And we started that voluntary program, not required in law back in 2014. <laughs> now under the Voters' Choice Act, um, it is law. And we have to have one ballot drop box for every 15,000 registered voters. We have over the minimum. Um, we are picking up almost daily at most locations. Uh, where the requirements are anywhere from every 92 hours, 72 hours. So they adjust as you get closer to election day, but those are outlined in the regulations. And so the safeguards are in place that 
the state passes down and then you can go above that as well when it comes Absolutely. to picking up those ballots, right? Is that, can you talk about the safeguards and how you secure those ballots? Specific to the ballot drop box program, we have um, retrieval teams of two. That's one of the safeguards in our elections is that voted ballots can never be um, managed by one individual mm -hmm. during transport um, until it's secured here at the registrar's office. It always must be a two person chain of custody. So we have numerous retrieval teams that go out every day to retrieve ballots from drop boxes. They arrive at the drop box with a separate secure container. The container in the drop box is also secure and lockable. So once you unlock, bring out the con container, they have um, tamper evident locks that they secure those ballots, load it in the truck and replace it with the new container. Then they return here um, and then there's chain of custody documentation as they're handing it over to our voter services staff to then start the whole process of running it through the large capacity um, <laughs> uh, mail sorter down at the end. Would you have any different safeguards in place if it's, you know, if this is the midterm election, there's federal offices on the ballot versus if it were a recount, let's say, in your, or a, a redo of some other local special election? No, we take every election at serious. Security is of the utmost importance. The transparency, the openness of our elections are of the utmost support, importance, regardless of the size whether it's a, a small local election, special election to a presidential general, we treat them all equally. And the safeguards are the same for both? Absolutely. Great. Anything I didn't ask that you want to get out there that I didn't ask you about safeguards? So um, now speaking just to the audits we do in California, mm. um, prior to scanning any live ballots in the election, we do a logic and accuracy test which means we're running test ballots to check the accuracy of our tabulation equipment across every contest on the ballot in the county. So we have over 200 contests on our ballot across the county, over 500 candidates on this ballot, 26 measures on this ballot. Um, so we're checking the accuracy at that point before any live ballots are scanned and all equipment is checked. Once we conduct the election, following election day, we do an audit of 1% of our mail ballot batches and 1% of our vote center batches. We must cover every contest in the county. So if that random selection didn't catch every contest, then we continue doing random pulls until every contest is covered. So it's often more like 5% of a manual tally. We have 10 teams of three that, or 10 to 20 teams of three that start that manual tally process after election day. So again, at the end, we are verifying the accuracy of our tabulation equipment. And who comes up with that process? Is that one that you do and go above and beyond, or is that something that also is- That out? is outlined in elections code. So that is California state law. And then, does you, and so you said 5%, does that mean you end up going above and beyond well, that? Yes, yeah. we okay. do. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, right? <laughs> it is, it's okay. absolutely okay. I'm Stephen Olemacher, and I'm the election decision editor for the Associated Press based in Washington, D.C. I oversee about 60 analysts on election night, and we declare the winners in about 7,000 races across the U.S. Elections are complex across the United States. While there are federal laws and the Constitution that guide much of them, elections are run by states, and state laws uh, dictate a lot of the processes. So different states have different rules for the hours of voting, for how they're tabulated, how the results are released. It is really a, a broad mix of different types of elections in different states. We don't know what's gonna happen on election night, but we're preparing for the possibility that in many states, we might not be able to call all the winners on election night because it's going to take days to count all of the votes. And if you think about it, it's the states where they have competitive races. It's states like Pennsylvania, it's a state like Arizona, it could be a state like Colorado as well. 
In Pennsylvania, under state law, they cannot open mail ballots until the morning of election day. And it takes a long time to process those ballots and count them. So they very well might not be able to count all of their ballots on election day. It could take days. And since we do expect there to be close races there for both Senate and governor, it could take a while before we know who wins. Across the country, this is not new. In many years, it takes a long time in various states to find out who won different elections. In the pandemic, it did get uh, more pronounced, and that's because of the increase in mail ballots. It also be it became more pronounced in more states. At the AP, we follow the numbers. We call races without fear or favor. If the numbers say that a candidate has won, and we can verify that the, the vote count is accurate, we declare a winner. Candidates concede, candidates declare victory, the information is noteworthy. We report that in our stories on the wire, but it doesn't really affect our race calls and when we declare a winner. We follow the process. You know, we will have 4,000 people spread out across the country at counties and townships talking directly to election officials getting results and they will call those results in to vote entry operators we have about 800 of them entering votes into our system we have a large quality control team that will be checking for errors and checking across platforms to make sure that the votes align so that we can present the most accurate fastest vote totals to, to the country to the world so when we call the race we'll just take it live Every state offers absentee ballots, which allow you to vote by mail, either with or without an excuse, depending on where you live. But according to vote.org, one claim that it hears all too often is that absentee ballots are only counted in tight races. So let's verify using these sources. All election officials are required to count every eligible ballot, according to the Federal Voting Assistance Program, regardless of whether you vote in person or absentee. The U.S. Vote Foundation says some of the misconceptions stem from when races are called early for a candidate. This happens when it's not mathematically possible for their opponent to win. So even if you know the result, those absentee ballots are still counted in the final tally. Plus, there are many races on a single ballot. So just because one is a slam dunk for a candidate doesn't mean that's the case for another. So no, absentee ballots are not only counted in close races. With your Verify, I'm Brandon Lewis.
You're watching Local 5's election coverage. Just minutes left till the polls close for your vote. While we wait for results, we have our political analysts here, Roz Smith and Craig Robinson. Let's talk about the big key races you're following right now. Yeah, for me, uh, focusing on the Iowa legislature, it's going to be the state Senate District 46 race between incumbent uh, Kevin Kinney and challenger Don Driscoll. I think that's going to be really indicative as to what happens and what dominoes fall down the line. Yeah, for me, I'm looking at the two big congressional races in CD2 and 3, uh, right here in Polk County and then mm -hmm. up in uh, uh, Lynn County and Dubuque and stuff with uh, Ashley Henson and Liz Mathis. Any surprises you're seeing right now? Uh, nothing yet. I mean, we'll, we'll know when polls close. Yeah. <laughs> Patiently waiting, but not yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The patience, there's not much of it in here right now no. tonight. Be sure to stay with us at Local 5. We're going to be on air. And at this point, can you talk about um, anything that you're seeing right now locally that it, any numbers that are coming up or is it mostly, you <coughs> were talking about Florida just a moment ago. Yes, the, the, the race between Mark, Mark Rubio and Val Demings was interesting to me. I think last time I saw it, there's almost a 15 uh, point spread there. That was really interesting to see that given all the variables. Uh, she's in law enforcement, um, have you know, serves in elected office as of right now, uh -huh. has an apparatus built, structure built. So it's interesting to see that, that significant of a spread already. Yeah, and speak to just real quick, the issues that are bringing Iowans to the polls. Yeah, I think it's mostly economic tonight. Mm -hmm. I, and I know activists are sometimes keyed up on it, on other issues, but I think for the general voter, it's pocketbook stuff. Yeah, I mean, everything right now, grocery stores to the yeah, mass stations, absolutely. people are Everyone really feeling feels it. it. Yep. We're going to be on air, online, on digital, through it all. Be stay to stick with us here at Local 5 election coverage, step at a time. Welcome to Verify This Election Edition. I'm your host, Ariante Till. When it comes to elections, it's important to know just the facts, from deciding who to vote for to how voting will work. That's where our Verify team comes in, helping separate fact from fiction so you can make informed decisions. So let's get started with a reminder of what a midterm election is and why it's so important when it comes to control of the House and the Senate. Here's Casey Decker with your election fast facts. Verify here with your election fast fact. This election is a midterm. That's a federal election where the president is not on the ballot. So who is? Well, every member of the House of Representatives and a third of senators. That's because the Constitution gave the president, reps, and senators different term lengths. We vote for president every four years, our reps every two, and our senators every six. So every two years, party control of the House and Senate is up for grabs, meaning it can flip in the middle of a president's four-year term. With all of these representatives and senators up for election, there's no shortage of campaign ads, which leads us to this question. Can politicians lie in their ads? Our Brandon Lewis looks into what can be said. Midterm election season is here, and that means there will be political ads everywhere you look. And some of those ads will inevitably make outlandish claims. Some Verify viewers emailed us to ask if candidate ads have to tell the truth. So let's verify. Are political ads required to be factual in order to be aired on broadcast television? Our sources are the Federal Communications Commission, the Federal Trade Commission, and University of Minnesota political science professor David Schultz. The rules for political ads are very different than typical consumer products. And we want to be clear up front that the answer to this question is no. Political ads are not required to be factual in order to be aired on broadcast television. In fact, the law allows politicians to say almost whatever they want in a commercial. This is because political ads are regulated by the FCC, which applies just two rules. One is that all candidates have the same opportunity to buy commercial time on stations. And two is that politicians can say whatever they want. Accuracy is not one of the rules. Although, TV stations could run a disclaimer explaining the rules before airing an ad. The only consequence for politicians who produce misleading or false ads is in court. And that's only if they defame someone, which is rare and hard to prove. I think the rationale behind it is what? The idea of saying that candidates get to say what they want and what the voters get to sort of through the marketplace of ideas decide what's true, what's false. That marketplace could also include news stories or fact checks like verify stories explaining what's true and false. 
Show says you should always read the fine print on an ad to see who is funding it and do your own research on a candidate to see if what's being claimed is really true. With your Verify, I'm Brandon Lewis. When you watch TV, you may have seen more ads for one candidate over another, which leads us to this next question. Does the law require TV stations to air an equal amount of ads for every candidate? And what about the use of popular music? Are campaign commercials allowed to use them? Casey Decker has the answers. We're in the heat of midterm election season, which means you're probably seeing campaign ads everywhere. One of our viewers, Teresa, had a question about music used in those commercials. Do candidates always need to get permission from musical artists to use their songs in ads? Teresa, let's verify. Our sources are the American Society of Composers, Authors and Publishers, or ASCAP, and Daniel Schacht, a musical law attorney. In the U.S., music is protected by copyright. If you want to use a song in an ad, you need to get a license. And just like the Grammys have separate awards for the songwriting process and the performance piece of that song, music licenses are similar. There's the copyright to the recording itself. Whoever performed the recording or the record label will own that specific recording. And then whoever wrote the music, there's a comp composition copyright. So the songwriters will typically own that. Fights and delivers for our district. To use music in a campaign ad or any other video, you've got to get both licenses. ASCAP says to get them, campaigns have to reach out to whoever holds the rights for individual songs. So who is that? Well, it depends. Some musicians hold all their rights. Some share them with labels or co-writers. Others have sold their rights away entirely. If the artist still owns their rights, then yes, a campaign would need their approval to use a song. If they don't own them, it's up to whoever does. So although many artists have a say in who can get to use their music, we can verify, no, candidates don't always need permission from musicians to use their songs in ads. They only need to obtain a license, which can be controlled by anyone, although it is often the artist. With your Verify, I'm Casey Decker. Millions of people will mail in their ballots for the election, and for many of them, it means figuring out how much postage to use. Brandon has more on what happens if you don't use enough stamps on your absentee ballot, as well as what you need to know when it comes to counting those ballots. Every state offers absentee ballots, which allow you to vote by mail, either with or without an excuse, depending on where you live. But according to vote.org, one claim that it hears all too often is that absentee ballots are only counted in tight races. So let's verify using these sources. All election officials are required to count every eligible ballot, according to the Federal Voting Assistance Program, regardless of whether you vote in person or absentee. The U.S. Vote Foundation says some of the misconceptions stem from when races are called early for a candidate. This happens when it's not mathematically possible for their opponent to win. So even if you know the result, those absentee ballots are still counted in the final tally. Plus, there are many races on a single ballot. So just because one is a slam dunk for a candidate doesn't mean that's the case for another. So no, absentee ballots are not only counted in close races. Let's be honest, we've all guessed a time or two about how heavy something is before putting it in the mail and hoped it wouldn't come back for having insufficient postage. But you probably wouldn't want to take a chance with your ballot. Some people are worried about how much postage to use, if it's needed at all, and what happens if they guess wrong. So let's verify. Will the Postal Service deliver ballots if they don't have enough postage? Our sources are the U.S. Postal Service and the National Conference of State Legislatures. In 19 states and D.C., no postage is required to mail in a ballot. If you live elsewhere, it depends on your election officials, and you may be responsible for the postage. Many ballots need just a single first-class stamp, but if there's a lot on the ballot making it extra bulky, then you'll likely need a second stamp if it weighs more than an ounce. But it's not the end of the world if you miscalculate the postage your ballot needs. The USPS says they'll still deliver it because ballots get special handling over regular mail. So, yes, the Postal Service will deliver ballots if they don't have enough postage. But election officials and your tax dollars might foot the bill for the missing stamps. And if you really don't want to pay for postage, many places have drop boxes that you can use for free. With your Verify, I'm Brandon Lewis. As candidates look to find an edge any way that they can, one of our viewers asked if they're allowed to pay notable people to endorse them. Casey has the answer. 
As candidates make their final push before the midterm elections, you may start seeing more of them touting endorsements from celebrities or notable organizations. That led Verify viewer Jack to wonder whether politicians might simply be paying those folks to endorse them. So let's verify. Is it legal for political candidates to pay for endorsements? Our sources are the Federal Election Commission and the Federal Election Campaign Act. According to the FEC, there is no law banning candidates from paying for endorsements. A spokesperson told Verify, quote, no provisions in the FEC rules specifically address paid endorsements of federal candidates. But candidates are legally required to disclose such payments. The Federal Election Campaign Act requires campaigns for federal office to file regular reports on where their money comes from and where it goes. That report has to include the name and address of any person to whom an expenditure in excess of $200 is made, together with the date, amount, and purpose of such expenditure. So paying for an endorsement isn't illegal, but trying to hide that payment could get you in trouble. A notable example, a former Iowa State Senator named Kent Sorensen. According to court records in 2012, he took money in exchange for endorsements for Republican candidates for president. He was charged with willfully causing false expenditure reports and obstruction of justice. He pleaded guilty and received a 15-month prison sentence. But it was for the cover-up, not the payments themselves. So we can verify, yes, it is legal for federal candidates to pay for endorsements but they are legally required to disclose those payments. With your Verify, I'm Casey Decker. Candidates often seek endorsements to bolster their campaigns, but a viral tweet claims churches can endorse politicians. Brandon looks into whether this is really the case. In some ways, churches have one of the best deals on federal taxes. They neither have to pay them nor file annual paperwork. But a tweet with 10,000 likes claims they can lose their tax-exempt status by backing a political candidate. So let's verify. Can the IRS revoke the tax-exempt status of churches that endorse candidates? Our sources are the IRS, the Johnson Amendment of 1954, Clergy Financial Resources, the United Church of Christ, the California Catholic Conference, and Grace Communion International. In 1954, Congress passed the Johnson Amendment, which prohibits churches, charities, and most other tax-exempt organizations from endorsing candidates. If they do, then they risk losing their tax-exempt status. The IRS says generally these organizations can't show preference for a candidate, but a leader can, if it's clear they're speaking as an individual. This means they can't use official titles or church resources like the pulpit, newsletter, or website to make their endorsement. Our sources note politicians can speak to congregants, but all candidates must be given the same opportunity. So, yes, the IRS can revoke the tax-exempt status of churches that endorse candidates, although it's a lengthy process, and the only time the IRS successfully revoked a church's tax-exempt status was in 1992, when Branch Ministries sponsored newspaper ads urging Christians not to vote for Bill Clinton. The United Church of Christ and the IRS note under the rules Churches are allowed to take positions on public policy issues such as abortion or immigration without endorsing specific candidates. With your Verify, I'm Brandon Lewis. The national average price for a gallon of gas right now is about $3.76, down from record averages above $5 in June. With the midterm elections closing in, some people have asked whether the drop has anything to do with the impending election. Casey examined the data. Gas prices are continuing to drop from their record highs earlier this year. But this Facebook comment suggests the reason for that drop is political manipulation designed to give the party in power a boost ahead of the midterms. Other posts on social media have echoed that sentiment, suggesting gas prices go down before elections and then rise again after. So is there any validity to those claims? Do gas prices always go down before elections? To verify, we looked at historical data from the U.S. Energy Information Administration and Bureau of Labor Statistics and spoke with Ed Hers, an energy economics fellow at the University of Houston. The EIA has weekly data on gas prices going back to 1993. We isolated the periods before midterm and presidential elections, focusing on data from September through the first week of November. In eight of the 14 years, gas prices declined, but in the other six years, prices rose. 
the BLS has monthly data going back to 1976. And though it's not as precise, it can still give us a broad look at trends. Of the 23 election cycles in that span, gas prices decreased in 15 and increased in eight. Energy economist Ed Herr says gas prices can sometimes dip in the fall as refiners move away from the more expensive formulations that are used in the summer. But it has little to do with politics. We go to a less expensive formulation for winter gasoline. Second, uh, there's less demand in the winter time. You know, give or take driving to school, you're not driving to vacation. Uh, and so for a couple of reasons, you might see some sort of dip in the, in the winter time. And most elections, of course, occur in November. He says other big factors lowering prices right now include below normal demand from China due to COVID restrictions and Russia's ability to export more of its oil than expected despite sanctions increasing supply. The president also has the ability to increase supply somewhat by releasing oil from the strategic reserve. Biden has done that, but gas prices are affected by so many other factors that that doesn't guarantee lower prices, let alone a drop timed for election day. The president is at the mercy of the market. So we can verify, no, gas prices do not always go down before elections. And if they do, it's the result of a wide variety of market factors. With your Verify, I'm Casey Decker. Whether you're voting early, absentee, or in person on election day, just don't forget to go out and vote. And now, if there's something else that you want us to verify, you can just reach out to us on Twitter at Verify This or go to our website, verifythis.com. Thank you so much for tuning into our election special. I'm your host, Ariande Till. For more episodes of Verify This, go to our video on demand. Click shows at the top of your screen and there you'll find past episodes of Verify This, plus other shows on demand. Hello everybody, I'm Stephanie Haney and thank you for being here for this special election 2022 edition of Legally Speaking. This midterm election is shaping up to be a close one in the U.S. House and the Senate and we're all watching to see where the balance of power shifts. Will it switch to the Republicans? Will it end up more strongly in favor of the Democrats, who right now control both houses of Congress and the presidency? Only time will tell for sure, but here's a breakdown of what usually happens in a midterm election and which races are most likely to decide the outcome this year. Midterm elections get that name because they're considered to sort of check in on how the president is doing in the middle of a four year term. And there is a lot at stake right now for Democrats since they control the presidency, the House of Representatives and the Senate. Although you wouldn't know it by the amount of legislation they've been able to pass. That's because control in the Senate is so narrow. It's actually split 50 50 and the Democrats only have control by virtue of Vice President Kamala Harris's tie breaking vote. And that is not enough of a margin to overcome the filibuster rule, which requires 60 votes to end debate before legislation can move to a final vote. That's the issue Democrats have been dealing with for two years. But now there are 35 seats up for election in the Senate and all 435 are on the ballot in the House. And depending on how these elections go, the parties in power could change. There are really six major elections to watch in the Senate that it could impact who holds power for the rest of President Joe Biden's term. Those races are in Georgia between Raphael Warnock and Herschel Walker, Pennsylvania between John Fetterman and Dr. Mehmet Oz, Nevada between Catherine Cortez Masto and Adam Laxalt, Arizona between Mark Kelly and Blake Masters, Ohio between Tim Ryan and J.D. Vance, and Wisconsin between Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes and Ron Johnson. There'll be hard fought battles between the candidates you hear and potentially making for a long election night for each of their campaigns. In the House, where the margin is larger for Democrats, it's actually more likely power flips to Republicans. Going into this election, Democrats hold 220 seats and Republicans hold 212, with three vacancies where one person passed away and two people have resigned. So the Democrats have the majority by eight seats. Now, it's sort of a general rule that whichever party doesn't hold the presidency will pick up seats in the House in the midterm elections. And it's usually a lot, like 26 seats a lot. That's been the average gain since the end of World War II. So that's why right now political polling site Project 538 predicts Republicans have a four in five chance or an 80% shot of taking control of the House. 
The Cook Political Report rates 33 seats as toss-ups that could go either way. The districts you see listed right here. 23 of those are currently held by Democrats and 10 are held by Republicans. And those will most likely be the ones that decide how power shifts in the House. So just six races in the Senate and 33 in the House could be the deciding factors in what the rest of President Joe Biden's term looks like. Control of the Senate is particularly important for things like federal judge appointments. We saw that this summer in how important the makeup of a court can be when the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, sending the issue of abortion rights to the states to decide. And because of that, abortion is on the ballot in this election. Here's where it's being voted on and what those votes mean for the future of abortion rights. After the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in June that abortion is not a constitutionally protected right and sent the issue to states to decide, moves were made around the country. Trigger laws went into effect in 13 states, banning abortion almost entirely in most cases, as early as six weeks after conception when many people don't even know they're pregnant yet. Now, in response to these things, Abortion is literally on the ballot in five states, and it's already been directly voted on in another one. In August, voters in Kansas overwhelmingly rejected a change to their state constitution that would have plainly said it does not protect the right to abortion. In this election, a similar amendment will be voted on in Kentucky. Right now, Kentucky has a near total abortion ban in effect. It's being challenged by the only abortion provider in the state, but it's still in effect until that court case is decided. Whether the amendment passes or fails, abortion access will still depend on how the court case comes out. And in the meantime, abortion is effectively banned in Kentucky. If voters don't pass the amendment, it could pave the way for the state's highest court to invalidate that ban. In Montana, voters will decide on a different abortion question. The issue on the ballot is whether to require medical treatment specifically for infants born alive after an attempted abortion. Montana's former Democratic governor vetoed a similar bill in 2019. Medical professionals opposed to this issue argue that it's not necessary and that the scenario of a baby being born alive after an attempted abortion is incredibly rare. Regardless, in Montana, abortion is legal before viability, which is generally about 24 to 26 weeks after conception. In Michigan, we're seeing a voter-initiated ballot measure that would change the state's constitution to guarantee abortion rights. Its supporters needed 425,000 signatures to get it on the ballot, and they collected 750,000. Now, there hasn't been a voter-led issue like this on ballots in decades, and this one is particularly important because Michigan still has an abortion ban from 1931 on the books. It came back into effect with the Supreme Court's overturning of Roe versus Wade, but then the ban got put on hold while it's being challenged in court. So if voters pass this constitutional amendment in Michigan, it means abortion rights are protected and that ban goes away. And if voters reject this amendment, the status quo continues until the court case on the abortion ban is settled. And in both California and Vermont, voters will decide on constitutional amendments that would establish a right to abortion in their states. Now, abortion is still legal in both of those places, and even if the amendments fail, that's not going to change. But they are expected to pass easily in both places. Even so, abortion rights supporters say they need to act now to make sure that remains the reality. No matter where you live, there are lots of important things on the ballot in election 2022. And in almost half of the states, there have been laws passed in the past two years that make it harder to vote. But voting is your right as a U.S. citizen. So here's what you need to know to be prepared in case that right is challenged by anyone on Election Day. When it comes to making sure your vote counts on Election Day, it's important to know your rights. Since the beginning of 2021, 21 states have enacted 42 laws that make it harder to vote, like cutting back on early voting, adding requirements to register and stay registered, and making it tougher to vote for people who show up to the wrong precinct. That's not even counting laws like the one stopping people from handing out food and drinks to voters waiting in line to cast their ballots. Now, we can't control that kind of voter suppression in the short term, but legally speaking, on election day, no one can try to stop you from voting. Let's break down how to set yourself up for success, what's not okay, and what you can do if someone does try to interfere with your right to vote. Vote.org is an incredible resource where you can check your voter registration status, 
Find your polling place and confirm what kind of identification you need to have with you in your state, all before heading out to cast your vote. If for some reason you get to your polling place and an election official tells you that you aren't eligible or you don't have the required ID, then you can request to vote on a provisional ballot. Now this should be a last resort, but if your only option is to vote provisionally, make sure you call your county board of elections as soon as possible and ask if you need to provide any additional information, like proof of ID, to make sure your vote is counted. Remember, as long as you're in line before polling places close in your state, you have to be allowed to vote. Stay in line though, because if you leave the line, you may not be allowed back in. And it's never okay for anyone to try to intimidate, coerce, or threaten you while you're trying to cast your ballot. If you experience issues while trying to vote on election day, you can call or text Election Protection, a national nonpartisan group that defends voting rights at 1-866-OUR-VOTE. That's 1-866-687-8683 for help in English. They also have lines for people who speak Spanish, Arabic, and Asian languages. Their volunteers can help you get past any barrier to making your voice heard. I cannot stress enough what a great resource vote.org is and how helpful election protection can be if you do find yourself in a situation where someone is trying to mess with your right to vote. Now that we have a broad overview of what's at stake in these midterm elections, let's end on a lighter note. Let's take a look at why Election Day is always in the first part of November. Have you ever wondered why Election Day is always on a Tuesday in early November? Legally speaking, now it's because there's a federal law that requires it. It's Chapter 2 of the U.S. Code, Section 7, and it guarantees that Election Day for federal offices falls between November 2nd and November 8th, depending on the calendar, in even-numbered years. That happened in the late 1800s, partly to streamline voting around the country and stop elections held at different times in different places from influencing each other based on their results. But why a Tuesday? And why in November? The answer isn't based on any complicated legal idea. It's based on religion and farming. In the 1800s, most Americans were farmers, and holding elections in November didn't interfere with their autumn harvests. It also avoided making people travel in winter in the bitter cold. Speaking of travel, a lot of these farmers lived far away from their polling places. That meant most people had to travel at least a day to cast their votes. Making it a Tuesday rather than a Monday avoided religious complications for people who didn't travel on Sundays, the holy day of rest for most Christians. And it was also important back then to make sure election day never fell on the first day of the month, even if that was a Tuesday, because the first of the month was an important bookkeeping day. That's when merchants balance their books from the previous month. Now, there's never been a federal law in the books about when elections have to be held for state and local offices and issues, but most places stick to using the federal election date because it's just easier. And that's why, all these years later, Good evening and thank you for joining us and choosing Local 5 for your midterm election coverage. We uh, had the polls close here in Iowa about a half hour ago at 8 o'clock and we're starting to get some of those numbers rolling in now. And a bit of a surprise and early projection here. Um, this is the governor's race. And as you can see up in the corner there, only 1% of precincts are reporting at this point. But as you can see the check mark there on uh, Governor Reynolds, uh, the AP has already projected a win there uh, for Governor Reynolds. And again, we want to be very cautious with this because only 1% of precincts are reporting right now, but Kim Reynolds uh, apparently uh, holding the lead there at 57% at this point. We're moving on to U.S. Senate now, still 1% of precincts reporting. Uh, we got a tie here in this one. This is uh, incumbent Senator Chuck Grassley here looking for an eighth term with 50% of the vote, following very closely behind right now his challenger, a retired Admiral Michael Franken at 50% of the vote again early numbers here, 1% of precincts reporting. Moving on now to the U.S. House District 3. This is another race here that uh, is being closely watched, not only in Iowa, but across the country. And we have 0% of precincts reporting in this one. Nothing to report between, uh, between Cindy Axney and Zach Nunn right now. And U.S. House District 1, Marionette Miller-Meeks holding a lead right now at 58% of the vote to Christina Bohannon's 42%. Early numbers here as well, 1% of precincts reporting. 
All right, now in House District 2, we have Liz Mathis and Ashley Hinson. Uh, early again in, in these numbers, Liz Mathis at 0% of precincts reporting, so obviously not correct on that number, but we're, we're early here. Liz Mathis with 60% of the votes in. And uh, we're back to U.S. House District 3 here. Uh, still no results in this one to report to you, so we're still waiting on numbers for that one. All right, now in U.S. House District 4, uh, Randy Feenstra holding a lead right now with 51% of the votes to Ryan Melton at 47% and Brian Holder uh, there with 2% of the votes. And we're joined with our political analysts now. A lot to follow there. What's your big takeaways right now? Craig, let's start with My you. big takeaway right now is there's some very, very close legislative races in Polk County. Ankeny, uh, Altoona, all those areas. We're talking there's a couple precincts still out. Really, really, really tight races. And what do you take away from this right now? Well, I think there's a lot to yet be seen as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think the indications on the governor's race uh, kind of demonstrate overarchingly that there's some work to do for Democrats. And so um, as that goes on, we'll see how they kind of make up some ground. But I think it's going to be really interesting to see how things play out. Is this anywhere near what you were expecting? <laughs> I'm, I'm a little I'm a little surprised mm -hmm. at, at these, uh, especially I live in Ankeny. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm surprised at what I'm seeing in Ankeny right now. These are um, these are very, very close. They're going to come down to, you know, a few votes here and there are going to decide winners and losers. So what do you think voters are looking for? What's drawing them to the polls? Well, I, I think to your point, Craig, I think that first of all, there was some focus for Democrats on that area, right, in the mm -hmm. Des Moines metro area. And so I'm not surprised by that. And I think uh, Democrats in the Des Moines uh, metro area, they're going to turn out, right? There's a lot of money that's been spent there to get them to turn out and make these things close. Um, for me, though, it's across the state. All 99 counties is what I'm looking for. How have Democrats invested out in western Iowa? Mm -hmm. And with that, you're tracking across the nation as well. Has there been any surprises that you're seeing in other states? Um, I think the big surprise for me is just how red Florida seems. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, we grew up in an er era where that was <clears throat> Razor close and, and always a battleground state and to see it turn as red as it looks tonight is kind of stunning. And we do have a lot to unpack as the evening continues, so be sure to stay with us. We are unpacking key issues, the economy, abortion rights, gun rights, mm -hmm. um, other things, you know, we haven't even gotten into yet. We've been talking a lot in between these shows. This is a hugely pivotal yeah, midterm. Definitely so. Well, I think you, you talk to some of those variables, which is why Florida is so interesting. I think about Marco Rubio and Val Demings, right? She's a former law enforcement um, currently elected and so having the infrastructure built all those things that we know have been partisan dividers she had all those in her favor and so to still see that spread of, of 15 points at the time i think it's shrunk a little bit then is really is really interesting to see all right send us stephanie for sticking with us here on the web and on the app. We are happy to see you tonight and we're starting to get some early numbers in and we've got some surprising numbers that we're seeing and some early projections too. So we're going to get into all of that, but we want to remain cautious as we give you these numbers because as we learned earlier this week from Secretary of State Paul Pate, uh, these numbers could take a while to not only tally, but then to certify. Take a listen. So if it's close, I would encourage voters to just be patient and allow us to do what we're supposed to do because we have pre-checks we have to do. We have to review these votes to make sure everything has been counted accurately and we have to do post-election audits. All these things we're doing are imperative so I can say this is the candidate who won. Uh, I know that's frustrating because when you're, you're watching the news uh, uh, the night of election night and you hear some of these early results and then you go to bed the next morning if something moved on your candidate, you're frustrated. You're going, well, what happened? So we're going to be real careful about how we put the numbers out and we're going to put some asterisks yeah. on these and saying this one's still close. We need some time. Please be patient. Yeah, and to speak to that a little bit about some of those results that uh, may be early numbers, we've seen some of those tonight. We want to get you into some of those results that we have coming in at this point. And uh, the governor's race right now was a little bit of a shock to our newsroom because with only 1% of precincts reporting at this time, Governor Kim Reynolds is the projected winner. The AP is projecting this. And again, this is not certified. These are not official end results. But the AP is projecting a win for Governor Reynolds tonight. At, and at 1% of precincts reporting, she is holding a lead. 
agreed with 53% of the votes there. Let's move on to U.S. Senate now still 1% uh, precincts reporting here. A close race between uh, incumbent Senator Chuck Grassley and Democrat Michael Franken. Uh, Grassley holding a slight lead there with 51% of the votes to Michael Franken's 49%. And we're going to move into Secretary of State now. A little more reporting here with 5% of precincts in. We have Joel Miller uh, taking a lead right now. 54% over incumbent Paul Pate at 46%, who you, of course, just heard from. Uh, moving into Auditor now, we have Rob Sand holding a sizable lead with 66% of the votes to Todd Halber's 34%. Again, early numbers in with 5% of precincts reporting. Treasurer now, uh, Michael Fitzgerald, 65% to Robbie Smith's 35% and early numbers in this as well. Uh, we are an Ag Secretary right now, or the Agriculture Secretary, 5% of precincts reporting. We have John Norwood holding a lead of 55% of the vote over incumbent Mike Nag with 45% of the vote. And in Attorney General, we have Tom Miller here um, over Brenna Byrd, uh, the Republican challenger. She is lagging behind 35% right now to Tom Miller's 65% of the vote. And turning now to our analysts again, what do these numbers tell you? Well, you got to understand the big thing to know right now is where are these votes coming from? Mm -hmm. This is Polk County, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, a lot of Polk County votes are already in. And, and what matters is the margin. The reason they've called the governor's race is because the margin is only about 25,000 votes sure. that DeGere is leading Reynolds. That won't stand up statewide. But in these other races, in, the, in these other statewide races, you know, if it's a 30, 40,000 vote margin, it matters here statewide because it's gonna take a lot of rural counties to cut into that. So what, what we really want to end up knowing is what what's the final margin out of Polk County exactly and then is there enough out there to, to cut back into it some of these people have a pretty a pretty nice lead coming out of Polk County but we're gonna see these watch these numbers narrow as we go later into the night and do you have anything to add in well, addition? Well, definitely. <laughs> I think the early vote, vote totals we saw kind of shrink pretty quick pretty quickly mm -hmm. and so as the night goes on we'll, we'll really get a better idea of um, how voters are, do, are voting across the state in all 99 counties. Um, but the, the governor's race is, is interesting to me that it's called so early. I'm interested to see what that final margin looks like. And speak to the importance of the midterms for those who may not know how influential, how pivotal this election is. Well, you know, the, mid, the midterms, you know, it's all based on the, the president mm -hmm. and who's in power. And usually the off, the party not in power makes gains. The interesting thing about this midterm election nationally is that Congress was already very evenly split, so it doesn't take a big swing for Republicans to, to win back. So normally you would see a big swing like 40 seats in the House. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're gonna see that because, because Republicans are only short six seats in, in the U.S. House. But you might see 20 or 25 or 30 seat swing and it, it's still kind of a, a wave type election that you would expect in a midterm. But the other thing you have to remember is that what is going on nationally doesn't always equate to what happens here locally. Okay. Um, it, all politics is local, yeah. and, and these local legislative races, they have a different flavor um, than the national stuff. Yeah, and I think that's what Iowans are most closely paying attention to, what's happening here in Iowa. Um, but on a national level, this midterm is going to be a great uh, database, right, for folks sure. going into the, the 2024 election to really figure out what happened, do yeah. that deep dive, be self-reflective, um, and then set the campaigns off with a lot of new information. And we do have more deep dive coming up. We're going to send it back over to Stephanie. And this is why we have analysts here. They can make sense of these numbers for us. We really appreciate that. Uh, we want to take you to uh, the U.S. House, the various districts in that. Right now we are getting more results there. Uh, in District 1 with 1% of precincts reporting, we have Marionette Miller-Meeks holding a lead there with 51% of the vote to Christina Bohannon at 49%. And moving into District 2 now, uh, Liz Mathis with 59% of the vote to Ashley Hinson's 41% at this point. Again, early numbers. And then the, the one that a lot of people are watching here, U.S. House District 3. This has been an interesting one for sure. Again, it says 0% of precincts are reporting, but we do have some uh, numbers to show you here with Zach Nunn holding a lead at this point with 58% of the vote to Cindy Axney, the incumbent there, 42% uh, of the vote. 
And in District 4 now, we have Randy Feenstra holding on to a lead with 54% of the vote over Ryan Melton at 44%. Uh, Brian Holder trailing with 2% of the vote at this moment. All right, in U.S. Senate here, we have 6% of precincts reporting now, and we have Michael Franken holding a lead, 59% uh, of the vote over incumbent Chuck Grassley at his 41%, of course, Chuck Grassley, uh, running for his eighth term in the U.S. Senate. I was longest serving U.S. Senator. Uh, in the governor race right now, we, we do have 6% of precincts reporting, and as you're seeing there, the number is saying Deirdre Dejir has pulled ahead, but as we just heard from our analysts, there is good reason uh, for the AP to have already projected Governor Kim Reynolds as the winner of this race, even though these numbers are telling a different story. Uh, what they are seeing with where, where the votes have been counted, uh, the AP is confident in predicting this one for Governor Kim Reynolds. And, and again, this is why we have our analysts here to make sense of, of these numbers that seem to just fluctuate throughout the night. Any surprises here? I think one of the things we might be starting to unpack here is that this is a suburban voter thing, and so maybe the issue of abortion here is is plain. I, Polk County is, is seems to be really strong for Democrats tonight um, across the board, and so maybe that's an issue that really played, and and Democrats were really able to channel that with early vote and just general turnout. So I mean. Their ads focused on that, and, and so we're seeing that maybe that strategy was the right one for them. Well, concentrated resources, right? Yeah. Yes. I mean, you, you, you target your, the races that you think are winnable, you invest heavily there, but I think that also means that we have to be mindful to see what that means down the road. Mm -hmm. What races haven't been invested? Sure. Where, where are things close, um, closer than they should be? And I think the Senate, the U.S. Senate race is the one that I'm going to be watching really closely. Uh, Mike Franken was never the D.C. candidate. I think that's helped him to make sure the thing is going to be close, but this race is going to be close down to the wire, I think. Talk about redistricting and how that's had an effect on how this is all shaping up. Yeah, th this, is, this is all new. Yeah. I mean, I, we get used to doing this every two years, but all of these districts are new, and so we've never seen them actually perform. And so you can, you can look at voter registration and make some, make some calculations on what you think is going to happen, but until you actually see raw votes and you see turnout numbers, um, you don't know. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I think, you know, so we're all kind of walking into this one a little bit more blind than we will two years from now when we'll have actual result data to look back and yeah. see how these counties perform, see how uh, congressional districts, house districts perform. We talked about briefly about Gen Z voters. Yes. Speak a little bit to that demographic and the trends that you're seeing with that group. Yeah, I think we're seeing that voters are going to be more a la carte, right? They're going to make sure that they, they vote for people who align with them on their issues and they may leave other parts of the ballot blank. Hmm. And so for any candidate out there, make sure that you're speaking directly to people, uh, speaking to the people's issues, because that's going to be really indicative as to how they will turn out. And so as, as results come in, throughout the night, I think we're going to look and see why Polk County is performing a certain way and maybe parts of Western Iowa aren't. And what is mm -hmm. the demographics there? What does the youth vote look like? And so that's kind of the forensic analysis that happens afterwards. Yeah. But it's going to be really interesting to see how young people play into this election. So much to unpack. It's going to be a fast moving night. Stephanie. All right, Samantha, thank you very much. Yeah, we want to get into more uh, that you may have seen on your ballot today, and especially if you flipped the ballot over to the back. Uh, there was a constitutional amendment there. We have a summary of it here on your screen. Basically, here's what it says. Provides that the right of the people of Iowa to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The sovereign state of Iowa affirms and recognizes the right to keep and bear arms as a fundamental right. Any and all restrictions of this right shall be subject to strict scrutiny scrutiny. So here's how people were voting on that so far. Right now it is, I believe, 60% in the yes column. The screen is kind of cutting off there. Uh, and 40%, yes, it is 60% yes, 40% uh, no to that right now. So again, that was on the back side of your ballot there. And we want to go back to our to our analysts about this because obviously this is a protection to the right to bear arms. But what does this mean now? Yeah, let's weigh in on that. Sure. Uh, number one, this is kind of what the Des Moines Register polling showed mm -hmm. when they tested this on, on their poll, that it was kind of a 60-40 uh, issue. Um, it really doesn't mean a ton in terms of, it, it doesn't change any gun laws. It doesn't, it, it doesn't add anything that's not currently there. And so um, it's a statement more than anything of of protecting gun rights in Iowa and that it's in the Constitution so that which it, it what it does is make it difficult for a legislature to come in and and 
weaken those gun rights. Well, so. I, I, I think it, it's more about what it signals for the courts to do, right? Mm -hmm. Strict scrutiny is a level of judgment, and it is the highest level that the Supreme Court has to look at any legislation with. And so um, I, I, it, I think it has some significant changes. It means that in the state of Iowa, if we want to have any uh, gun control measures whatsoever, then the court is to look at those with strict scrutiny. And that's a level uh, of scrutiny that almost no other legislation will be facing. And so if you want to change a gun law in the state of Iowa, it's going to be really, really tough if this amendment passes. And so I think we have to be mindful of that and what that means uh, going forward with any gun control measure. And do you think this is going to continue to be a divisive issue? I, look, I, I think in the, in the world that we live in, I think guns are always going to be in gun violence. It's so, I mean, there's so much of it and we, uh, I, I just don't think it ever goes away. Okay. Yeah. And I, I, it's, I don't. It's, it's difficult, right? It's, it's a divisive issue because of a lack of information as well. Mm -hmm. Strict scrutiny is really, really hard to talk about. You can go to U of I, be a law professor <laughs> and debate what strict scrutiny means. And I was in the legislature when that happens. And so I think that it's going to be really difficult for the average Iowan to really understand what that means for their rights when it comes to their ability to bear arms or control who can carry a firearm and where. Yeah, I think just the fact that we're having this conversation is helpful to move mm -hmm. through because as we've been talking, it's politics have become so divisive. People have not been able to have, you know, intelligent conversation about yes. take a step back. What does it all mean? And there's a lot to unpack tonight. I mean, go back to some of the issues that you think we will go back to some of the issues that you think um, is what's driving Iowans to the polls. In the meantime, let's get back to Steph. All right. Yeah, like you said, a lot to unpack. Samantha, thank you very much. We want to get into some of the uh, state races that we are getting numbers in. Those have been a little bit slower to come in tonight, but in state Senate District 17, this is an interesting one. You have three candidates, as you can see there. No Republicans in this race, uh, but and this one covers uh, it's Des Moines, part of Birdland, or Birdland uh, parts of Beaverdale and the East Village. So with this district, we have 23% of precincts reporting. We have Isaiah Knox uh, with a, a very big lead. Right now, 82% of the votes. Uh, Toya Johnson at 10%, and Alejandro Murguia Ortiz uh, following behind there. In State Senate District 21, 65% of precincts reporting on this one. We have Todd Brady at 52%, Mike Busala at 48%, again, 65% reporting there. All right, State Senate District 23, we have Jack Whitfer in the lead right now, 54% of the votes to Matt Priest at 46%. And again, that, pre that uh, has 28% of precincts reporting in State Senate District 23. We're just taking a moment here. Okay, we are going to State House District 30 now. We have Megan Srinivas. She is a physician, 67% of the vote right now with 60% of precincts reporting. A big lead over uh, her opponent, Jerry Cheevers, with 33% of the vote. And that again is the State House District 30. All right, let's go back to this governor race here. We have 6% of precincts reporting early in this one, but it has already been called by the AP for Governor Kim Reynolds. Uh, at this point, she is trailing behind Deidre DeGere's 55% of the vote. Uh, governor Reynolds has 43% in right now. Uh, Rick Stewart, the uh, libertarian candidate, just 2%. We have talked about this, though, with our analysts, why those numbers may be deceiving and why the AP has projected a win for Governor Reynolds there. Uh, and in U.S. Senate right now, 6% of precincts Precincts reporting. Michael Franken holding a pretty sizable lead right now, 59% over Chuck Grassley's 41%, and also talking about which, where these votes are coming from, why we may be seeing some of these numbers right now. And for folks that are just joining us, just break this all down. What does this tell you when you see these numbers? Yeah, I, I, I think for me, it's it's er, where do the votes come from first, mm -hmm. right? And, and we've talked about that. It's a lot of Polk County and uh, um, you know, it's still a long night. Mm -hmm. I mean, you yeah. see, you see big leads, and I think you know these people will be able to claw into those and to make those. And in some cases, I would imagine the governor's numbers will flip. Mm -hmm. You know, where um, Deidre will will be at 41 and Kim will be at you know in the 50s. So um, we got a long ways to go on yes. some of those. But knowing and even the Grassley race, that margin is mostly Polk County. Sure. Um, and so what to look at for Franken? is the other counties where he can he can get a margin. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Lynn County, Blackhawk County, uh, Dubuque, you know, is he able to build big enough uh, uh, leads in those counties that he can sustain 
what Grassley's probably going to do in rural Iowa. Sure. And with so much at stake in this election, we have huge things, inflation, rising interest rates, abortion rights, gun rights. It is um, so many very divisive issues and people are stressed financially right now. Our economy is struggling. Um, speak more to what is bringing Iowans to the polls in some really big numbers. I think hope for a, a better future for Iowa. Mm -hmm. I, I think people are making informed decisions when they fill in that bubble on the ballot box. Now they're looking at who's investing in the future, who's standing up for our school districts. What does it look like to tackle inflation, not just talk about it? And so uh, as, as Iowans have been listening to the candidates, I, I think uniquely in a place like Iowa, uh, we're trained, right, to kind of filter through that and have that lens. And so as they're listening to candidates and making those decisions, they're, they're talking to people who are, or they're supporting people who are focused on tackling inflation, not just talking about it. Uh, folks who are defending our public school system, but also they're making sure that they're talking to candidates who've been willing to put themselves in uncomfortable situations. And I think that's why we're seeing Franklin. Mm -hmm. Franklin's lead is that he's been to places where Democrats haven't been in a long time. He's never been that DC branded candidate, which I think gives him a leg up on other Democrats running statewide because he doesn't have that DC support, which many Iowans don't love. Sure. We thank you both so much for breaking this down as we go step by step. Stephanie. Yeah, Samantha, thank you so much. And we do want to get into some of those state house races now. Again, those are taking shape. And this one is a very interesting race. Uh, right now with 50% of precincts reporting, we have Molly Buck in State House District 41 with a lead of 53% over Marvis Landon's 47%. But what makes this interesting is this seat was once held by Landon's late husband, John Landon, uh, who died and then it was taken over by Mike Busalot, who is now running for State Senate. So we have uh, Marvis Landon there running for the very seat that her husband once held. Um, so. All, all of these races seem to have interesting stories, but this is one of those that really, you know, it's, it's Iowa politics. That's the best way to say it, <laughs> Iowa politics, right? Yeah, yeah. What's your, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I think that, you know, what's happening right now is there's three precincts out in, in Ankeny, two in the Landon District and one in the Garrett Gobble race, and those two districts make up the Mike Buslo race. All three of those races are what happens in these last precincts matter. Uh, Landon's down about 400 votes. Uh, she, she needs to hope that those pre two precincts that are out are Republican areas uh, where she can get her margin. Yes. Um, but this is gonna be real close. I think Buslo is up a little bit, um, but Gobble and, and uh, Landon need to hope that these remaining precincts um, are Republican precincts if they want to win. Sure. Well, definitely, so I, I think, you know, carrying on just name recognition in itself mm -hmm. and during that special election, mm -hmm. right, after the passing of Representative Landon, who I had the, the privilege to serve with, mm -hmm. um, I think that kind of threw things a little bit off kilter, right? You, you had to build a campaign for a special election, um, which did not allow you to have a, a candidate to kind of step in and start building that name recognition and that voter base differently yeah. um, at a time when I'm sure she and her family were grieving as well. And so right. there's a lot of different variables that go into play in this race, but Ankeny's always been an interesting area for Iowa politics. And, and, yeah, you know, that's going to be. It, it, it's interesting too, where you know, I, I would love to see exit polling data. I don't know if it even exists in Ankeny. <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, but you know, w what's the abortion issue doing in this race in, in the suburbs? Um, to the, I mean, there's been negative ads run against um, all of these candidates over on the abortion issue, and you know. Did they have a, a major impact or not? It looks to me as if they did. Well, I think it's bigger than just that. Though. I mm. think in, in Ankeny specifically, abortion, yes, heavily on the scales, but I also think public education, right? We've seen the school board elections in mm -hmm. Ankeny. I mean, at, at sometimes become violent and, and I think decis divisive in a way that we don't want to ever see Iowa politics, sure. but that's where it's gone. And so you're talking about an area of the state where things have been highly divisive, highly confrontational, and that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. All right, a lot to unpack there. Stephanie. All right, very interesting stuff, guys. Thank you so much. We're going to take a quick look at some of the key races now that we are following. Again, this one, uh, we are expecting these numbers to move around quite a bit tonight with 6% of precincts reporting. The AP has already called it for Governor Kim Reynolds. She's just sitting at four. 43% right now due to Jazeera, 55%. Moving on to U.S. Senate now, another race that we are really watching closely. Michael Franken holding on to his lead of 59% of the vote right now over Chuck Grassley. And let's move on to U.S. House, our U.S. House races, District 4. Uh, Randy Feenstra holding the lead at 53%. We have Ryan Melton at 46% and Brian Holder at 2. We are going to take a quick break, but we will see you back here on Local 5 and CW Iowa 23.
It's election season, which means most of the ads you see right now during commercial breaks are probably for political candidates. One of our viewers in Texas noticed she was seeing a lot more ads for Republican Governor Greg Abbott than his Democratic challenger Beto O'Rourke. This raises a question a lot of people have during election season. Aren't candidates guaranteed equal amounts of ad time? Let's verify. Our sources are the FCC, the Communications Act of 1934, and David Schultz, a law professor at the University of Minnesota. The idea of equal time for candidates on TV comes from the Communications Act, which is enforced by the FCC. It says that if a candidate appears for more than four seconds on a TV station's air, that station, quote, shall afford equal opportunities to all other such candidates for that office. But there are some big exceptions. Notably, news coverage or interviews don't count. What does count is entertainment content. For example, during President Ronald Reagan's campaign, some stations stopped airing old movies he starred in. And this year, when Mehmet Oz started his Senate campaign, he stopped making his TV show Dr. Oz, in part because any station that aired it would have had to offer equal free airtime to his opponent, John Fetterman. But there's another key limitation of this law. Notice it says equal opportunities, not actually equal time. So if a candidate buys an ad for $1,000 in prime time, the station has to give their opponent the option to purchase an ad for the same price at the same time. But if the opponent can't afford it or just doesn't want to buy that ad space, the station doesn't have to do anything else. They've given them equal opportunity. It doesn't mean that it has to give, at the end of the day, the same amount of real time. If some candidates have more money and can actually purchase more time. All it says is we've got to provide the same opportunity. And yet another limitation, this law only applies to broadcast TV and radio. So cable and the internet aren't affected by any of this. That means we can verify, no, political candidates are not guaranteed equal amounts of ad time. They are only guaranteed the opportunity to get the same amount of time as their opponents for the same price. With your Verify, I'm Casey Decker. As candidates make their final push before the midterm elections, you may start seeing more of them touting endorsements from celebrities or notable organizations. That led Verify viewer Jack to wonder whether politicians might simply be paying those folks to endorse them. So let's verify. Is it legal for political candidates to pay for endorsements? Our sources are the Federal Election Commission and the Federal Election Campaign Act. According to the FEC, there is no law banning candidates from paying for endorsements. A spokesperson told Verify, quote, no provisions in the FEC rules specifically address paid endorsements of federal candidates. But candidates are legally required to disclose such payments. The Federal Election Campaign Act requires campaigns for federal office to file regular reports on where their money comes from and where it goes. That report has to include the name and address of any person to whom an expenditure in excess of $200 is made, together with the date, amount, and purpose of such expenditure. So paying for an endorsement isn't illegal, but trying to hide that payment could get you in trouble. A notable example, a former Iowa State Senator named Kent Sorensen. According to court records in 2012, he took money in exchange for endorsements for Republican candidates for president. He was charged with willfully causing false expenditure reports and obstruction of justice. He pleaded guilty and received a 15-month prison sentence. But it was for the cover-up, not the payments themselves. So we can verify, yes, it is legal for federal candidates to pay for endorsements but they are legally required to disclose those payments. With your Verify, I'm Casey Decker.
Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for your midterm election coverage. We are so happy that you chose to join us this evening. Uh, polls closed about an hour ago, so we are starting to get a better look at, self, at how some of these races are shaping up. We even have some early projections in here for you, so we're going to start cycling through some of those numbers here uh, in just a moment. But again, early in the evening, however, the AP uh, called this one for Governor Reynolds very early tonight. The AP projecting Governor Kim Reynolds uh, with the win, even though with 7% of precincts reporting these numbers show Deidre DeGere holding a lead right now at 53% to Governor Kim Reynolds 45. But again, AP projecting a win for Governor Reynolds tonight. Moving on to U.S. Senate now, we have now 7% of precincts reporting, getting more numbers in on this one. And Michael Franken is, is holding a lead over Senator Chuck Grassley right now, 57% of the vote uh, to Grassley. He was seeking his eighth term in the U.S. Senate uh, with just 43% of the vote right now. Uh, in U.S. House District District 4. We now have 1% of precincts reporting there. Early numbers there, but Randy Feenstra is holding a lead with 54% of the vote to Ryan Melton at 44%, and Brian Holder trailing behind there with 2% of the vote. A race that we've all been watching closely, not only here in Iowa, but across the country. This is one of those uh, races that everybody had their eye on. Uh, U.S. House District 3, uh, with you have 38% of the vote in right now. Incumbent Cindy Axney is, is holding a lead, 57%. Uh, Zach Nutt uh, state senator at this point trying to unseat Cindy Axney. He's at 43% of the vote at this point. In U.S. House District 3, we have Liz Mathis holding a lead at 58% of the vote to Ashley Hinson's 42% of the vote with just 1% of precincts reporting in that one. And in U.S. House District 1, 14% reporting. We have Christina Bohannon uh, with a big lead at this point, 71% of the votes to Marionette Miller Meeks, 29%. All right, now we keep getting more information in, and, and there have been a couple of surprising moments. And I heard uh, Samantha, our analyst, say two big wins for Democrats that they're that they're seeing in some of the more local races. Yes, Craig, explain what you're tracking right now. Yeah, so we were talking about the Ankeny uh, races yes. earlier. Uh, Mike Buslo wins the state Senate seat there, but the two Re Republican uh, campaign uh, candidates lost. Wow. Uh, so, and we're talking razor thin. Uh, uh, results here. So uh, Molly Buck uh, defeated Marvis Landon and Heather Matson. This was a rematch from two years ago. Heather Matson beat Garrett Gobble. And we're talking about, you know, 30 votes. Wow. Yeah. And you were just surprised when you learned that just a moment yeah. ago. Talk These, about. Look, on a night like this, even if even if Republicans have big wins across mm -hmm. the state and they win the top the top big races, there's always the potential for Democrats to have something or the other party sure. to be able to hang their hat on something. The, right here, those are, those are two House seats that I think uh, Democrats will be very energized about, that they've won some seats in the suburbs and, and that'll continue um, their work in the legislature. Okay, more breakdown to come. Stephanie. You'll have more on that in just a moment, but we do want to thank all of our CW Iowa 23 viewers for joining us on Local 5. Tonight, it is your voice, your vote. For all of you who are joining us from CW Iowa 23, thank you for being here with us tonight on Local 5 as we continue your midterm election coverage. And we were just talking about some of those local races and some of the, the wins that we have been seeing throughout the night and some of the surprises. Again, early results are coming in, so we're going to have more of those as, as uh, the night progresses. And we will be cycling through the numbers as we get more results in. All right, let's get back to some of the key races that we are watching. And, and this is something we're going to continue to say. Uh, early results in, in the governor's race, you can see only 16% of precincts reporting. However, uh, Deirdre DeGere holding a lead at this point at 54%, but you can see the check mark next to um, Governor Kim Reynolds. The AP has projected, and they projected early on with right about 1% of precincts reporting that this was going to be a win for Governor Reynolds. Um, so we have the early results there on that. Uh, U.S. Senate, 16% of precincts reporting right now. We have Michael Franken with a lead at 57% over incumbent Chuck Grassley at 43% of the vote. In U.S. House District 4, just 1% of precinct reporting here. Early numbers in this one, but we do have Randy Feenstra holding a lead at 54% over Ryan Melton at 44% and Brian Holder at 2%. In U.S. House District 3, we have 38% of precincts reporting, one that a, a lot of people are watching very closely here. Uh, incumbent Cindy Axney holding a lead at 57% of the vote to Zach Nunn's 
43% of the vote. And uh, we do have crews out there right now. As these numbers come in, we have them at various parties uh, around the metro. We're going to go out to Nora J.S. Reichart out there. D tell us a little bit about what's the mood like where you're at, Nora. <laughs> Yeah, Steph, we are here at Hotel Fort Des Moines for the Democratic Rally Party, and if you can't tell from the cheer behind me, folks are getting pretty excited. Although right now we haven't seen a whole lot of candidates coming through the event yet. Polk County Attorney Kim Kimberly Graham has here, but no Mike Franklin, no Deacon is here. Like that just yet. The folks are, not, are ready for a long night. They are clearly in this for the long haul, and they are ready to cheer on who they're hoping for, for folks winning tonight. All right, Nora. Yeah, it was good. Back to, to you, hear. studio guys. <laughs> Thank you, Nora. Kind of hard to hear you over the excitement there, but yes, we are seeing some some energy there. And as we uh, have heard from our analysts before, some early reasons for Democrats to to be excited about some races. Let's talk about the wins you just mentioned. The Democratic races, uh, lots of movement already. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and we'll see what else develops throughout mm -hmm. the night when we see more of you know these other uh, metropolitan areas when we know their votes are in. Cedar Rapids, Waterloo, Dubuque, those well, areas. Yeah, I think once again, it's it's emblematic of right, where Democrats are investing, yes. right? They're invested heavily in those Ankeny races. I think the, the Matson gobble race was one that was heavily focused on public education. Okay. Right, mm -hmm. and so I think that's carried over and, and that's shown uh, in that area at least, right? When you invest, right, we can have, Democrats can have outcomes that they have been hopeful to have for, a pa for the past couple cycles. And so as the night goes on, that'll be really interesting to see what happens with the Axne Nunn race, mm -hmm. um, given that there's some unexpected victories for Democrats in the Ankeny area. Let's talk about surprises and then things you have been expecting that's unfolding right now. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I'm still surprised at, at, at Ankeny, yeah. but I, I yeah. think too, what we can take from that is the strong Democrat showing in Polk County mm -hmm. is how does that impact this congressional race here? Uh, Cindy Axney is, is someone who's only won one county, uh, mm -hmm. Polk County. And so when she wins that, she needs to win it significantly. And, and the other thing I'd like to bring up is, you know, in previous years, there's previous cycles, there's been a, a, a libertarian candidate on the ballot. Yes. There's no libertarian on the ballot. So you've got to get past, you know, you got to get over, you got to get to 50% yeah. uh, to win. And so, um, but what's going on in Polk County tonight, you know, kind of, I think gives Axne some, some real hope. Well, it's a double-edged sword. Ah. Right? Because mm -hmm. if you invest heavily in one area, you don't have a whole lot of resources for elsewhere. Resources for elsewhere. And so I think when we, while there is gonna be some, some excitement about the victories in Polk County, what does that mean for other parts of the state, Southeast Iowa, Western Iowa? Lots to dig into, lots to follow. Let's send it back over to Stephanie. All right, thank you. We are going to head out to uh, Raina Garcia right now. She is with the Republicans, and we know that this room had a lot of energy earlier on in the evening, and Raina, it looks like it is pretty busy there tonight. Yeah, Steph, I mean, it's it's getting a lot more lively now, especially as we're getting some of those results in. I think the biggest um, applause and cheers you hear is when um, uh, Governor Reynolds' picture comes up as the projected winner. Uh, but other than that, I mean, there's still a lot of results that have yet to come in, but there's still like a, this feel, there's a buzz in the air. I think people are still really excited as those results continue to come in, but definitely that's one of the biggest moments that, that gets everyone cheering no matter how many times it comes on the screen. So uh, I expect that to continue. It's starting to get a little bit more lively right now, but uh, still waiting for those results to come in. All right, Raina, thank you so much. Yeah, definitely lively there, a lot of energy in that room, both rooms feeling the excitement of the night as they start to see some of these races take shape. All right, we're gonna check in on some of those numbers for you now. And uh, in the governor's race, as Raina said, the room, every time they put this one up, uh, that room gets pretty excited that she was at. Uh, governor Reynolds, the projected winner in this race. Uh, right now, we're, we're seeing those numbers shift a little bit with 17% of the uh, precincts reporting there. Um, in the Secretary of State race, with 14% of precincts reporting, Joel Miller has a lead at this point, 54% over incumbent Paul Pate at 46%. And in state auditor, 14% of precincts reporting now. Rob Sand, he is the incumbent. He is holding a lead right now at 64% of the vote to Todd Halber with 36% of the vote. And in treasurer, Michael Fitzgerald, 64% of the vote to Robbie Smith's 36%, 14% of precincts reporting in that race.
All right, Agriculture Secretary right now, uh, John Norwood is leading uh, incumbent Mike Nag right now. John Norwood, 54% of the vote to Mike Nag at 46. And again, early numbers here, 14% of precincts reporting. And with Attorney General incumbent Tom Miller uh, holding a, a lead right there at 64% of the vote to Brenna Bird's 36%. All right, let's do our U.S. House districts now. In District 1, 17% uh, of precincts reporting. Democrat Christina Bohannon is holding a big lead right now at 69% to Marionette Miller-Meeks, uh, the incumbent at 31% there. Uh, Liz Mathis, 53% of the vote in U.S. House District 2 to Ashley Hinson at 47%. This one a little lower on the numbers there at 8% of precincts reporting. And U.S. House District 3, again, our analysts were just talking about this one. They're seeing some signs of hope for Cindy Axney here, 38% uh, of precincts reporting. Cindy Axney, the incumbent, holding 57% of the vote right now. Zach Nunn at 43%. In U.S. House District 4, early numbers here, 3% of precincts reporting. Randy Feenstra holding a lead, 60%. Uh, Ryan Melton at 38%. And then Brian Holder at 2%. And in U.S. Senate right now, 17% of precincts reporting. We have Michael Franken at 56% of the vote uh, to Chuck Grassley, who is looking for an eighth term in the U.S. Senate, 44% of the vote. And now we do want to head back out to the Democratic Watch Party, the headquarters there, uh, where we find Larissa Leone. You've been following a lot of these races for us, Larissa. Yeah, absolutely, Stephanie. The energy in the room is quite booming. It's kind of on or off as we see some of the projected um, leaders cross the, you know, the stage. We are seeing, you know, crowds going up and down with emotion. So certainly a lot of Democrats in this um, room who are very excited about where numbers sit right now. Now there's still night to go, so there's still anybody's game at this point. But we do know, as you've mentioned multiple times. Kim Reynolds is uh, the projected winner for Iowa governor, um, according to the Associated Press. So right now we're just kind of seeing the waves of highs and lows here. And um, like I said, a very exciting well energy room here um, right now. Stephanie, we'll catch up with you later. All right, Larissa, thank you so much. We appreciate that update. And yes, we will be checking in with you uh, throughout the evening as these races take more shape. Let's run through some of our uh, state races here. This is uh, State Senate District 17 with 55% of precincts reporting. And this district is the Des Moines area, covers the Birdland neighborhood, parts of Beaverdale, the East Village. And interesting thing about this race here, no Republicans on the ticket. Uh, but again, with 55% of uh, precincts reporting, here we have uh, Isaiah Knox holding a big lead. State Senate District 21 uh, with 85% reporting. We have Mike Busola at 50% and Todd Brady also at 50% there. Less than 30 votes, it looks like they're separating the two of them. In State Senate District 29, early numbers here, uh, we have Jen Wolf the, uh, uh, holding a lead right now at 54%. Sandy Salmon at 46%, but as you can see, 0% of, of the votes reported there. We do have numbers, but it's very early on that one. And moving into State Senate District 46, we have Kevin Kinney uh, with 58% of the vote there to Don Driscoll at 42%. All right, I think we're going to head to our analysts now for a little bit more on what we're seeing in these races. What do you make of all of these votes? What's your takeaway here? Well, I, I think the, the uh, Kevin Kinney and Don Driscoll race is really interesting to me. Um, really trying to figure out what Democrats are saying in rural Iowa, right, to start winning yes. back some of those rural counties, especially places where we're losing population, uh, school consolidation, right? There's whole, not a whole lot of uh, economic uh, vibrancy that we're seeing in a lot of rural Iowa. And so really trying to identify what Democrats are talking about in those areas. We're going to get right back to Stephanie with Reynolds. Uh, Governor Kim Reynolds is now speaking. <laughs> because the best is yet to come. From the very beginning, uh, this campaign has been about Iowa. It's been about you. Because it's the people of Iowa who make this state what it is. Hardworking, innovative, committed to each other. You know, I want to recognize my opponent, Deidre Dejir. Uh, I have a lot of respect for anyone who is willing to stand up and put their name on, a on the ballot. She worked hard, 
she traveled across Iowa to take her message to the people. And while we have our differences, we both want Iowa to succeed, and that's how it should be. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the campaign, we're all Iowans, and we're all in this together. So you know the story, too. Um, these last four years, we've faced a lot. We've faced uh, some significant challenges, floods, uh, a worldwide pandemic, a derecho, tornadoes. I think we went back and did a little more flooding, a little more drought, uh, and so much more. But I think one thing that we've shown is that Iowans can do anything when we stand together, and our state, of course, is better for it. So now we are ready for the next challenge. And once again, I can tell you without hesitation, we are going to exceed expectations. I want to take a moment, too, to thank my family. I've got most of them uh, here tonight, and I certainly wouldn't be here without uh, those standing behind me. My mom and dad aren't with us tonight, but we had we were able to have a dinner with them earlier. So I want to just say a heartfelt thanks, mom and dad who are watching at home. Thanks for um, teaching me the values that uh, I live by today. I love you to pieces. I'm glad we were able to spend some time with you uh, earlier today. I'm also blessed to be the mom of three wonderful daughters, three son-in-laws, 11 very active grandchildren. What do you think there, August? Many of them weren't still awake last year, or four years ago, when we were able to be uh, recognized as the winner of that race, so I'm glad uh, that they're able to, to join us here today. And of course, um, Kevin, um, I want to just thank you for always being there. The first dude, how lucky are we to have this guy? He's always been there for me, but not just me, for um, our entire family. He is an amazing husband, an amazing dad, and I'm telling you, he's probably the favorite grandparent, too. I think the kids love Grandpa Kevin uh, a lot, so I just want to say how much I love you, and thanks to all of you for always being there for me and kind of helping me get through some of the tough times. So let's give my family a round of applause. Lieutenant Governor, thanks for being an incredible partner through all of this. Thanks for being on this journey with me, and I'm looking forward to uh, having you continue to be that partner for another four years. I couldn't do it without you, so thank you very much. Best Lieutenant Governor in the country, right? And I want to thank my uh, entire team. I don't know, I think they're over here. I don't know where they're all at, but both um, the campaign team and the official uh, campaign. You know, I've always said that it's really important to surround yourself with the very best. And I am telling you, with both of these teams, I have the very best. I love you all. You have worked so hard. I have been so proud of what we've been able to do over the last four years and what we'll continue to do um, over the next. So I'm very, very blessed um, to have an, an incredible team. Can we give them a round of applause too? this short because I'm excited to continue to watch tonight to see the results uh, come in and see all the strong freedom loving candidates who are going to be joining us. So the fight uh, for you at the local, state, and federal levels, uh, they're ready to go. They're working hard to have the opportunity to continue to serve uh, Iowans. So our message for you tonight is this. We are not stopping. We are not slowing down. I am so excited to get back to work and to lay out a bold conservative agenda and to follow through with what we say we're going to do. I can promise you it is going to be an agenda where you keep more of your money, where our schools are thriving and all parents have a choice, where your government works for you, not the other way around. I'm going to say 
it one more time, and I've been saying it as I've crisscrossed the state, uh, that the best is yet to come. God bless you. God bless Iowa. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to serve. Okay, the first speech of the night that we are hearing, also from the first projected winner of the night, Governor Kim Reynolds. Uh, obviously, you heard her say the best is yet to come. She started her speech with that and ended with that. She also thanked her challenger, Deidre DeGier, uh, throughout this campaign. And something that I, I you know, want to talk to our analysts about was I was struck, especially in the debate between uh, Governor Reynolds and Deidre DeGier, the civility between the two of them while they were debating, but also they, they both brought a lot of ideas to the table and really demonstrated the differences on how they wanted to get to the best state of Iowa. With this projected win, what does this mean for Iowa? Well, I think first and foremost, uh, right, it shows that Democrats just can't bank on winning Des Moines win statewide. Mm. Uh, that, that's not the equation that gets it done. And so how will we invest across the, across the state? How will we will include rural voices in the conversations that Democrats are having to ensure that they have better success um, in statewide races? You know, four years ago, uh, this this it took a long time for Reynolds to be called the winner, mm -hmm. um, and so this is a big win for her. I think, especially after, you know, everything that she had to endure uh, in the last four years, especially COVID. I mean, those were um, those aren't easy decisions, mm -hmm. and I think that through that, I think through adversity leaders always kind of find their way a little bit and find their voice. And I think Reynolds has, and I think that um, we don't know the final result of, of how big of a win this is yet for her, uh, but I think it's significant. And, um, you know, I think that, that she does have a strong connection with Iowans and, um, you know, she's got four more years to, to lead and there's things that she hasn't been able to get through the legislature yet. And I expect that she'll take this big win and. And, and, and put that weight behind it uh, to move school choice uh, in the next legislative session. And what does that mean moving forward? What kind of changes are Iowans going to see? Well, I think that there, you, you might get school choice options. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is, is that the proposal on the table last year was very limited. Um, depending on what the legislature looks like, it could be a, a, a much different looking package this time around. It, it doesn't mean she's gonna run the, the, the same play with the same, with the same idea, it might be different. It might look more like what Arizona passed uh, earlier this year. Yeah. I just think a lot of those safeguards were gone in the yeah. primary, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, I think school choice is, is on its way to Iowa. And so a lot of the, even, even in Republican primaries, right, we saw that those candidates who back uh, school choice, right, were, were a Governor Reynolds' pick. And so a lot of those candidates won those primaries. Um, but I do think there are some, some, some fail safes for Democrats in the Iowa legislature, depending on how this plays out, and starting with those seats in Ankeny. Yeah, mm -hmm. this night yeah, you're just absolutely. getting started. Exactly. Yep. All right, Stephanie, let's send it back to you. All right, Samantha, thank you very much. And we do want to head out to the uh, Democratic headquarters right now where we have Local 5's Larissa Leone. Larissa, we just heard Governor Kim Reynolds uh, you pretty much claim her victory here. She's the projected winner. Uh, and, and how is the room? I mean, you were there last night when Deidre DeGier had her last campaign stop and was really trying to energize voters for that last push. So, so how are things feeling tonight? Yeah, that's right, Stephanie. The mood, I can tell you, has definitely changed. As Governor Kim Reynolds was making her acceptance speech, it was almost as if you could hear a pin drop. There was definitely Democrats giving their full attention as to what she was saying. There was an occasional boo every now and then, but it really was focusing on what her policy, what she was um, saying, thanking Deidre DeGier, as you mentioned. Now, take a little bit of a look around the room. We still got ourselves a very packed house, um, definitely enthusiastic people eyes are just glued to what results are coming in and you know I tell you what I've heard a couple of conversations from people talking they're not discouraged quite yet um, they're still kind of pulling for those other Democratic front runners that are still you know making their way into those races so I still I still hint a little bit of fight left in um, the individuals here at the Democratic Party um, event now I will say that it's definitely a a long night there's still some night to come so um, definitely not throwing in the towel here just a little bit of an energy um, getting a little lower there Stephanie absolutely that's understandable there all right 
Thank Larissa, you. thank you so much. And of course, another big story that we always have this time of year in Iowa is our weather and, and how that's going to be changing out there this week. We can't neglect this, Brad. We cannot neglect the weather. It is pretty nice out there right now. Temperatures are actually rising a little bit out there. It's warmer than it was a couple of hours ago. So a great election day. We had a few showers in northwest Iowa. And look at November. It's been above average most of the days out there. That is going to change. We've got one more above average day, actually, too. Tomorrow is definitely a warm day, but then this cold front comes through with a little bit of rain. It doesn't look as rainy or as stormy, but one thing is for sure, this cold is on its way and it is going to hit us hard uh, Thursday night into Friday. So get ready for that. We got two more mild nights. Tonight's one of them 57 degrees out there. The winds are out of the southeast. That's what's keeping temperatures up. And in fact, it's starting to rise those temperatures. Tomorrow will be in the 70s with these strong winds the next couple of days, but the winds change Thursday and Friday. They're out of the northwest and they're going to be strong and they're going to be cold, especially Friday. Wind chill values will be in the teens and 20s. Believe it or not, it's going to be that bad. 70s for highs tomorrow. Soak it in. We will have a warm Thursday morning, but then it'll get colder as the afternoon goes on. So the highs on Friday, these are the highs. Highs in the 30s, lows will be in the teens. It will be very cold out there. You can see the warm air kind of pushing back to the north. It's also going to kind of get a little bit humid going into tomorrow night. So feeling a little bit like spring. Here's the culprit making all the changes. A big storm coming out of the west is going to move into the Midwest and then pull down that cold Canadian air. Meanwhile, we have a tropical storm going on. This is going to become a hurricane and it is going to affect Florida here. So this is Nicole, probably a category one hurricane, kind of a minor hurricane, if you will. Not as bad as the last one they had to endure, but it will cause some rain for sure along the east coast. Now we've got a little rain coming our way. It doesn't look like a lot though. Scattered showers will be developing not tomorrow, but it'll be tomorrow uh, or actually into Thursday morning. We'll see those showers and thunderstorms developing. So look how, look how warm it is Thursday morning at 6 a.m. Here comes the cold front with scattered showers and thunderstorms. Slight risk of severe weather, especially eastern Iowa. They may see some severe weather. So staying milder out there tonight. A few showers to the north, low near 55. Tomorrow warm and windy, a high of 73 degrees. And here's your 10-day forecast sponsored by Holt Plumbing and Heating. After two more mild days, the bottom falls out and it gets cold all the way through and through next week. It is going to be way below average. The only chance of precipitation might be next Tuesday or Wednesday. Stephanie. All right, Brad, thank you so much. Appreciate that update on the weather there, even though the numbers don't look great. All right, let's look at some different numbers. Here we go. We're going to take a look at some of our key races now with 37% of the vote counted in U.S. Senate. Uh, Chuck Grassley now has pulled ahead 51% of the vote in that uh, to Michael Franken's 49%. Very close race there right now in U.S. House District 4. Uh, Randy Feenster holding on to that sizable lead at 70% to Ryan Melton's 28% and Brian Holder there with 2%. In House District 3, with 60% of precincts reporting, we do have Cindy Axney holding on to her lead there at 53% of the vote to Zach Nunn at uh, 47%. And in U.S. House District 2, uh, we've seen a, a, a flop here, a flip-flop here with 18% of uh, the precincts reporting. Ashley Hinson now pulled ahead to 55% of the vote at this point to Liz Mathis at 45%. And in U.S. House District 1 with 38% of the vote counted here, Christina Bohannon has a lead with 57% of the vote uh, over Marionette Miller-Meeks at 43% right now. We're going to talk about the difference between one and two. Explain to our viewers what all, that all just means. Sure. In, in the first congressional district, which is now in southeast Iowa, it's, uh, it includes Johnson County. Um, Johnson County is in. It's a lot. It performs. That district has the same elements as the third congressional district. Um, huge margins for the Democrat candidates. Johnson County, 99% of the vote is in there. Um, and so we're waiting to see again is the Bohannon margin in Johnson big enough to hold off Miller Meeks? Um, we'll, we have to see on that. Mm -hmm. in, in, in the second district, which is Cedar Rapids and North, um, Lynn County is still out. Sure. Uh, there's a lot of vote out still there. So I think you could see a lot of fluctuation in that district. Yet. Oh, definitely. So and I think, you know, it's always interesting to see how Democrats perform along the Mississippi. Right. Yeah. right? And this is going to be one. These are going to be two of those races that are really indicative for the future um, of the Democratic Party, I believe. And so um, right running candidates that are that are uh, been, you know, reside in Johnson County 
they, they should win in Johnson County, but we've got to be focused on places like Dubuque. Um, what does that look like, especially knowing that Dubuque was a former blue county that's gone red before the mm -hmm. Telegraph Herald right, endorsed Ashley Henson's race, and so that's going to be really interesting what happens in those areas. Talk more about importance of margin. Yeah, ma I'm, margin matters. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, 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 you know, all counties aren't created equally in, uh, in terms of population, and so there's just areas that you like for Democrats statewide, they have to have significant margins in Polk County. If you are running in the second or the first congressional district, you have to have 30, 40,000 vote margin coming out of Johnson County for you to win those districts. And so the margin matters. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's hard to know if it's big enough. You can see as the, as the, the, the counties start to fill in uh, and those votes come in, you can start to get a, a sense of if there's enough to hold off uh, or to win it. Yeah, we'll, we'll see if, if Democrats have too many eggs and, and just a few baskets, mm -hmm. right? And sure. I think that's what we're talking about, is seeing how that plays out. What does it look like uh, along right, those who are, are, are right, with labor unions? What does that look like? It's, it's not historically as it used to be. And so all right, we've seen more strikes in the past couple of years than we have in a long time. How does that play out in these election cycles? And so Democrats have a lot of work to do um, along the Mississippi River, just like they do along the Missouri River, to ensure how are people turning out and how are they voting, um, not just in those places that are Democratic strongholds, right. but across the state to really buffer those impacts. And also looking at that urban rural divide. Right. It's always existed. It always will exist. But is is rural Iowa really red? You know, We're and, find and, out and we'll find as out. The night goes. Yeah. <laughs> your, your Republican candidates are hoping so. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Steph, let's send it back to you. Thank you so much. Much more to come tonight. We are wrapping our coverage on CW Iowa 23, but we will continue on Local 5. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for sticking with us here uh, for your midterm election coverage on Local 5. We are so happy that you chose to join us tonight. And the theme of the night seems to be we will find out. We're getting more information as these numbers come in. We're going to head back over to our analysts because uh, as these races take shape, we're learning not only uh, about where we're learning a lot, actually, about what's driving voters across the state to go to the polls tonight. And for those who are just tuning in, just joining us right now, we have unpacked a lot tonight, still a lot to go. Let's get to first, what is driving voters to the polls? A lot of voter turnout, a lot of early turnout this year. So um, what are you seeing? What matters right yeah, now? Yeah, it, it might be different things in different areas of the mm -hmm. state. Um, for example, you know, earlier we talked about in, in suburban Iowa, maybe maybe those abortion issues are, are really driving people right. to the polls mm -hmm. and they're supporting Democrats. Uh, in rural Iowa and elsewhere, maybe it's, it's more economic pocketbook issues. Mm -hmm. um, still a long ways to go, but I think there might be something there yeah. uh, on that divide. Well, I think to, to that point, right, population density matters. Yes. The, the age of the typical voter in that, or in that area matters, in that region matters. Yes. And so we think about our urban centers, right, where folks are typically younger, where we have uh, the ability to grow our population in the state. Those folks vote for different reasons than right, folks who may live in rural Iowa, may not have a university right, in their county. Those are all... I think good indicators to look at as we kind of go throughout the night and see how that plays out across the state. And we'll continue to unpack this as the votes, the numbers continue to come through. Uh, so many things to understand. Yes. And we thank you both so much for being here with us to explain it all and get us all through it. So stick with us throughout this evening, Stephanie. And those numbers are telling us a lot tonight, and we do want to run through some of those key races for you because they are taking even more shape now as we get later into the evening. And U.S. Senate with 42% now of the precincts reporting. Chuck Grassley uh, looking for his eighth term in the U.S. Senate, holding at 52% over Michael Franken at 48% at this point. In U.S. House District 4, Randy Feenstra has, has held a sizable lead throughout this uh, evening at 71% to Ryan Melton at 27% and Brian Holder at 2 percent. U.S. House District 3, 63 percent now reporting. Cindy Axney is, is in, in the lead. She is the incumbent here, 54 percent uh, to Zach Nunn at 46 percent. In U.S. House District 2, we have Ashley Hinson at 55% uh, of the vote over Liz Mathis, 45% of the vote there, both former television journalists as well here. And in U.S. House District 1, 41% reporting Christina Bohannon at 54% over Marionette Miller-Meeks right now, 46%. Uh, 
In the Secretary of State race, 30% reporting. We have incumbent Paul Pate now pulling ahead at 55% of the vote uh, to Joel Miller at 45% of the vote. And at State Auditor, uh, incumbent Rob Sand holding 56% vote there over Todd Hulber at 44%. That is with 30% of precincts reporting. Uh, Treasurer now, 30% reporting. Michael Fitzgerald, also the incumbent here, 55% of the vote over Robbie Smith. Uh, the Republican candidate there, 45% of the vote. Ag Secretary uh, Mike Nag pulling ahead now at 55% of the vote to John Norwood. 45% of the vote, Mike Nag, the incumbent in this seat. And for Attorney General now, 30% reporting Tom Miller at 55% to Brenna Bird at 45%. All right, we're going to head out now to uh, another one of our watch parties out there. We've got Dave Downey out in the field. Uh, I can hear, Dave, that that room does have a buzz going on. So what are you seeing? Yeah, I think, Stephanie, since I can barely hear you, I think that does mean uh, there is definitely a buzz going on right now. About five, ten minutes ago, Governor Kim Reynolds uh, was joined by Lieutenant Governor uh, Adam Gregg. Looks like there might be still up there right now. I uh, can't exactly tell, uh, but there's definitely a vibe in the room, uh, a vibe of maybe there's a sense of more Republican victories coming tonight. We've seen uh, some numbers of Grassley come up, some numbers of uh, Senator Ashley Hinson come up, both, of course, incumbents uh, trending in the right direction from where they were maybe a half, uh, maybe 45 minutes ago. Uh, we're still, of course, waiting for much more results. The votes are streaming in, of course. Uh, as we are just about an hour and a half uh, from when the polls initially closed. Uh, so the night is young. It's still getting started. Plenty of issues on the ballot. Of course, that Article 1 uh, for the Right to Bear Arms Amendment still uh, its a statewide amendment. So lots of things on the ballot. It's not just a midterm election. Uh, lots to come from here uh, at the Hilton the Hotel downtown. But for now, uh, we'll send you back to you in the studio as the numbers definitely continue uh, to stream in. Absolutely, Dave. Well, Republican headquarters, thank you so much. Uh, quite the little dancer back there behind you, too. <laughs> Looks like a lot of energy in that room, Samantha. Huge stakes in this midterm election. Let's talk about what is driving voters to the polls. Very high implications for what's being voted on. Well, yeah, I think you've heard a couple different narratives. I think from Republicans, you've, you've heard about what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. I think from Democrats, you've heard about what they're going to stop. Mm -hmm. and I think voters want right, that, that proactive mindset. They want to know what folks are going to do when you, once you're elected, not where you're going to stop. And so I think Great point. for Democrats, you've got to be mindful of that narrative because it's, it seems to be right, catching fire across the state. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I think that uh, we, we've seen Democrats win in Polk County and we'll probably see Democrats win in other metro counties across the state. If you add to that a congressional win here or there, I think all of a sudden it becomes a real mixed bag and Democrats are going to be feeling a lot better about this election cycle than maybe they did go in into tonight. So again, I think the issues differ mm -hmm. based on where you're at. Sure. And, uh, and, and, and sometimes the same issue is motivating both sides sure. just for different reasons, mm -hmm. completely different exactly. reasons, exactly. right? Right, and it's oftentimes that's yeah. not the narrative. <laughs> right. right? It, it equals each other out. Yep. But also, I, I think to that point, right, when we're talking about things that are pocketbook issues, mm -hmm. um, we, we've got to be more mindful of how people speak to the, the average eye when about those sure. issues. Inflation right. means a different, something different for a lot of us, mm -hmm. right? But if you've been to the gas station lately, that's the you know it. Yeah. You know it and you feel it. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you know, if you got you head to the grocery store, you got a family to feed and you've mm -hmm. got a fixed income, mm -hmm. exactly. you start to make some very um, discouraging, concerning yes. uh, changes. And perhaps, you know, you're not even able to feed your family as well as you used to. Well, and lower taxes sound different during inflation, mm. right? When I don't have as much money in my pocket, I definitely want to pay more in taxes. And so mm. that does resonate different with, with the average Iowan. And so uh, in, in politics, as much as we rely on history, every cycle is uniquely that. And I think Democrats have to be mindful not to put too uh, much stake in history mm -hmm. and really have a vision for what's the future. Uh, speak to redistricting. 
Well, I think redistricting did a couple of things. One, it, it put people in some uncomfortable situations, right? We've seen folks uh, buying homes in other, in other communities to run for office, mm -hmm. um, but also the name on the ballot changes. And we're, as human beings, right, we vote for the same person over and over again. And so, uh, in doing so, you see a new name, that's new name recognition that has to be built in that area. And if you're kind of coming into a new community, now you've got to build some rapport, some foundation to get those people, your neighbors, sure. your constituents, to know you and to vote for you. Um, go ahead. Yeah, no, and, and I think, too, there's something to be said about when you live in uh, areas that are growing rapidly, mm -hmm. you know, like around the Des Moines metro, when you have, you know, Waukee and Ankeny, these places turn over. And right. so how it felt, you know, two years ago is completely different. Sure. You got a lot of new people moving in all the time. And I think it's hard for these local politicians to stay in front of new people, yeah. hmm. to introduce themselves to new people. And the other thing is, is when you're running in, in a place like, you know, Ankeny or whatever, you're competing with a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. your, kids, your kids are running your ragged and, and it's, <laughs> it's not like we're all sitting around thinking about politics, right. you know, 20, some of us might be, okay. but, 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 it is but most people are not. It, yeah. it, it is a luxury and there's, you're competing with all of that. And so, you know, come election day, you better have made a good effort to reach out and to educate people of who you are, what you believe, and what you want to do. Yeah. And uh, uh, to your point earlier when we were speaking about Gen Z voters, yeah. how is that changing things? Well, I think you can't focus on just one demographic anymore. Right. With redistricting, it's ensured that we have some real communities mixed in with some more urban communities. And what does that look like for when you have to speak broadly to mm -hmm. voters about the things that align and, and bring most Iowans together? And I think picking a message that is just fixed on one side or the other, well, now you've really created that divide. And so I think with a lot of Gen Z voters, a lot of new voters, they're going to be picking for things that they're passionate about. Yes. And we heard, we've heard often from voters too, more so lately, is they say, I vote uh, socially Democrat, but I vote fiscally Republican. So that's, <laughs> why, that's quite a statement, it, right? It, it is, I think, but I, I, it might be code for I don't want to talk politics. I know. Exactly. <laughs> but I think most of us do, right? Most of us try to balance the money that's in our bank account, right. in our wallet, and mm -hmm. our purse. And so yeah. I, I think that's not a misnomer, but we can't put a whole lot of stake into that. Sure. And what, what issue is really motivating you? Right. I mean, at the core, you know if, if, if an issue is really motivating uh, you or not. So, and I think when it, when it comes to the abortion issue, like for example, Republicans have felt like if you're a pro-life person, you felt like you have achieved what you wanted. Hmm. So what's the motivation to go out to the polls on that issue? Sure. Mm -hmm. It's not there, but it is there uh, for the Democrats to go out there and they're, they're, put, they're saying we're gonna do something. We wanna codify Roe in Congress. We wanna do those things. So the dynamic on those issues between the two parties is completely different. Too. All right, more to unpack. Stephanie, let's send it to you. Absolutely, we want, wanted to get you to some of those uh, state races that are starting to take more shape now too. And in, in State Senate District 14, we have 93 percent of the vote in now and this one is interesting uh we had the uh you know we have the president president of the senate there jake chapman trailing now behind sarah trone garriott who is in the lead with 52 percent of the vote at this point and this is uh garriott uh, trone garriott's first re-election battle here i'm uh, moving into state senate district 21 now uh mike Busolo with 51 percent uh over tom brady 49 percent there uh close with 100% of precincts reporting in District 21. Um, so we have my, Mike Busolo right now with a lead on that. Okay, here we go. We just got to let the computer catch up to us here. We want to make sure we get you the freshest and most accurate numbers here. In State House District 28, 100% uh, of precincts reporting. Again, we do have David Young in the lead of 53% of the vote over Sonia Height Susan. Uh, maybe a familiar face to a lot of you here, a former uh, local news anchor, 47% of the vote now. And we're going to head back out to the Democratic headquarter where we find a headquarters where we find local fives, Larissa Leone. And, and I understand it, the, the energy has been kind of on a little bit of a roller coaster there. Some some good moments and then maybe some disappointing moments in the room. 
Yeah, that's right, Stephanie. Certainly still kind of gotten that mellow vibe here. They're certainly updating themselves, watching as, you know, front runners are being announced, cheering when they see their Democratic candidates being represented. But what we're not seeing here is a lot of Democratic candidates. Um, they are not present. You know, we're looking around the room, speaking to community members and kind of seeing what they're thinking so far. Still got that hope, still got that perseverance to continue out through the night. But again, we are not seeing those Democratic candidates um, present in the building at this time. Now, we will continue to keep on making our laps around here and getting that energy of what's going on here. Still, like I said, people are waiting on those results and kind of uh, uh, reacting to who they're seeing the front runner at the moment. So we'll continue to keep on doing our surveys of the room and um, looking for those candidates and uh, we'll send it back to the studio. Larissa, thank you so much. And early tonight uh, in the governor's race, we did have an early projected win for Governor Reynolds when it, we only had 1% of the vote reporting in. And the AP um, can explain to us now uh, how it goes about calling those races. <music> I'm Stephen Olemacher and I'm the election decision editor for the Associated Press based in Washington, D.C. I oversee about 60 analysts on election night and we declare the winners in about 7,000 races across the U.S. Elections are complex across the United States. While there are federal laws and the Constitution that guide much of them, elections are run by states and state laws uh, dictate a lot of the processes. So different states have different rules for the hours of voting, for how they're tabulated, how the results are released. It is really a, a broad mix of different types of elections in different states. We don't know what's gonna happen on election night, but we're preparing for the possibility that in many states, we might not be able to call all the winners on election night because it's going to take days to count all of the votes. And if you think about it, it's the states where they have competitive races. It's states like Pennsylvania, it's a state like Arizona, it could be a state like Colorado as well. In Pennsylvania, under state law, they cannot open mail ballots until the morning of election day, and it takes a long time to process those ballots and count them, so they very well might not be able to count all of their ballots on election day. It could take days, and since we do expect there to be close races there for both Senate and Governor, it could take a while before we know who wins. Across the country, this is not new. In many years, it takes a long time in various states to find out who won different elections. In the pandemic, it did get uh, more pronounced, and that's because of the increase in mail ballots. It also be it became more pronounced in more states. At the AP, we follow the numbers. We call races without fear or favor. If the numbers say that a candidate has won, and we can verify that the, the vote count is accurate, we declare a winner. Candidates concede, candidates declare victory, the information is noteworthy. We report that in our stories on the wire, but it doesn't really affect our race calls and when we declare a winner. We follow the process. You know, we will have 4,000 people spread out across the country at counties and townships talking directly to election officials getting results and they will call those results in to vote entry operators. We have about 800 of them entering votes into our system. We have a large quality control team that will be checking for errors and checking across platforms to make sure that the votes align so that we can present the most accurate, fastest vote totals to, to the country and to the world. We'll just take it live. Gotcha. Very interesting. We are going to head back out to uh, Republican headquarters here uh, for, to talk to Local 5's uh, Khalil Maycock. Uh, Khalil, I understand you had a chance to talk to Secretary of State Paul Pate, who's not only overseeing all of this tonight, but waiting for his own results as well. Is this my good side? Yes, Stephanie, we are here at the GOP watch party. As you can hear, there was someone next to me who was just asking, is this his good side? So we're going to ask him, I know you have a race that's going on tonight. Talk to me about that and just in general what you're seeing so far and how that's going. Well, I'm very pleased with the results we're seeing. Uh, uh, we're getting the votes we wanted in the counties we wanted, and uh, I don't want to uh, get ahead of myself, but pretty much I believe we've won, we've won the election for tonight. and. Uh, We've seen a really strong voter turnout across the state. We uh, didn't know what to expect because of the uh, early voting was a little light, but people came out in full force. 
And, you know, earlier we were talking about, you know, people came out in full force, but there were some issues in one county in Iowa with some voting. Can you talk to me about that? Well, unfortunately, my own home county of Lynn, the auditor there uh, failed to put a supervisor's race on the ballot in the home precinct of the candidate who was running. Uh, and that's very unfortunate and it's very serious because that means you disenfranchised anywhere from 300 to 500 potential voters who couldn't vote for that race. So now we have to work through that to decide how they want to handle the, uh, the precinct that didn't have an opportunity to vote for a county supervisor. And when you say work through that, for people at home, what does that mean? What are the next steps? It means lawyers. It means going through and looking at what the Iowa Code says about it. Uh, we can't even find a precedent for this. We don't know any, what's ever happened before, and so we'll be doing with that. It, a lot of it has to do with the candidates themselves. Uh, they have some options of uh, trying to uh, resist them certifying it. The County Board of Supervisors may have the option of not choosing to certify that particular race uh, and require some kind of a runoff or a, I should say runoff, but a, uh, a, uh, a election for that, at least that precinct that didn't get it voted right. And then when things like this happen, they can be used as a teaching moment. So going forward, what will this be doing for your office next time when it comes to voting? Well, it's going to help uh, help the other counties to do that triple check. And many of them do a, a check and another check, and this is one more thing they need to check off. So I'm pretty optimistic about that. Are you worried about anybody not conceding? Uh, no, I think the, the, the number spread is pretty pretty serious, and, and I, I think it will be pretty clear who the winners are. All right, thank you. Now, Stephanie, if you hear in the background, there are some people that are out here cheering. Someone is standing up in a chair. Um, <laughs> Stephanie, it's an electric right here in this room, and I'm going to toss it back to you. Getting a little wild down there. All right, Khalil, we trust you to stay on top of the situation <laughs> for sure. And yes, you can tell in, Secretary Paint that was his know. good side. Okay. We want to take a look at uh, the Secretary of State race right now, and with 42% uh, in, we have Paul Pate holding a lead at 57% over Joel Miller with 43%. And uh, we want to head over to our analysts now. They had an interesting race that they wanted to take a deeper look at. Samantha, that was State Senate District 14. Yeah, let's explain the takeaways here. Yeah, this, this is maybe the biggest race in central Iowa mm -hmm. that was going on in the State Senate. You had Sarah Trung Garriott. Uh, challenging the Senate president, Jake Chapman, and uh, she has won that race. And so to be able to, to unseat a leader in the state Senate, um, he was very controversial. Mm -hmm. He said some things that got a lot of news coverage. And, um, you know, and in this case, I think those things worked against him. Mm. And, um, and, and so this is a huge, this is another big win uh, for Democrats, if you look at what they've done in Ankeny tonight, you add you add uh, this Sarah Trung Garriott uh, mm -hmm. victory, uh, Keenan Judge being uh, in the House, uh, getting reelected. They have. Dem if I'm a Democrat, I look at this and say I have a foothold in these these big suburban mm -hmm. areas now that I can build off of, and it it's going to help them. Um, they're going to feel good going into this next legislative session. And let's hear from you on that, too. Oh, definitely. So I think it's a huge win for Democrats in the mm -hmm. Iowa legislature. Um, but I also think, once again, it's indicative of where you invest, you can win. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But also we have to reflect on the fact that Kevin Kenney is trailing in his race, right? And so you look at Southeast Iowa, Iowa County, Washington County. Uh, he won Johnson County. but. Only to invest in Johnson County and to, and to lose in, in other places, it still leaves a difficult path for Democrats when it comes to getting closer to taking back the majority. But I will say um, that Senate race, Sarah Trong Garriott winning that race is a big deal for Democrats in the state of Iowa. Sure. And, you know, you keep saying it depends on who you are, what's important to you. Mm -hmm. And Iowa is changing. Yes. Iowa is growing. Des Moines is growing. Yeah. Um, people are moving. Re, you know, all these different things, redistricting, margin, importance of margin. And then all of the issues at stake right now are seriously um, impactful. You've got the economy, uh, inflation, uh, people really stress, struggling financially right now. And then you have abortion rights and gun rights, the most <laughs> possibly polarizing, would you yeah. say, issues at stake? Well, definitely. So I think you, you can be a one in a one issue voter and have your pick of 12 to 15 different issues this mm -hmm. cycle. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think it's, it's going to be really difficult to narrow that down and deduce what's really driving folks to the polls. We know or to, 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 to the uh, voting booth, but we know that inflation is right up there with abortion. But it seems to be right now as, in, as the data comes in that the economy is really ruling mm -hmm. the day. Sure. OK, we're going to send it to Stephanie now.
All right, Samantha, thank you. And we're going to head back out there into the field, this time to the Democratic headquarters, uh, the watch party there, where we find Local 5's Larissa Leone. And yet, Larissa, we, we you know, obviously disappointment over not winning the governor's house. But uh, we have just talked to our analysts about some key wins for Democrats tonight. So I would imagine that the mood is reflecting that in the room. Yes, definitely. Clearly some disappointment um, with Governor Reynolds being the governor continuing in um, her reign there. But, you know, I have to say, Sarah Trone Garrett's um, results uh, made the crowd kind of go wild. So we're kind of still seeing that influx of excitement, a little bit of disappointment to be expected on election night. But the room continues to fill in. A couple more of those candidates um, are definitely starting to make their appearances, but we still Still have yet to see um, uh, Deidre DeGier in some of those um, big ticket uh, high contested races. We're not seeing those candidates quite yet. So room is still exciting as you can see over to over here. There's still a lot of people behind me to the side of me, you know, and everybody's kind of just talking about the conversations of, you know, again, Sarah Trone Garrett getting that win. It's been a huge win for them. People are still cheering and t conversating about it. Um, and again, these are not certified wins, so there's still uh, time for that to happen, but it is looking like the front runner there. Um, so yeah, just like I stated, up and down emotions, happy one minute and then disappointed the next, just like a typical election. But we're still, again, certainly trying to find those candidates. So we're gonna keep on talking to um, our people here. We're gonna keep on chatting around the room just to get a better sense of um, what's going on, Stephanie. All right, Larissa, thank you so much. We appreciate that. And now to uh, the Republican headquarters where we find uh, Local 5's Dave Downey now. And yes, a ro roller coaster of emotions there. And uh, Dave, uh, talking. Can you hear me there, Dave? Yeah, hey, Stephanie. Okay. Uh, here with David Young. Uh, looks like District 28 has been called. Congratulations on the win, David. How's it feel? Uh, I'm very honored and thankful to um, have won and look forward to representing people in House District 28. And so it's a privilege. Yeah, the first message uh, to Southwest West Des Moines, Adel Van Meter. Yeah, that's the area. It's southeast uh, Dallas County. And so uh, born and raised there, live there today. And so it's kind of my home base. And I look forward to getting into the legislature and working uh, on some tough issues and leading. Yeah, we were just talking off camera about we had the heater from Van Meter, Bob Feller. Now we have the leader from Van Meter, David Young, talked about no curveballs. Uh, so just st straight down over the plate. Four seamers right down over the plate. That's right. Yeah. Uh, first thing you're going to do in office, what's that kind of first goal, that first inkling? Uh, I, I need to find a clerk. So I need to do that first. And then, uh, you know, I'm not unfamiliar with the legislative procedure, but just make sure I know, you know, the rules and the nuances, uh, know the issues, and I know the people in Southeast Dallas County, and so ready to work hard for them on quality of life issues, you know, the economy, uh, keeping our community safe and education as well, and then whatever can come your way. Yeah, kind of the message behind educational funding, if you will. Uh, regarding education, just make sure that we stay uh, up to, at the very top uh, of the 50 states in terms of making sure our kids are educated. Uh, in academics, reading, writing, arithmetic, keep politics out of the school, left or right side of it. Uh, parents should know what's in their curriculum and give parents, you know, great educational options for their kids to prepare for the future and hope in the future these kids stay in Iowa. Yeah, that's what it's all about. Born and raised here, keep them here. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's right. right. Homegrown. Homegrown. All of them. That's right. All right, David Young joining us here from, yeah, uh, congratulations, uh, projected winner. Uh, in House District 28. Uh, Stephanie, back to you. All right, Dave, thank you very much. We do appreciate that. And we do want to go to our analysts now for a little bit more insight in, into Iowa House District 28. Let's get into this one. The, this is a fascinating race. Mm -hmm. You have two very well-known uh, individuals here. Mm -hmm. You have uh, Sandra Heitz, Susan, who was a, a news personality for decades here in central Iowa, and you have a former member of Congress mm -hmm. uh, running here. So you have you know, two very well-known uh, people. And then the, the interesting thing is this is one half of that district that Sarah Tron Garriott won. Wow. So there's a lot of, of divided results. In Ankeny, you have Mike Busolo winning a Senate seat and then the Republicans losing the two House seats that make it up. Mm -hmm. this, this is a Senate seat that 
that uh, Democrats won and it split 50-50. Yeah. So you can see how like divided uh, we really are, and the margins are super close. What do you make of it? Yeah, this is this is a really, really interesting, I think, piece after the election for folks to research and figure out what happened here, because it seems to be uh, right unpredictable thus far. Mm -hmm. And so it's really, for me, it's exciting to try to dig into this thing and see what's going on. But I think David Young having that name recognition, having been on the ballot sure. a few times, mm -hmm. I think that really played in his favor this time around. What do you think when he said no curveballs? Yeah, you know, I I, I I think David is a is a pretty straight shooter. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and the other thing is too is, don't discount that there's some people who run, who do things in their campaigns a little differently. Mm -hmm. That they're not just and and I think David's one of these people, especially when it comes to early voting, that he went out there and made sure that that Republican voters were getting, you know. Uh, Ball absentee ballot requests. Mm -hmm. He did that on his own. That was I think de definitely so. I think the further uh, that he was able to separate himself from national narratives and really mm -hmm. show that he's the one leading the, that I the ideas that he's bringing forward, I think that served him well in this race. Breaking the mold. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. And you know that seems to be that seems to appeal to folks more these days. They want to see something different. Well, I think folks are fed up with politics as usual. Yes. So right now, personalities can win over politics any day, and mm -hmm. that's what, that's probably what it should be. And so uh, as we look at some of these samples, some of these candidates who are winning these races, it'd be interesting to figure out what they did differently than others. And I think that's going to be something that's interesting to see in the U.S. Senate race as well. What's different? What are you seeing that's different? <laughs> We've already unpacked I'm some just of waiting. it. Waiting. I know. I know. <laughs> 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 Come on, <laughs> let's go. Oh my gosh. Uh, but, but what we're seeing is, is it's going to take a long time for rural Iowa mm -hmm. and these rural counties to get their votes in so we really know where this race stands. Right. Yeah. This is close. It's this is, close. this is close. This is going to be a lot more like Hubble Reynolds mm -hmm. four years ago where it might take, you know, we might be, you know, here late and, and figuring out how how counties in northwest Iowa are going to come out, and is there enough for, for Grassley to, to claim a victory there? Let's speak to the importance of midterms. You know, what does this mean? What does this night mean? Well, I, I think it, it sets the foundation for you need to go for the next general cycle. Mm -hmm. I think if you're a Des Moines-based Democrat, you probably feel really good right now. If you're a Democrat outside of Polk County, outside of central Iowa, hmm. you're probably questioning if you felt heard sure. in the last general election cycle. And so I think this midterm is going to be a real reflective point uh, for Democrats and also for Republicans where you had victory, where there is ground to gain and what that looks like. How do you invest next time around to ensure that your candidates are more successful than they were in this midterm election? You, you know, nationally, midterm elections are like yanking the emergency brake. Right. Right. Yeah. So Republicans are going to want to just stop everything that's going on. Right. Uh, Joe Biden's president. There's two more years of of, of his first term and so you're you're pulling the emergency break i think here in the state it's more of what's the agenda mm -hmm. you know and so the the makeup of the legislature moves we were we were chatting briefly all these little all these little races um that you know democrats have had victories in central iowa at the end of the day the numbers might not change exactly gotcha so so it feels like there's something going yeah. on here and at the end of the day the makeup might be exactly what we had at the start of the day yeah, okay there, there, there. we're gonna go to stephanie now all right, Samantha, thank you. And we're going to head down to uh, so Republican headquarters here. Be able to pick up, but we have some really great news. First of all, here in central Iowa, in a really hard fought race, Mike Buslow beats Todd Brady up in Ankeny. <laughs> over, in, over in western Iowa, a four year incumbent, Jackie Smith, the Democrat, we beat her by double digits. Rocky DeWitt wins that one. And in probably the toughest fought race, incumbent versus incumbent, Kevin Kinney, a 12-year Democrat incumbent, was beat by Don Driscoll by over eight points. So we're still waiting for results to come in, but what I can tell you tonight is in the Iowa Senate, we have made history. It's been over 50 years since either side has had a supermajority, and I'm confident enough to know that with results still to come in, we will have a supermajority in the Iowa Senate. And so I'm really proud of our team. We have our senators from the area up here, really proud of our team, but really this night is about you. It's about sending a message to the Democrats here in Iowa that the disastrous Joe Biden policies will never come to Iowa. 
It's about sending, it's about sending a message that conservative policies still work and common sense still prevails here in Iowa. It's about sending a message. It's about sending a message that the liberal money from the coast cannot buy elections here in Iowa. And it's about sending a message that Iowans support the governor and where this legislature is going. And so I really want to thank the governor. I don't know if she's still in here, but I've never seen somebody work so hard and so unselfishly for other people up and down the ballot. If you ask any of these candidates, she was in their district, she was raising money for them, she was doing ads for them, she was a true champion. Let's hear it for Kim Reynolds. Woo! And so once again, thank you all for coming out. Thank you for your hard work. There's been a lot of talk about a red wave, but red waves don't just happen. We have to go out there and earn that. And so the donations, the door knocks, all of your support, we want to say thank you from the Iowa Senate. It's a great night to be an Iowan, an even better night to be a Republican. Thank you so much. God bless. All right, let's talk about Chapman versus Tron Garriott, District 14. Let's talk about that race. Yeah, this, this, is, the, this is the big upset. Mm -hmm. This is the one that uh, Democrats were gunning for, and they got it. Uh, so I think uh, they got to feel sorry. We got to go really to good. Let's we'll see if we can pull her up. This is live TV, yeah, folks. Fine. Go. Well, you know, I, I wish the conversation tonight was going to go a little bit different. But I'll tell you, I am extremely proud of the progress that we have been able to make at the beginning of this campaign, there were a lot of naysayers that were like, don't do it, don't do it, do this instead, do that instead. There were a lot of questions, there were a lot of concerns, but I'll tell you the truth of the matter. Every day out of the week, democracy is worth fighting for. And, and while we came up short in this campaign cycle for this specific campaign, we came up short with the numbers. I say we, we won as it relates to property. Yes. We won as it relates to property. Because the folks out there were telling us what we were fighting for was too much. They told us that fighting for public schools, we were unreasonable in that fight. They told us when it came down to fighting for reproductive rights, we were unreasonable in that fight. They told us when it came down to, to fighting for things so basic as ensuring that individuals only have to work one job to make ends meet, they told us we were unreasonable in that fight. Needless to say, the reason why I tell you that is because those are reasonable fights, folks. Those are reasonable fights. to make sure that you walk out of this room knowing that our loss is not a loss all the way. It's not a loss all the way. And the reason why I'm telling you that is because I don't want you to give up. Yes, ma'am. Right? Coretta Scott King said, the fight for freedom is fought and won at every generation. We can't let up. But it could not have been done without this amazing team behind me. You all know that we ran this campaign the hardest way possible. And these were the folks who were committed every day out of the week, despite the naysayers, despite the doubt. They stood strong and they stood committed, especially my rock over here, Dr. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so, <laughs> you all know me better than I know myself probably at this point in time. I'm not going anywhere.
and don't you let anybody tell you different, all right? Just D candidate Deidre DeGere just stepping off after she just made her speech saying she's not going anywhere, telling Democrats that she has fought her best fight, telling them that the work that they've done is rewarding enough and that they may have not have scored tonight's victory, but they did accomplish a lot during her campaign. Now, Deidre DeGere shares about the times and the, the work that they all put in, and she's, she's so excited and proud of the work that she's done, and she just wants to remind Democrats that there's more work to be done. Now, she says that she's not, again, she's not going anywhere, which created a loud, uh, booming, uh, just a lot of applause and happiness on that end. Um, and she just says, sit tight, because just because she didn't come out the uh, front runner against uh, Governor Kim Reynolds, she says there's still a lot of Democratic candidates who have the opportunity to um, sh show out tonight. So just giving a message um, to the people to be encouraged and um, that she is proud of the race that she um, had this midterm election. I'm going to send it back over to the studio. All right, Larissa, thank you so much. And yes, energizing that room still tonight uh, for Deidre DeGier. Well, we want to take a look at some of those numbers now again. And here is the governor's race. And this is, you know, with 70% now precincts reporting. Uh, Governor Kim Reynolds early on was the projected winner. And those numbers are reflecting that now. 57% of the vote at this point to Deidre DeGier at 40%. Rick Stewart uh, way behind there at 2%. What do you make of this? Well, I, I think first and foremost, from, from an institutional standpoint, mm -hmm. uh, for the Democratic Party, if you don't play, you don't win. Mm -hmm. And I think from the foundation, our party didn't play. I think Deidre ran a great campaign. I think her, her team did a phenomenal job. But I think overarchingly, the Iowa Democratic Party kind of sat this one out in the governor's race. Right. And, uh, and, and if you don't win, I and mean, if you don't play, you can't win. Right. And what you had mentioned earlier was perhaps telling when uh, both sides are saying something different. Yes. You know, Republicans are saying we have, we're going to bring change. And then perhaps the Democratic side saying we're fighting it. Yes. Yeah. Speak more to that. Yeah. Oh, well, well I, I think that first and foremost, your candidate has to have the resources to fight that, right? Right, and put forth a broad vision, and that's part of communicating that vision. And so, if you can't be on TV, if you if you can't be on the on the tour bus or charter bus across the state, it makes it really difficult to talk about what you're going to do. And then you're stuck in a reaction position where you're just saying what you're going to try to stop. Sure. And I think that's a really hard place to energize voters from. It's hard to get excited about what you're going to try trying to stop somebody else from doing, as opposed to what you're going to do. Craig. Yeah, I think the, the interesting thing is is that. In Polk County, Deidre DeGere ran a good race, mm -hmm. and it was energized, and there was a lot going on, and it, I think it obviously felt good for them. But then when you, you look to other parts of the state is where you see uh, the discrepancies and where that not having those resources matter. So you look at, I've been looking at Scott County uh, results. Scott County is a place where Democrats have done well at. Sure. It's really red tonight. It's really red tonight. So all the all the Senate seats and the House seats that Democrats are winning in Polk County and Dallas County, Republicans are winning these seats in, 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 in Scott County and Clinton County that they haven't held before. Well, I think it's changed the landscape significantly. Sure. It's gone from now Democrats trying to hold the ground to now trying to preserve what they have right. and not try to fall under 40. Okay. And so I think that this is kind of high alert. And so you see that excitement for Polk County races, but I think there's a lot to still come tonight. And th this is this is a big victory right. uh, for Reynolds. And when you, when you allow a, a candidate, an incumbent governor, to to have a big victory, it's going to have ramifications yes. elsewhere in the ballot. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we're seeing this is uh, Kim Reynolds being at 57 percent. The interesting thing is going to be does does Deidre stay at 40 or does she go into the 30s? Okay, you know, and and that that will matter in these legislative races across Iowa where there's Democrats and counties that are a little more evenly divided. Right. How does this change yeah. things? Right. Well, I think first and foremost, you lose some safeguards, right? You, you lose, uh, I think about the Kevin Kenney race, for instance, right? You don't get more of a moderate Democrat than that, right? Member mm -hmm. of law enforcement um, did all the things that he thought that the, the rural voters in Iowa County and Washington County w would want from him, right? and he's still behind it. And so I think it has long-lasting impacts to how Democrats are talking to people across the state, but also what are we reading on the tea leaves, sure. right? And if we're interpreting that information correctly, and right now I think that's yet to be seen. Mm -hmm. Well, as you're saying, don't give up. You know, it's not over yet. So more to 
come as this night continues. Stephanie. Oh, absolutely. More numbers to dig into, more more things to learn about what was motivating voters this time around. We want to get back to, to the numbers. Again, those are coming in more right now. We're going to look at some of the U.S. House races right now, starting with District 1 with 64% in. Uh, we've seen a flip here now. Uh, Christina Bohannon had been leading right now. Marionette Miller-Meeks, though, is, has taken a lead with 51% of the votes. Uh, Christina Bohannon uh, close behind there with 49% at this point. And moving on to U.S. House District 2, 57% reporting in. Ashley Hinson uh, leading right now 56% of the vote over Liz Mathis at 44%. All right, in U.S. House District 3 now, 94% of the vote. Uh, Cindy Axney, Zach Nunn, look at this, 50%, 50%. So close race there in U.S. House District 3. This is one that's being watched closely uh, in this room and across the country right now, 94% of the vote in. So we'll take a look at that a little bit closer here in just a moment. But moving on now uh, in the U.S. House District 4, 62% of the vote in right now. We have seen Randy Feenster hold a sizable lead all night. He is at 74%. You see he has the uh, check mark of the projected winner here in U.S. House District 4 over Ryan Melton and Brian Holder. And State Senate now, uh, we have a Mike Busolo in 51% over Todd Brady, 49%. Uh, we um, heard Republicans express uh, their happiness over the result of this. Okay, we're going to go head back out now to uh, Mike Franken is talking. Let's take a listen. Like so many of you did here tonight, but here we are. 
I would like to thank the partner in this. And uh, before we could even bring you these results, we had to take that speech from Michael Franken. He was the Democratic challenger. He was hoping to unseat uh, the juggernaut of Chuck Grassley here in the U.S. Senate. But Chuck Grassley is the projected winner heading into an eighth term here. Fifty six percent of the vote to Michael Franken's 44 percent. And so we want to take you back out there to the field, to the Republican headquarters now. Uh, Dave Downey, there's got to be a lot of energy in the room again. Yeah, once again, a lot of energy in the room, Stephanie. Uh, looks like they're going to announce some more good news right now. I think we might be hearing from Senator Chuck Grassley here momentarily. Uh, they just announced the race in the past five to ten minutes. Got a lot of noise coming here right now. We'll see what happens. Also, in the past few minutes as well, uh, we had another race called. Uh, Randy Feenstra expected to uh, defeat Ryan Melton. That's in District 4. 74% uh, of the votes, overwhelming majority of the vote. Uh, we'll see if we hear from Senator Chuck Grassley in the next uh, 15 minutes or so. But for now, uh, we'll send it back to you. Uh, lots of positive energy, as you're hearing right about now here in downtown Des Moines. We'll keep you posted as we learn more here as well. Back to you. All right, Dave, thank you. I'm having a hard time hearing you over the crowd. That means they're all having a good time there. And let's head over to our analysts so we can yeah, get a little bit more insight in, into this race. Yeah, let's get context for this race and the numbers we just saw. Well, I think it's really kind of a gut punch for Democrats. I think mm -hmm. they felt really good about this race and maybe it's a missed opportunity. Okay. Um, it's gonna be an issue for Democrats going forward to figure out, right, what, what, what went wrong here, right? This is not the D.C. candidate. This is, right, the, the Iowan who went off a three-star admiral. All the different things that you think would, would set him forward in a strong path to victory, and, and something here uh, went wrong. And so I think for Democrats, it's going to be a further explanation as to what didn't go right. Craig, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I feel like when the Des Moines Register poll came out three weeks ago and it showed this race really close, I felt like the, the Franken campaign almost, like, it was like a victory for them. Hmm. Like, they celebrated it. And at the end of the day, you're still running against Chuck Grassley, who is a huge brand. And when you look tonight, I mean, Franken has won, you know, less than five counties across the state. Yeah. 
And so, you know, sometimes you, you can't let polling results really drive what you're doing and how you feel about the campaign. It gave them momentum, uh, but you're still running against Chuck Grassley. And I think that, you know, it's such a brand and it's mm -hmm. such a, I, I mean, uh, people know him. Uh, he, he is out there a lot. And uh, this, is, this is a big win. I mean, right now it stands at 12 points. Uh, this is a significant win for Chuck Grassley. Definitely so. Well, I, I would ask this question, Craig, too. Do you think that the top of the ticket maybe have carried Chuck Grassley over the finish line in this one? Well, I do. I, I think Reynolds' big victory helps, definitely. But I think the question that we still need to answer tonight is does Chuck Grassley and Kim Reynolds drag a Brenna Bird over the finish line or a, a Robbie Smith at the state treasurer? Those races are super close. Yes. And, and even... You know, even um, the, the Axne Young race, razor thin right now, can she hang on? Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's all, it's all these other counties that are coming in. And at, is it the same thing we've seen with Cindy Axne? There's no libertarian on the ballot and she can't get to 50%. And she can only win one county. Uh, so Zach has a, you know, it's late, but he's got a chance. He's got a chance. I think we are gonna try to get out to Grassley, see if we can pull that up. Okay, we're going to continue talking about this. <laughs> it's um, what you're saying is it's uh, you have to stay strong to the finish. You yeah. cannot slow down at any point. Well, I feel like for Republicans, you know, you get quick results on mm -hmm. Polk County, and for a Republican, as the night goes on, you, you okay, I feel a little bit better. Mm -hmm. You know, you, but you're seeing what's happening in these other counties, and you're almost like shuffling the deck a little sure. bit. So you're losing you're losing some House seats you know, in, in, in the metro here, and you're gaining them in Clinton County and Scott County and, right. and, and you know. But also taking out incumbents along the way. Yeah, right. exactly. Incumbents along the way, we think about Phyllis City. We just talked about how important the yeah. Mississippi is, right? And right right there in Scott County, right there in Davenport. Phyllis, and, she, and she's been a fixture. She's been a fixture over a decade yeah. elected, and now Phyllis will be coming back to the legislature. I her, think that's really indicative. Her, her opponent got over, you know, 55% of the vote. That's a big I mean. Again, redistricting, those districts are different. Mm -hmm. But again, that is a, a significant victory and a significant sea change in, in a county when that, right. when that occurs. And that's what you've been talking about this evening, how um, impactful redistricting mm -hmm. is. It shifts everything around. Yes. And then, you know, you're also talking about the importance of margin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lots, lots of moving parts to understand. And, and we're seeing margin tonight. We're seeing margin still at play here with uh, the attorney general, the state treasurer, with uh, the Axne uh, race and the Miller Meeks race. Mm -hmm. These are margins. You see uh, Miller Meeks, the last time we saw her results, she was up. Uh, that means that she has eliminated the, the, the margin sure. that Bohannon got in Johnson County. So much to unpack. Yeah. You are helping us tremendously work through this. Stephanie. Samantha, thank you so much. And we want to head out now. Uh, Democratic headquarters, Larissa Leone is standing by and she is joined now by Isaiah Knox and uh, victory tonight in State Senate 17, correct? After all of these sometimes very deep conversations, I truly believe that it is possible to- Yes, yeah, Stephanie, that's exactly right. I'm. Yeah, Stephanie, that's exactly right. I'm here with Isaiah Knox. Isaiah, you just found out the results. Tell me a little bit about how this campaign was for you. It was hard. We started a year ago. Um, the community came out, supported me as a candidate, which was great. The primary was super hard. You know, I was super nervous all day today thinking about running for state senate, being the second black person to ever represent in the state senate. So, And yeah, and that's that's a huge uh, monument. So tell me a little bit about what that means to you and your family. Yeah, well, actually, when I first started running, I called Thomas Mann, who was the first black state rep or state senator, and he endorsed me right away and said, I want you to go for this young man. He lived down in Texas. Texas. So I ran his endorsement first and went for it. But really it came from being in my community for 20 plus years, seeing people in our community so long, needing someone to represent them that looked like them, that they felt that they could really trust. And it was authentic to the community for a long time. So I'm super happy. And, and Absolutely. Um, talk to me a little bit about, you know, the, the whole ticket on the ticket, you know, not all Democrats are seeing the same success as you. What are you feeling about the results of tonight? I feel like we have a lot of work to do. We really do. There's a lot of opportunity out there, but it's going to take a lot of hard work 
and, and a lot of good candidates. And I'm, I'm kind of actually glad that we have a lot of good young candidates coming out that want to run. They all didn't win, but the future looks bright. Awesome. So happy to hear that already. Stephanie, we're going to send it back to you where Chuck Grassley is now making a statement live. I thanked him for his military service and the fact that he ran a very tough campaign, the toughest I've had in all the years I've been in the United States Senate. Thank you, Admiral Franken. Thank you, Pat Grassley, for introducing me. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, thank you, Iowa. Thanks to all of you for believing in me. I believe, I believe in you and the great state of Iowa, and I believe in America, and, and more importantly, America's the unique nation that is, a nation of hope and pro promise of freedom for generations to come. You know, we're living in a midst of disruption, a midst of frustration, of transformation, of deeply held and vastly different points of view in America. You heard what happened in the presidential campaign that the Democrats and Biden wanted to transform America. You and I want to preserve America. Tonight, we celebrate freedom of thought, freedom of speech, the open discourse and disagreement that our system allows, and independent expression, and the power that comes through the ballot box. The people have spoken tonight. In America, we respect, revere, and reflect the voice and the will of the American people. We respect, revere, and reflect the will of the people in sending a message to Washington each and every election that happens. This election, Americans want to return to energy independence. Amer Americans want border security. Amer Americans want the political bias out of the Department of Justice and the FBI. What they, what they want is equal application of law. Americans want our law enforcement supported, and they want the blue to fight the crime, and we're with the blue. We're not for defunding the police. We are, and every time we see somebody in blue, we ought to say thank you for keeping the peace. Now, Americans want the, rec the reckless spending in Washington, D.C. to end. Americans, in other words, want us to move in all these directions because they want a strong and peaceful society and a strong economy. Now, we've been on a fast track to financial disaster. Now, it will be a path back to fiscal sanity. We'll get there. We'll get there by continuing to listen to the American people and to common sense Iowans.
So I thank you for your trust in me over a long period of time. I'm in a position to do a lot for Iowa. I love Iowans. I love working for the people of Iowa. And when I'm back in the new Senate, I'll be number one in the Senate. Which, which, which simply means that Iowans going to be number one on my agenda. You've hired me to work for six more years for you, and I take that responsibility to heart, and I promise to work hard for you. As I told you, Admiral Franken was gracious in his call to me earlier, as I just reported to you. I assured him, and I want to assure all of you, I will work hard for every Iowan for the next six years and for those that didn't support me in the election. Iowans are Iowans, as far as I'm concerned. Nothing divides me when I listen to the American people. I mean to the Iowa people. Listening to them, whether they're Republican or Democrat. When I tour the 99 counties, I don't ask anybody are they a Republican or Democrat or Independent. They can set the agenda, and I'll answer their questions or listen to their complaints. The principle, that principle is fundamental to my service and I will never change. I want to thank my staff who, who have been introduced to you, my staff uh, over there, and then my campaign staff over here. You, you, you. These are the people over here, are the people that made the election possible, but it's the people over here that made it easier to get elected when they serve the people of Iowa in the grassly fashion. And, and you need to know that there's one over one person over here, Jen Hines, would you wave your hand? If I, I, don't, I don't think she's taken more than a one-day vacation at a time, if at all. But in the last two or three years, she's been in every county with me, holding these town meetings. And of course, over here, you think, well, out not just over here, the campaign staff, but all the volunteers, I'll bet everybody in this room has probably volunteered one way or the other for me. And it's, uh, and you, and it's, it's the people like you that have made this victory possible. So many people did so much. Thank you for believing in my campaign and for believing what we can do together for the people of Iowa. Now I, All right, Senator Chuck Grassley there uh, giving his victory speech, heading into an eighth term in the U.S. Senate. Let's head over to our analysts for just a quick reaction, you know, on, on what we're seeing in this U.S. Senate race. What are the takeaways here? Yeah, big win for mm -hmm. uh, Chuck Grassley. I mean, you're, you're looking at over 12 points, uh, and this will matter in other races down right. the ballot. Yeah, I would say su surprising margin of error um, across the state of Iowa. This is going to have a resounding impact, and I think a lot of Democrats are pretty shocked right now. Of all the takeaways tonight, this was a surprise. The margin was a surprise. The margin, the margin yes. Was yes. A surprise. Yeah. yeah, and for folks at home, again, the margin is so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that dictates what's happening. It, it matters. Uh, what I'm watching right now are these local, state or these statewide races, 
and and all the Democrat office holders are trailing. Mm. And I think it has to do directly with Kim Reynolds and Chuck Grassley on the top of the ballot. Yeah, yeah I would agree 100 percent. Strategic coordination matters. Right. Yeah. And you cannot slow down until the very last day. Yeah, exactly. All right, Stephanie. All right. So Brad, thank you. And as we wind down our coverage tonight, we do want to run through some of these key races with you, some of the latest numbers that we are getting in uh, right now. So we will do that. Uh, in the governor's race, Iowa governor uh, Kim Reynolds declared early on the winner, 59% over Deidre DeGiers, 39%, a big margin there, a Rick Stewart at 2%. And in the U.S. House, District 4, Randy Feenstra declared the winner in this one, 68% of the vote there, over Ryan Melton at 30% and Brian Holder at 2%. U.S. House District uh, 3, we have a very close race here between Zach Nunn and Cindy Axney, 50% both. And in U.S. House District 2, we have Ashley Hinson at 57% of the vote right now, to Liz Mathis at 43% uh, of the vote, U.S. House District 1, Marinette Miller Meeks at 53% of the vote, Christina Bohannon at 47% of the vote. On behalf of everybody here tonight, I want to thank our analysts, Craig Robinson and Ross Smith, for their thoughtful commentary. Follow us on WeAreIowa.com.